Luke's Trek, Book 5 of the America Falls series. Written by Scott Medbury. Narrated by Adam Barr. So I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem you from the grasp of the violent. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 21. Prologue. The big man's face was gaunt, the leather he wore covered in dust. Even so, he was an impressive sight. He stood just over six feet three with matted, unruly red hair and broad shoulders. The worn soles of his boots made no sound on the road as he approached the faded billboard. Williton Green, Pop 323, the happiest little community in Maine. Lots still available. Some comic genius had scratched a minus symbol in front of the 323. For good measure, they had etched a crude penis near the lips of the smiling mother watching over her kids in the staged family portrait. The kids, a boy and a girl, played in a sand pit, while in the background, Dad cooked on the barbecue. He stopped and pondered the sign, scratching his stubbled chin with the back of the hook where his left hand used to be. He didn't smile. The picture was meant to be inviting. Now, it was just sad. He dismissed it and scanned the walled subdivision it was promoting. The surprisingly intact red brick wall stood about eight feet high, the open entrance just thirty feet away. Bent and twisted wrought iron gates lay in the long grass either side of the road. Maybe the suburb was abandoned? Maybe not. He wasn't sure if the feeling of being watched was from the dogs behind him or the town ahead. It didn't matter too much. He turned around. The dogs were the imminent threat. Anything else he would deal with when it arose. There they were in the distance, milling around in the shadow of the trees he had passed a few minutes before. He thought they might be coyotes or some dog-coyote hybrid. Whatever they were, they looked lean and mean. They had followed him for two days at a safe distance, but over the last few hours had steadily closed the gap. His vision swam, and he swayed a little as he was hit with a bout of lightheadedness. His mind threw up a memory of another pack, equally as mean, he had encountered a long time ago. His vision cleared, and he came back to the present. The big man had only had water in the last thirty-six hours. His last meal, a skinny rabbit he'd cooked over a small fire the afternoon before last. He knew the dog sensed him weakening and would have to be dealt with before long. He decided it was better now on his terms, rather than later, on theirs. Guess who's on the menu, you mongrels? He grated in his long, unused voice. He'd never eaten dog, but thought he was about at the point where he just might be ready to try. He reached into the waistband of the leather motorcycle pants he wore and pulled out the pistol he was carrying. It was a Glock 17. He had picked it up a few days before while foraging for food in an abandoned house. There it had been, just sitting on the table with two clips of ammo. He couldn't have been more surprised if it had been wrapped in a pretty pink ribbon. He didn't question how it had come to be there. It didn't matter. Didn't matter any more than the lone can of whole tomatoes he had found in the otherwise stripped pantry in the same kitchen. He had wolfed down the tomatoes and left with the newly acquired weapon in his belt. One didn't question Providence. He paused a moment and glanced back at the entrance to the housing development. Perhaps it was best to save the Glock and its precious ammunition in case of predators of the two-legged variety. He put the gun back in his belt and started slowly towards the pack. As if sensing their long chase was coming to a climax, the dogs ceased their milling. He counted them. One, two, three, four. No, five. Perhaps more that he couldn't see. As he closed the distance, the biggest dog padded from the cover of the trees, and his packmates followed him. Make that six. 
The man's pace didn't change, but when they were roughly thirty feet away from each other, the leader of the pack stopped in his tracks as if weighing the threat of this two-legged adversary slash meal. The man thought again of that other encounter with wild dogs in the first few weeks after America fell. It hadn't ended well for one of the children he'd been with. They'd all been children then. Not anymore. Unhurriedly, he reached over his shoulder and gripped the handle of the axe clasped in a leather strap across his back and pulled it free. He balanced its haft on the back of his hook and adjusted his grip so that it was a third of the way up the handle. Still walking, he hefted it and watched as the dogs began moving again. They were smart. Two had loped on ahead of the leader and were now flanking him on either side while the others fanned out beside the leader. Perhaps it had been a mistake to put the gun away. Too late now. Come and get me, he snarled and charged at the leader. The two dogs flanking him immediately rushed in, but his unexpected offensive had given him a few valuable seconds alone with the boss dog. The leader jumped, its jaws opened wide. He misjudged its speed slightly and had to swing the axe defensively, the flat of the iron head striking at a glancing blow on the shoulder. The dog yelped and tumbled onto the road as a second dog, the first of the flankers, leapt at him. It wasn't so lucky. The axe cleaved its skull, killing it instantly. He brought the axe up again but was hit hard in the side by the other flanker. He dropped to one knee as it began to chow down on the wrist of his axe-wielding hand. Growling, but perhaps more cautious after his knock on the shoulder, the leader and the remaining dogs closed in slowly. Still wrestling, the big animal mauling his arm. The man found his feet, and with a quick slashing movement, embedded his hook in the side of the dog's neck. Its yelp of surprise and pain was cut short as he jerked his arm back, opening its throat with a scarlet red flourish. The man straightened unsteadily and raised his axe. He fixed his stare on the leader who stood, teeth bared, less than five feet away, a dog either side of him. Come on, you fucker. Concern with the threat in front of him. He only remembered the other dogs when he saw a flash of gray in his peripheral vision. He managed to raise the axe, but the speed and weight of another dog knocked him to the ground, cracking his head hard against the asphalt of the old road. The axe slipped from his grip and clattered out of his reach. Stinking hot forms swarmed over him. Teeth and claws began to rip into his motorcycle leathers. As the strength seeped from his body, he relaxed and looked up at a perfect blue sky framed by bristling, heaving bodies. I'm coming, Brooke, he whispered. Part 1. Exit Stage left. One. One month earlier. Luke, we need to try and save... Luke didn't hear anything over the drumming of his own heartbeat. Brooke was dead. His baby, too. Snuffed out like candles and leaving him in a cocoon of suffocating pain. Barely able to see through the tears in his eyes, he trudged down the hallway, the walls and floor closing in on him like a tunnel before he pushed through the door at the end. His steps were unhurried but inexorable, and carried him down the flight of fire stairs to the lobby of the hotel they had made their temporary home. Around fifty of their people sat or lounged on the floor in the lobby, and many of them stood up expectantly as Luke entered. What's the news? Is Indigo okay? Luke was heedless of those around him and strode across the marble floor and through the broken doors without looking back. Where's he going? Someone asked as some of them moved to the plate glass windows to watch him. He didn't look back. He walked on, his back straight and arms swinging mechanically as he turned the corner and disappeared from their view. Luke didn't pause as he came to the barricade. He pushed aside a shopping cart full of rocks and continued up the four-lane street where the love of his life had been mortally wounded. The marauder army was gone. The tank in the middle of the road and the body of their leader lying in the street were the only sign they had ever been there. 
Like a robot that had received a pause command, he came to a standstill, looking at the distant body. He turned as if he had forgotten something and headed back to the edge of the barricade at the same inexorable pace. Pulling away a soil-filled barrel and letting it crash to the pavement, he found what he was looking for, a jerry can set aside for purposes of dousing the barricade and setting it alight to try and slow the marauders when they attacked. He picked it up and pocketed the lighter that had been left on top and turned back to the road. It was only when he was within fifty feet of the body that he realized that Ash's body had not been left unattended. A shaven-haired boy of about six or seven lay across the body. As Luke approached, the kid raised his head. His light blue eyes unmistakably marked him as Ash's child. There were no tears on the kid's face and no fear in his eyes. You killed my dad, he said simply, as Luke's shadow loomed over him. Luke put the jerry can down on the road. Yes, no need to sugarcoat. The kid had obviously seen everything. Why didn't you go with your people? They told me to fuck off and rot with my dad. Are you going to kill me now? The foul word from his young lips shocked Luke more than his question. No, I'm not going to kill you. Why? He asked, his face puzzled. Because there's been enough death today. And you aren't to blame for what your father did. He chewed on that for a while. My dad would have killed everybody. I've seen him do it before. I know. He had a sickness in his head. The kid stood up. Can I go with you? Again, Luke was taken aback. Was it that obvious that he was leaving? His face remained stony. No. You should kill me then, he said, voicing words no child should ever have to utter. I've got nowhere to go. They were wrong to leave you. None of it's your fault. But I can't take you with me. Come over here. The boy walked around his father's corpse and approached Luke, a tinge of fear finally touching his pale blue eyes. Luke put his arm over the kid's shoulder. The boy's eyes widened at the blood-stained hook hovering inches from his face and turned him towards the barricade at the end of the street. What's your name, kid? Cade. Cade, Luke said. I want you to go past the barricade and head to the big building to the right. When you get there, ask to see Indigo. Tell her Luke sent you. The boy opened his mouth, but Luke had already released him and given him a gentle shove between the shoulder blades. The boy looked back once, but kept going when Luke nodded. He waited until the kid had passed the barricade and disappeared around the corner before turning back to the body of Brooks' killer. He pondered briefly about the possibility of evil being passed on in the genes. He had read something once about a genetic disposition to psychopathy, a gene discovered that was shared by a high percentage of serial killers and linked to an increased risk of violent or aggressive behavior. Hopefully Ash had been a product of his circumstances, and the kid, young enough to forget his. He picked up the jerry can and uncapped it. Luke didn't linger to watch the bastard burn. The crackle and reek of his burning flesh proved no salve for the wound his soul had suffered. He walked. 2. He didn't have any idea where he was walking. He just knew he couldn't stay. The anger and loss he felt were all-consuming. The rage wasn't limited to Ash, either. He was furious at himself for not acting sooner or forcing Isaac to let him fight. He was even more furious at Isaac for making his stupid deal instead of going into battle in the first place. The raw anger he felt clouded the reasoning part of his mind that would have told him it was just as likely Brooke would have intervened if he'd been the one to battle Ash. Or worse, 
died anyway if they'd gone into battle against the marauders. He walked for an hour and then pushed on for another twenty minutes after the sunset before deciding to find shelter. He headed off the arterial road he had been following and down a side street into an outer satellite suburb of Manchester. It looked like it had been a fairly well-to-do neighborhood in its time. The houses were big, and he spotted a few nice cars gone to rust and ruin in their overgrown driveways. He turned down a cul-de-sac called Endeavor Close and stopped at number five. Five was the street number of his home back in Rhode Island, and the one before that, too. Do you think our next place will be number five, too? His mother used to ask when he was young enough to still be interested in small coincidences. Number 5 Endeavor Street was a double-story home, brick on bottom, white cladding on top. The lawn was no longer a lawn, just tall, tangled grass lapping at his waist as he headed to the front porch. He tried the brass knob, locked. A quick flick of his hook smashed the decorative glass inset of the door, and he reached in with his good hand and unlatched the door before easing it open. Dark clouds shrouded the crescent moon, but the filtered light still allowed him to see a few feet inside the entrance. Further on, it was dark. Really dark. And in the cold light of, well, pitch black, he cursed his lack of foresight. No flashlight, no gun, no weapon at all besides his Swiss army knife. He strained his eyes and could just make out the shape of a small side table in the murk. He went to it as quietly as he could, not contemplating how silly that was. After all, if there were any remaining inhabitants, they would be no more than desiccated husks by now. He pulled open the drawer of the side table and was about to reach in blindly when he heard a creak from the ceiling overhead. His hand froze while his heartbeat sped up to a light gallop. He didn't move for a few seconds, a darker shadow in the dark hallway, and then shook his head in disgust. Idiot, scared of a creaky old house. He changed his mind about exploring the drawer in the dark and instead pulled it right out and carried it to the front door. He placed it on the stoop and began to rummage through its contents. It's what his mom would have called a man drawer. He found an assortment of remote controls, batteries, none in their packaging, coins, bobby pins, rubber bands, old light bulbs, a razor blade, and a small tube of superglue. Disappointed, he pocketed the glue and the rubber bands and, as an afterthought, the coins. The rest was junk, even more useless now than it was when its owners were alive. He was about to toss the drawer into the garden when he saw a sliver of something wedged between the base of the drawer and the back corner. A match. He carefully plucked it out and raised it into the night sky as if he had pulled Excalibur from its stone. Now he might have some light and warmth. He would only have one shot, though. He'd have to be careful. He put the wooden end of the stick between his teeth and emptied the contents of the drawer into the garden before heading back into the house. In the tepid moonlight, he was able to make out an opening opposite the side table. A living room, maybe? And hopefully one with a fireplace. He used his hook to hold the drawer against his side, and with his free hand began to feel his way slowly along the hallway wall until he reached the opening. He went through. No moonlight shone through the windows in this room, which were shuttered from the outside, and he literally could not see his hand in front of his face. He decided to go left and feel his way around the wall. He'd only gone a few feet when his knees bumped into something soft. Warily, he bent over and reached out to touch a soft, velvety material. It was a sofa or armchair. He found the arm and then ran his fingers down the side to the seat cushion, fearing all the while he would touch the skeletal thigh of a long-dead inhabitant. He knew it wasn't likely, but a gruesome discovery was always a possibility. There was no body, and his hand glided across the seat unhindered until he found a crack and then another seat cushion. It was a sofa. He was tempted to sit for just a minute, 
but knew it would be so much sweeter in the light of a warm fire. He moved on. After the three-seater sofa, he came to a coffee table, then an armchair made from the same material as the sofa, and then a closed door, before his hands finally found the much-anticipated mantelpiece. Still blind, he ran his good hand under the lip of the mantel, down to the brickwork. When he thought he was far enough along, he reached down until he found the opening and dropped to his knees, placing the drawer next to him before reaching blindly for the hearth, his fingers found the wire mesh of a lightweight fire guard. He pulled it out of the way and then found the remains of the last fire. He was able to discern at least two logs. Charcoal crumbled under his touch, but towards the ends he found unburned timber. Ever the optimist, he decided to build a pyre before looking for something like kindling or paper to complement the lone match. He raised the drawer and smashed it on the bricks. In minutes, he had assembled what felt like a decent little pyre of splintered timber in and around the unburned portion of the two small logs. When, if, he got it going, the shards of drawer would burn quickly. Hopefully the logs would take. Once he had light, he would be able to find plenty of fuel for the fire by wrecking more furniture. He sat back on his haunches for a second. Now he just needed paper. Luke rose to his feet and made his way back along the wall until he came to the coffee table again. He knelt and reached underneath, his hands finding a shelf. He groped blindly, hoping to find a long-forgotten magazine or newspaper, but instead his fingers encountered a web. He yelped, nearly losing the match in his teeth, and snatched his hand away, wiping it on his jeans in disgust. He hated spiders, and right now, in the darkened old house, he imagined there was a big sucker just waiting for him to put his hand back in. He heard another creak from the floor above and shivered. Nope, nothing for it. He pulled the match from his teeth and put it in his jacket pocket. Come on, you pussy, he grated. It's just a web. Taking a deep breath, he reached in again and swiftly moved his hand along the shelf from side to side, before grabbing the first item his fingers found. A book. From its size and weight, a thick paperback. Yes. It was a shame to burn a book, but there was no way he was reaching into that dark recess again when the book would provide perfectly good fuel. Back at the fireplace, he began to rip pages out of the book, crumpling them into balls and placing them strategically in and under the timber pyre he had put together. When he was satisfied... He pulled the match out of his pocket and gingerly pinched it between his thumb and index finger as he located the closest ball of paper with the back of his hand. He struck the match on the brickwork of the floor of the hearth. Nothing. Come on. He struck again. A spark. On the third strike, it burst into a bright but weak flame, and he quickly held it against the crumpled page. It caught immediately. Shadows began to dance in celebration on the walls of the cozy living room. Sighing with relief, he pushed the ball a little further under the broken timber of the old drawer with his hook. The fire consumed the paper quickly without the wood catching, and he quickly shoved another of the crumpled pages next to it. Finally, the slenderest of the shards took and he quickly ripped more pages out, pushing them under the flaming kindling. The smoke was thick and gray, the varnish on the timber of the broken drawer burning with a faint chemical smell. Now able to see, by the light of the fire, Luke's eyes fell upon a basket full of evenly cut logs, barely a foot to the right of the mantelpiece. Next to it on the floor was a low stack of neatly folded newspapers and a big old axe, its haft resting against the wall. Luke shook his head and smiled wryly. Oh well, better late than never. He put two of the cut logs on the fire and watched the flames lick and dance over them for a few minutes. He'd always found fire hypnotic and remembered one of his mother's favorite things had been to sit out on their balcony around the fire pit on cool fall nights. He felt a trickle of loss but did not allow himself to think about what had happened earlier that day, lest the trickle become a flood that would sweep him away.
He picked up the annihilated paperback and turned it over. The Skeleton Crew by Stephen King. A collection of short stories by the master of horror, just what he needed in a dark abandoned home. No thanks, Stevie boy, he said aloud. Love your work, but not tonight. He tossed it aside and stood up, looking around the room. It was a typical American living room, TV in the corner, a bigger coffee table in the center of the room, fireplace, sofas, Christmas decorations still hanging from the walls. He walked across to the wall beside the TV and looked at the framed pictures on the wall. From what he could tell, it had been owned by a handsome, silver-haired couple in their sixties. Their portrait was in the center, and around them, like satellites around a sun, were assorted children and grandchildren. Luke felt a sense of sadness wash over him. I'll have to tell Brooke. Then it hit him. Brooke was gone. He had forgotten in the moment and fell to his knees as the grief washed over him afresh. The groan of anguish that escaped his lips was almost animalistic and faded into sobs as he lay down on the carpet and tucked his knees into his chest. 3. When Luke awoke, it was still dark and the fire had died down to embers. He sat up. His head was heavy and his eyes dry. He crawled to the hearth. Within a few minutes he had the fire blazing again and adjourned to the sofa, his head on a cushion, with his feet hanging over the armrest at the other end. It was no use. He couldn't sleep now. His mind headed straight back to the confrontation earlier that day and replayed it over and over, trying to work out how he could have prevented the awful event that followed. He blamed himself, blamed Isaac, even blamed Brooke. Why couldn't you have just stayed behind the barricade? He cried. He raged. He cried some more. Finally, after an hour, he got up from the sofa, drained, and went to the doors by the fireplace, pushing them open. The glow of the flames revealed a hallway with stairs leading to the second floor to the right and a neat kitchen to the left. Luke propped the door open with an armchair and went through to the kitchen. He was surprised to find the pantry full, a treasure trove of canned food. He wasn't hungry, though. He was thirsty, and there, right in front of him, was a shrink-wrapped six-pack of Avion water. Even better, right behind the water was a six-pack of Budweiser. Luke pushed aside the water and grabbed the beer before heading back into the living room. Four and a half beers and a lot of tears later, Luke heard the creaking upstairs again. Imbued with a healthy dose of Dutch courage, he looked up at the ceiling and scratched his chin. We should investigate, Captain he said in his best Mr. Spock voice. He stood up a little too quickly and steadied himself before heading to the door. He froze on the cusp, performed a drunken U-turn, and headed back to the fireplace. Aha. Come here, my friend. I may need your assistance. He picked up the axe he found earlier and hefted it before heading back towards the hallway. The cloudy night had obviously cleared, there was more moonlight coming from the floor above now. He could make out the stairs clearly. Set phasers to stun, Spock. I'm going in. Yes, Captain. He climbed the steps two at a time and reached an open landing that the previous owners had used as a study, the light from the double-sized window revealing a desk, long dead computer, and a small sofa. As he passed, Luke ran his hand affectionately over the computer monitor, and then entered the upstairs hallway. When he reached the first door on the right, he did his best Bruce Lee and kicked it open so hard it bounced off the wall and slammed back into him as he went through, nearly knocking him over. Ouch, smooth move, Captain, said Spock. A bed, a dresser, a wardrobe, nothing else. He walked back into the hall and whistled nonchalantly as he sidled up to the next door. No use trying to be stealthy now. 
This time he tucked the axe under his arm and turned the doorknob, letting the door creak open before gripping his axe and charging in with a roar. Another empty room. But as his yell faded, he heard a faint scrabbling coming from the hallway as if he'd awoken something, or someone. With his heart beating hard, he headed into the hall again. Ten feet along, to the left, was another door. This one open. You might want to come out now, he called. I'm armed, and we don't want any accidents, do we? The only reply from within the room was a bump and a scrape, and he slowly crept towards the open door, axe raised and hook at the ready. Okay, we'll do it the hard way. He rushed the door and skidded to a halt as a long, low shape dashed towards him, then pulled up with a loud hiss followed by a menacing mewling sound. A freaking cat. It was easy to make out its shape in the dimness. No ordinary cat, though. It was at least twice the size of any house cat he'd ever seen, and it was in full attack mode, its body sideways, back arched and spitting venomously. Luke took an involuntary step back when it darted another few steps forward, as if daring him to attack. Luke relaxed and held up his axe in surrender. Easy, big guy. I'll let you be. That was when he heard a mewling from the shadows behind the angry feline. He looked at her dangling underbelly and put two and two together. Ah, uh, no offense meant by the big guy crack. You're clearly all woman. I'll leave you and your babies to it. The mama cat didn't stand down as he slowly backtracked into the hallway. He heard her threatening mewling all the way to the bottom of the stairs. More comfortable knowing who his mysterious roomie was, Luke headed back down and into the kitchen. He decided he'd had enough beer and grabbed a bottle of water from the six-pack he set aside earlier. He drank the whole bottle before heading outside to relieve himself. Back in the living room, he made sure to close the door to the hallway and stoked the fire before laying down on the sofa. He was asleep within seconds. Four. Luke awoke the next morning with a fuzzy head. He downed another bottle of water for breakfast. It wasn't bad, considering it was about six years past its expiry. Lacking energy, he lay back down, and his mind turned to what he would do next. In the end, he did nothing. He had zero motivation. He was unable to think of anything for more than a few seconds before the events of the day before swamped him. The grief didn't abate. It sucked the strength from him, and he found all he could do was lay on the sofa, drifting in and out of fitful sleep. He had no idea what time it was when he finally roused himself from the sofa again, but he was starving. He made a quick trip into the jungle-like backyard and took a leak, before heading back in and treating himself to a can of tiny potatoes, washed down with the last can of beer. He was crying again as he swallowed the last few bites and slammed his hand down on the table in frustration. Grief, it appeared, came in waves, and it seemed the only way to escape it completely was to sleep. Wishing he had more beer, he dragged himself to the sofa and collapsed in a heap. Sleep took him eventually, and he dreamed of Brooke. She was walking down a steep set of steps carved into a mountain. He followed, always behind and never able to catch her. He called and called, but she never turned around. Brooke! His eyes snapped open, awoken by the sound of his own desperate yell. Loss swept over him anew. On the third morning in the abandoned home, he woke up feeling a little better. Sunlight was streaming through the glass of the front door and he was hungry again. He fixed himself a cold breakfast of beans and franks and, as he ate, came up with a plan of action. He couldn't stay there any longer and had no interest in heading back to the others in the city center. In fact, he wondered if he ever would. When he took his dirty plate back to the kitchen he spotted a faded postcard stuck to the fridge door by a magnet. Greetings from Portland, Maine, it said in happy yellow letters over a beach. 
the coast. He remembered visiting Portland with his grandparents as a kid and loving it. It seemed as good a place as any to head for. Why not? It would be a long, long walk, but what else did he have to do with his life for now? Decided, he went into the living room and pulled the drapes open. The family in the picture smiled down upon him, and he gave them a thumb up. Thanks for having me, folks, but it's time I got moving. They didn't look the sort to have guns, so he didn't bother looking. He decided he would keep the axe just in case of feral humans. The only problem was... He didn't want to carry it. He went through the kitchen and opened the connecting door to the garage. It was a big garage, big enough for two cars, but only contained one under a canvas cover. The rest of the man cave was perfectly ordered, shelves full of gleaming, well-ordered tools. Luke decided his first job would be to fashion a holster of some sort that he could use to carry his new weapon on his back. Number two would be to find a sack or backpack of some sort, he planned to raid the kitchen before he left. An hour later, he had fashioned a crude over-the-shoulder holster from a tool belt he had found in the garage workshop. He'd removed the pouch and all but one of the larger leather loops and had to stretch the circlet, probably designed to hold a hammer, carefully until it could accommodate the thickness of the axe handle. When he was satisfied, he put the belt over his right shoulder, looped it under the opposite arm, and then turned it until the circlet was up near his shoulder blade. He slid the axe handle into the leather circlet and allowed it to slide down until it caught the head. Pulling it out by the head wasn't ideal. It would have been much better handle first, but there was no way he could fashion anything like a clip to hold the axe upside down in a short period of time. He practiced pulling it free by the axe head until his muscles were sore, getting quicker with each attempt. Next, he graduated to two moves, the initial pulling the axe free, then a release, allowing it to fly into the air before grabbing it by the handle with the same hand as it fell. He dropped it the first three times, caught it on the fourth attempt, dropped it on the fifth, caught it, caught it, caught it. He drilled for an hour, and while he wasn't quite satisfied, knew he could get more practice as he went. He didn't find a backpack, but settled for a small hessian sack he found under the sink in the kitchen. From the pantry, he placed as many cans as he thought he would feel comfortable carrying, along with the last of the water. He finished his cash with a steak knife, can opener, and a salt shaker. After filling the sack, Luke went back to the garage to collect his axe and pulled open the roller door. Sunlight flooded the space, and he suddenly wondered what vehicle was under the cover. He thought he could spare a minute to look. Whatever it was looked low and mean. He bent down and grasped the corner of the cover and slowly pulled it up to reveal the grill. Holy shit. Luke ripped the cover back and over the car to reveal a gleaming black 69 Mustang. He knew the car on sight. It had been his dad's obsession. His dad saying, when I get my 69 Mustang, was the trigger of many good-natured ribbings from his mom. Sure, honey, as soon as the mortgage is paid off, you can start saving for it. Luke smiled and ran his hand down the masculine lines of the muscle car as he reminisced. It was a peach, in perfect condition, the black paintwork flawless and the chrome gleaming. He tried the door, locked. Maybe there were keys in the kitchen? He knew it wouldn't start, but suddenly he had the urge to sit in the car. He headed back inside and scoured the kitchen for the keys. He'd seen most of the house and was pretty sure the former owners had left in another vehicle. They certainly hadn't died in the house. That meant the keys should be here somewhere. It was nowhere to be found, and he headed back out to the garage, almost ready to give up, when he saw a plastic organizer on the wall beside the door. He didn't dare to hope as he rummaged through the pockets, pulling out pens and old bills before finding the Mustang keys in the bottom pocket. Luke rushed to the driver's door and slotted the key home, popping the lock and pulling the door open reverently before starting to climb in. 
He was brought to an abrupt halt when his axe caught the top of the door opening. Jeez, idiot. A few seconds later, he was sitting behind the steering wheel sans axe. The interior smelled of leather and very faintly of gasoline. He breathed the scent deep. He spent a minute or two running his hand over the wheel and running the automatic transmission through its gears. He imagined hammering that sleek mother through the abandoned streets. There was no way he could get out of the Mustang without at least trying the ignition. He picked the keys up from the passenger seat where he had dropped them and slipped it into the slot beside the wheel. Come on, he whispered and turned the key forward. Nothing, not even a click. Oh well. A little disappointed but not surprised, he climbed out. He took the time to pull the cover back over the car. He couldn't bear to leave it exposed. Besides, who knew? One day he might be back. He was about to head out when he spied a tall metal closet on the opposite wall. He decided to have a quick peek. It didn't have any locks, so there was a low chance of finding a firearm, but one never knew what other treats might be on offer. It was empty but for two hangers upon which hung black motorcycle leathers. Jacket and pants. They were well worn but looked heavy duty. On the floor of the cupboard was a helmet. Hmm. Leathers and helmet. No motorcycle. As he ran his fingers down the sleeve of the jacket, Luke reenacted the conversation that in his imagination might have led to such an outcome. It's me or the bike, George. You're too old for these shenanigans, he said in his best old lady voice. I'll give it up on one condition, Ethel, one condition only. You let me buy a Mustang. Luke smirked at his own wit and stripped off quickly, replacing his jeans with the leather pants and throwing aside his denim jacket for the tough leather one with padded sleeves and shoulders. The jacket fitted nicely. The pants, too, apart from the legs being about an inch and a half too short. Ankle freezers, he said, looking at one foot, then the other. He wasn't sold on the pants, so he decided to keep his jeans for the time being. He folded them and put them in a supply sack. Once he'd pulled his scuffed old army boots back on, he didn't notice the short length of the leather so much. He put the holster back over his shoulder and slotted the axe before picking up his sack and heading through the garage opening. He pulled the panel door closed and walked down the driveway without looking back. And that's how he walked out of Manchester, too, without looking back. He thought as he walked. Grief was a strange thing. He could function perfectly well for a while, but as soon as something triggered him to think about Brooke or the baby he'd never known, he would find himself crying again. Not tears of anger. That seemed to have passed. Just tears of loss. He had almost forgotten the pain he'd experienced at his parents' passing, but that coming as it did with the end of the world, had been diffused, more a state of shock than solely grief. This was different, much rawer, more primal. The moments when his brain forgot she was gone didn't help. He remembered his grandmother talking about her grief when his granddad had died. Coming home from a trip to the supermarket the week after he'd passed, she'd seen his car in the driveway, she felt happy he was home from work so early, only to have her loss crash down on her again as she came off autopilot and remembered. It's like my brain is playing a cruel trick. The more logical part of Luke's mind told him it was probably a coping mechanism. The brain allowing one to function on a basic level without shutting down entirely. It didn't make things any easier, though. Five. Hours after Luke closed the garage door and set off on his trek, Isaac entered the room of the hotel suite he and Indigo had settled in. Indigo looked at him, her face hopeful but changing quickly. He looked bone-tired, and the set of his shoulders meant her next question was moot. Any sign? 
she asked. He shook his head and walked over to where she was gently rocking Luke and Brooke's baby girl in her arms. He leaned over and kissed Indigo's cheek, then looked down at the baby. She was sleeping soundly, her skin a healthy pink. It had been left to Ben to name the child, and he had chosen his mother's name, Aaron. Isaac thought Brooke would have approved. How is she? Good, the perfect baby. Where's Max? With Allie and Ava? They took all of the kids down to play in the garden. He looked at her. You told them about not leaving? Yes, she said, exasperation creeping into her voice. Stop worrying so much. Cade is not his father. He's just a kid. Isaac knew she was right, but he couldn't help being suspicious of Ash's son. Only God knew what he had seen and been through at the hands of his father. It had to have an effect, surely. And those eyes. He had those damn pale eyes. Indigo squeezed his hand. I've told them never to leave him alone with the other kids and to tell me if he says anything strange or acts out. To be honest, though, he's been nothing but well-behaved since he came through the door. Isaac nodded and went to the small kitchenette and poured himself a water from the pitcher on the cupboard. Tell me about today, Indigo said. Isaac explained that they had searched the final zone to the west of the city. It was the fourth day since he'd walked out and they'd found no sign of Luke. That's it now, he said, sitting down and burying his head in his hands. We can't spend any more time looking for him. Indigo stood up and gently placed Aaron in the middle of their bed and went over and put a hand on Isaac's shoulder. It's okay. It's not your fault he left. Well, it's my fault Brooke is dead, his voice cracked. If I hadn't... Don't you dare, Isaac Race. There is only one person to blame, and it's not you. You were only doing what you thought was right. Luke will realize that eventually. He nodded wiping his eyes with the back of his wrist. I miss the fucker. <laughs> he laughed, trying to cover his embarrassment. We all do, Indigo said, taking him in her arms as she stood up. He'll be back. I'm not so sure. She didn't argue with him. What was the point? What are we up to with the move to the Brady Sullivan building? She asked, changing the subject. Bo and his crews have cleaned out the ground floor plus the first and second, so we have enough room for everyone to begin moving in. Once we're in there, we can start making it livable floor by floor. Exciting. Have you thought about where we'll have our room? No, he laughed. You want the penthouse, don't you? She shrugged. As long as I'm with you and Max, I'd be happy in the basement or the underground car park. They kissed. We'll get started packing our things at dawn. Well, I better head down and pass Aaron to Ben, said Indigo. It's time to go and help the girls get started on dinner. Okay, I'll go find Max and have a play date with Uncle Ben, he said impishly. You do that. As devastating and raw as Brooke's death was, life would go on, and right then, Indigo's sadness was tinged with optimism for the future. Six. Luke made his way north from Manchester on the 93. The most direct route would have been to head straight for the coast along the 101, but that would have meant turning back and heading into central Manchester. He didn't want to risk the possibility of running into Isaac and co., who, no doubt, would have tried to talk him out of going. He wasn't ready for that. Wasn't ready to speak to anybody. He needed space, needed to clear his mind of the ghosts of Brooke and their baby. He knew if he headed north to Concord, he could take another road to the coast, then hook up with the 95. That would take him up the east coast through Portsmouth into Maine. From Portsmouth, he guessed it would be about 50 miles to Portland. Walking on the 93 was quick and easy, and by the time he stopped to eat a can of beans around noon, he estimated he only had another two to three hours walking before he reached Concord. 
Concord was the site of their small victory over the Chinese occupiers. It was a good memory, and he smiled as his boots chewed up the yards. It had been the first time they felt they'd actually struck a blow against the invaders on a scale that meant anything. As much as the memory gave him a warm buzz, he didn't plan to enter the city. Common sense told him if there was danger, it would be more likely to come in the old city centers than on the road. No, he would skirt the city to the east and hook up with the 393, which would take him out to the coast. He was looking forward to seeing the ocean. It had been a long, long time. Luke had always found the highways and turnpikes the most haunting remnants of the before days. An empty house was different. After all, how many times was a home empty even with the largest and busiest of families? Highways, though, well, they were never empty. They were the arteries of the old world. To see them now, their edges overgrown, rusting cars scattered sporadically and the occasional upended tree over the outer lanes, made him feel melancholy. Two and a half hours after stopping for lunch, he closed in on Concord. Hello, old friend, Luke's voice grated at the Merrimack as its winding course met the road he was walking upon. To his left, Concord looked much as he remembered it from his first visit, just a little more overgrown along the outskirts. But something about the picture was jarring, and it took him a few seconds to realize what it was. Smoke. Chimney smoke. He counted at least three whitish plumes rising into the clear mid-afternoon sky. Concord was a ghost town no more. He was curious as to who had settled there, especially since the marauders had been terrorizing the region for a good couple of years. He decided it must be a large and well-defended group. He decided it was best not to tempt fate and to get off the roadway and hug the riverbank until he could cross the Merrimack. He could then take the back roads past the old airport. While there were a few residential suburbs on that side, he doubted the settlers had spread their roots that far. He had barely taken five steps off the road when he heard the screech of tires and roar of an engine from the direction he had been heading. It was a green army jeep. Great, he muttered. No use running. They had seen him and he counted four heads in the vehicle speeding towards him. A foot chase would end badly. He stood his ground. He'd done nothing and was just passing through. Hopefully these survivors were of the talk-first rather than shoot-first variety. He put his sack of supplies on the cracked tarmac and stood with his hands by his side, waiting calmly for their arrival. The jeep slowed as it approached, and Luke, who could now see the occupants more clearly, raised an eyebrow. They were wearing army fatigues. The driver pulled up about thirty feet away, and they piled out and trained their weapons on him. "'Arms above your head!' yelled one of them. Luke looked at them, his eyes wide in surprise. Aside from the first one to jump out, the men that confronted him were old." old enough for him to know they had been grown men and not kids when the Pyongyang flu had devastated the country. To a man, they all looked early to mid-thirties. Not only that, while their fatigues were faded and worn, the men were well-groomed with identical short back-and-sides haircuts. I said, put your arms up! Snapping out of it, he raised his arms and regarded the leader. Just passing through, soldier, said Luke, and found himself hit with another surprise. I know you. Friskum, said the leader. Luke stood passively as two men holstered their firearms and approached him warily. The young guy eyed his hook nervously as they patted him down. Then the penny dropped. How is Colonel Randall? Luke asked, conversationally. The hands of the men patting him down froze, and he was rewarded with an inquisitive glare from the leader. How do you know that name? He asked. I'm hurt you don't remember me, Bowman. Has it been that long? Bowman squinted, and Luke saw recognition dawn in his eyes. Luke? Jesus, no, I did not. He came forward as the other men finished their pat-down. Luke held out his hand, and Bowman grasped it, looking up at him. Holy hell, 
You were a scrawny little kid up to my chin last time I saw you. Yep, he said. Glad to see you made it out of Drake Mountain. We saw the Chinese begin their attack as we were hightailing it out of there. To be honest, I thought you guys were toast. Up close, Luke could see the faint lines around Bowman's eyes. He looked a lot harder than the fresh-faced recruit he had been just six years before. I thought we were toast, too. Colonel Randall managed to get us out of there, though. Long story. What happened to your hand? Rag. We got him, though, he said, unable to keep a little pride out of his voice. Bowman nodded. We never saw that bastard again. I thought he'd done a runner. Look, where are you headed? You should come and talk to the colonel. We can share intel. This encounter had changed things for Luke. He was still heading to the coast, but his natural curiosity meant this was an opportunity too good to pass up. It would be good to know what had happened at Drake Mountain after they'd left. Are you inviting me for dinner and a sleepover? Bowman grinned. Still a smartass, I see. Sure, a sleepover. Why not? Come on. Luke picked up his sack and they walked over to the jeep. Feeling as upbeat as he had in days, he quickly shut down the direction his mind was heading. Saracen, Bowman addressed the young soldier whose face Luke didn't remember from Drake Mountain. I'll get you to walk back to town. We'll let our guest have a seat in the jeep. Yes, sir. Thanks, said Luke, reaching over his shoulder, pulling the axe out of its loop by the blade and fluidly flipping it in the air before catching it by the handle. Bowman nodded appreciatively. Nice trick. Yeah, getting there. You want me to put it in back? Yes, and your pack if you want. 7. On the short drive to the city center, Luke took in as much as he could. Apart from the lack of cars, the section of Main Street that the Drake Mountain guys had occupied could have passed for any town pre-attack. It was neat and well-ordered, and then Luke spotted something that made his mouth drop open. Light in some of the shop windows, but not the flickering light of candles or a fireplace. Electric light. You guys have power? Yep, and some water, said Bowman. Wow, that's amazing. Good old army know-how, huh? Yep, the colonel runs a pretty tight ship. Luke spotted clothes hanging in the window of what, according to the old signage, used to be Betty Lou's Emporium. And stores? Bowman waved vaguely at the shop fronts. Kind of. Clothes and food shops, but no one pays for anything. If they're pulling their weight, no one goes hungry. It's all free, but rationed. <laughs> Communist paradise, huh? Bowman bristled, and Luke immediately regretted using the term. No offense. I mean in the purest sense of the word. I mean the community owns everything and everybody contributes to receive what they need. Bowman relaxed. Yeah, the professor came up with a system and it seems to work pretty well. The color drained from Luke's face. Oh, the professor, said Bowman. Don't worry about him. Things aren't the way they used to be. We, well, actually, I'll leave it for the colonel to tell you about it. How many of you are there? Luke asked. About 500. We managed to evacuate some of the kids when we got out of there, but there were a lot left behind. We're about half Drake Mountain survivors and half people we've assimilated since. So they live in the houses, right? I saw chimney smoke. Yeah, when we first got here, we bunked down in an old school, but as we rebuilt, we started repopulating the town. Bowman turned off the main street onto Green Street. The colonel and us grunts used the old city hall as our base. Oh, I thought you'd be in the state house, said Luke. No, the Chinese used that as their base and pretty much gutted it. Here we are. They pulled up in front of a pretty, triple-story red brick building surrounded by neat, manicured lawns, with white arched windows and an impressive spire atop it. It was a jarring sight for Luke, considering the vacant and overgrown post-apocalyptic landscape he was used to traveling through. Luke could see now how he had been spotted. He could see at least two figures in the shadows of the viewing area under the peaked iron cap of the spire. 
They got out of the vehicle and headed into the building. Up close, the facade of the building was even more impressive and harkened back to an earlier time. Once they stepped through the entrance, though, its decor was 90s council office. Luke received curious stares from the few uniformed occupants of the building that they encountered as Bowman took him up two flights of stairs to the colonel's quarters on the top floor. There was a pretty, dark-haired girl around his age at a desk outside Grand Double Doors. She looked confident and her gaze locked onto Luke's briefly before dismissing him and passing to his escort without so much as a raised eyebrow. Lieutenant Bowman, she said, all business. Hi, Becky. I need to see the colonel. We have a visitor he'd be interested in talking to. I see. One moment. She stood up and went to the door. She wore a crisp black skirt and white shirt, with patent leather shoes that looked like they had seen better days. She knocked lightly before opening the door. Bowman has someone to see you, sir. She looked over her shoulder at Luke, her eyes curious, then back into the office. Not sure, sir. Definitely not one of ours. Send them in, came the response. Luke recognized Colonel Randall's gruff voice immediately. Yes, sir. Becky returned to her desk. The colonel will see you now. Am I in a time warp? Luke asked himself, unable to shake the feeling he was watching actors in a TV show. He tipped an imaginary hat at Becky and was rewarded with a brief curl of a smile before she found something more interesting in the papers on her desk. Luke followed Bowman into the colonel's office. Colonel Randall regarded the big leather-clad man that entered his office with a steely look. And this is he asked, without breaking Luke's gaze. It's Luke, sir, from Drake Mountain. He's changed a bit. The older man's eyes widened. Isaac's friend, he queried Luke, as if not quite believing his own man. Luke grinned. Yep, that's me. Well, I never thought I'd see you boys again, not after the professor sent his attack dog after you. He stood up from his chair, limped around the table, and held his hand out to Luke. Luke took it and they shook hands warmly. War wound? Randall asked, gesturing to his hook. Yeah, looks like you have one too. Randall patted his thigh. Yes, bullet just above the knee. His eyes grew distant. Not a Chinese bullet either. Have a seat. Looks like we have some catching up to do. Bowman, bring us some coffee, will you? Sir. Bowman exited, and Luke took a seat as Randall made his way back behind the desk. I'm afraid of the answer, but is Isaac still alive? The rest of your group? Randall saw the kid's mouth tighten. He might be as big as a linebacker, but Randall couldn't think of him as anything but a kid. Isaac was alive and well last time I saw him. We lost some escaping Drake Mountain and some since. But on the whole, yeah, most are still alive. The old man nodded. Some tragedy had befallen the kid, and he wasn't about to rip the scab off his wound by asking for more details. And Rag? Luke dragged his hook across his throat. Good. How? He caught us on the mountain pass. We managed to kill him in the end, but not before he killed Toby and did some damage to Isaac. Randall nodded. He was a formidable prick. You did well to stop him. How did you lose your hand? I can thank Rag for that, too. He shattered the bones in my hand during the escape. We had to take it off. I see. Where did you head after you escaped? We headed south and managed to find ourselves a place to live, a farm. We were there just on five years before we were forced to move on a few months ago. Luke didn't want to expand on that story with the colonel. That conversation would only lead to the tragic confrontation with the marauders. What about you? How did it go down? Your escape was the catalyst for a final confrontation, actually. The professor was injured and went crazy. Well, crazier. And he ordered the Homeland Security to lock my men up. I couldn't have that, of course, and it turned to violence. I was shot, but we won. 
which is why you're talking to me now and not him, I guess. After the smoke cleared, we carried him out of there. I'm glad we brought him along. He's been a valuable contributor here in Concord. Luke doubted the wisdom of giving the professor a second chance, but held his tongue. How did you get out? he asked. Randall shrugged. There was an escape tunnel known only to the top brass. When we saw the enemy incoming, we got the hell out of there. Not quick enough to save everybody. They hit the facility with missiles, and it wasn't as impregnable as we'd been led to believe. We lost a hell of a lot of people, but we managed to evacuate nearly half the military personnel who'd survived the battle with Homeland, plus about a hundred kids. So the tunnel you had us digging really was just a roost to keep us busy? You had another escape route the whole time? There was a knock at the door. It was. Come. Bowman brought in a tray with two mugs of steaming black liquid. I can't believe you have coffee, Luke asked, sniffing the delicious aroma. It's instant, Randall said. We found a few pallets of it in a Costco. Should be enough to see out my days, at least. Tastes like tar, but beggars can't be choosers. Luke took a sip. Best coffee I've tasted in years, he said. Mind you, it is the only coffee I've had in years. Randall and Bowman laughed. The younger man took his leave. Now, said Randall, where were we? The tunnel. Ah, yes, you're right. The tunnel was to keep the kids busy. All the other work, too. Idle hands of the devil's workshop and all. Can you imagine being cooped up in that hole in the ground with nothing to do? No, I guess it was the smart thing to do. So anyway, we hightailed it out of there. It was tough going, though. The escape tunnel led out in thick woods, and we had to take a path directly east to get out of there and avoid the Chinese. They came in hot. I know. It's why I was so surprised when Bowman and his boys pulled up in front of me this afternoon. We didn't think anyone could make it out. How did you end up here? Well, we went nomad for a while, until it was clear that the professor's virus had worked and the Chinese had been forced to retreat west. After two months living hand to mouth, we picked Concord as the site of our resurrection. It was close and big enough to house us plus more. It also had the bonus of being a former Chinese base, so we were able to fit out our little army properly. It stands over 200 strong now, and we have close to 500 souls all up. So you said you were at this farmhouse for five years. Why did you leave? Cornered, Luke told the story of the attack by the marauders and the subsequent pursuit to Manchester, without naming the city. While he trusted Colonel Randall, Isaac and the rest would be licking their wounds for a while and wouldn't want attention from an armed force so close to home when they hadn't even settled in properly. There would be plenty of time later to put out feelers to their neighbors. He was sure it would benefit both settlements if they could develop a good working relationship. Randall didn't pursue it, perhaps sensing Luke was wanting to keep his cards close to his chest. Marauders, huh? Don't know the name, but were they based up north? A big group led by a tattooed freak? Yep, that's them. They were in Ashland. Okay, yep. We were keeping our eye on them. We only had one skirmish near our roadblocks on the 93 south of Plymouth. It didn't end well for them. Probably why they avoided us. We avoided them, too. Luke nodded and waited for the obvious question. Almost as if reading his mind, it was the next one from Randall's lips. So why are you traveling alone? I couldn't, he began and his voice cracked with emotion. He felt his mouth drag involuntarily at the corners as he struggled to contain his emotions in front of the older man. I lost someone. Sorry. The colonel stood up and came around to Luke and put his arm around the younger man's broad shoulders. Nothing to be sorry about, son, he said in a low voice. The man's empathy opened the floodgates, and Luke was suddenly racked with sobs that, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't control. He buried his face in Randall's side, 
helpless not to take comfort in a small act of human kindness. They were like that for a long time, until Luke's sobs abated. He pulled away. Sorry, he murmured, wiping tears from his eyes sheepishly. You may need to have that uniform dry cleaned. Randall laughed heartily. As I said, no apology necessary. Sometimes you just need to get it out, especially if you haven't had someone to talk to. Luke nodded. The colonel went back to his desk and looked out the window as he sat down, wincing at the stiffness in his leg. Looks like it's nearly time for grub. Will you join us? Yes, thanks. That would be great. Any chance of a bed for the night? Of course. Goes without saying. After dinner, I'll have Bowman allocate you a cot in the sleeping quarters. You're welcome to stay longer if you wish. Thanks for the offer, but I'll get going tomorrow. Where are you heading? East. I want to see the ocean again. Sounds like a grand plan, son. East is good. West isn't? Chinese? Not until you cross the Mississippi. That's their border now. So we're here anyway. Since they fled the professor's virus, they haven't been back across. That doesn't mean they won't in the future. But I'm thinking the West and Canada is plenty big enough to keep them busy. No, there's a colony that sprung up in New York State, Rochester. Apparently, they call themselves New America. They're aggressive and they're spreading, swallowing up any smaller groups they come across. Rumor is that Aiden Riley is their leader. Luke recognized the name instantly. The president's son? The very same. It's a rumor only at this stage, but one I hope to get confirmation of real soon. I have a four-man team going out in two days to gather intel. Why now? Because sooner or later, we're going to run across them. We've taken in some people who crossed three states to get away from them. Apparently their M.O. is to give anyone they come across an ultimatum. Join and become loyal citizens of New America, what they call allies, or be wiped out. Like the Romans? Luke said. Yeah, just like the Romans. My team will give me an idea of how big they are and how far west they've come. Luke started to rethink his decision to stay mum about Manchester. Isaac should know about this. But the threat wasn't imminent, so he stayed his tongue. All up, they spoke for two hours before Randall stood up. Okay, then. Well, I'll show you around some, then we'll eat, said Randall. 8. The evening meal was surreal. Word had spread about the big, red-haired man with the hook for a hand, a long-lost survivor of Drake Mountain. Rushed plans were made, and nearly half the community turned out at the city hall for a feast in his honor. The crowd was too big to fit inside, so given it was an unseasonably warm night, tables were set up on the lawn. Luke, the colonel, Bowman, and some other soldiers of an equivalent rank were seated at the head table. He had barely sat down before a wooden goblet of frothy beer was thrust into his hand. Randall, holding a goblet of his own, stood and the crowd hushed. Folks, tonight we celebrate the appearance of a friend from Drake Mountain. We thought he and his people were lost. Raise your drinks in a toast to old friends and to those we've lost along the way. To Luke. Randall banged his goblet against Luke's and they both took a long draft. The warm, home-brewed draft had a strong, nutty flavor to it but was pleasant enough and after half a goblet, went straight to his head. Not only warm with alcohol, he leaned back and watched the happy people of Concord getting on with life. The meal was a sight to behold, fresh vegetables, fruit, and meat. Luke began to salivate as they were carving meat from the huge slab of beef on the spit. He hadn't eaten a proper cooked meal since they had fled the farm, and even then, Generally, chicken or rabbit was usually the meat they consumed. Luke ate with relish. In fact, he ate so much that his bloated stomach was protruding over the waistband of his pants when he was done. He was just washing down the final mouthful with the dregs of his second beer drink 
when he saw a painfully thin man with white hair and a scraggly beard making his way through the throng and towards their table. Professor Leahy was very different in appearance to the last time Luke had seen him, but his right hand, palsied and pink with scar tissue from the bullet that had pierced his hand during their escape, was the giveaway. Luke was unprepared for pure anger, long checked that he felt at the sight of the professor. Triggered, memories of the murder of Sonny came flooding back. He put the goblet down, picked up the sharp knife, greasy with the fat of the beef he had just eaten, and began to rise. Two things happened. One, the professor smiled at Luke, his lively eyes belying his decrepit appearance, and approached. Two, Randall gripped Luke's wrist and leaned in to whisper in his ear, Easy, son. He's paid for his crimes. Luke ignored the colonel and tried to shake his hand off. He found himself suddenly intent on murder. Luke, Randall whispered harshly, drop the knife. I can't let you touch the professor. In his current state of mind, death was no great disincentive for Luke, and he bared his teeth in frustration as the colonel's iron grip tightened on his wrist. Eventually, he was forced to drop the knife onto the table. Possibly unaware of the danger he was in, the professor stopped directly in front of Luke. "'Greetings, honored guest,' he said, without an ounce of recognition in his eyes, and bowed theatrically before flitting away towards the beef spit, mumbling to himself. It was only then that Luke noticed the deep indentation to the top of his left head. His anger slowly receded. Randall relaxed his grip, but didn't let go. That's what I mean by punished. He's not all there. But you know what? His working mind is still a thing of beauty. You wouldn't believe how many times he has come up with an idea to save our asses. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have running water or power. Hell, we've even got a mini oil refinery. What happened? Luke asked. One of the girls he'd had in his damned breeding program smashed a rock over his head during our escape. It's a miracle he survived, one that I'm thankful for. Luke was satisfied. The professor had received his punishment after all, and he was no longer the same man who had ordered Sonny killed five years before. As classic a case of karma biting one in the ass as he'd ever seen. Fair enough. Randall, satisfied that Luke's violent urge had passed, released his wrist. These people would have strung you up from the nearest tree if you'd harmed a hair on his head, by the way, said Bowman, draining his second goblet of beer and grinning. How about another beer, then? Why not, said Luke, gulping the last of his goblet and handing it over. After Luke's third beer, someone broke out a fiddle and began playing. A whoop went up, and suddenly people were out of their seats, moving tables and forming into lines. Well and truly in the mood to party, Luke found himself on his feet and being dragged towards the makeshift dance floor by the very lovely Becky, Colonel Randall's raven-haired secretary. She had appeared out of nowhere. Her dark hair had been let out, and she wore a pair of jeans with a flattering pink sweater. Even in his tipsy state, he noted the admiring glances of some of the men around him. Luke was no Fred Astaire, but he was a passable dancer, and with his inhibitions lowered by the homebrew, joined in with gusto, ever mindful of his hook as people swirled around him. Becky seemed to find her way back to him within a few rotations, and it was perhaps clear to some of the people around, except perhaps Luke, that she had her eye on him. After a half hour of dancing, Luke put up his hands in surrender. He was exhausted. Becky stood on tiptoes and put her hand to his ear. I'm beat, she said, her warm breath tickling his ear. Want to go get some fresh air? I thought you'd never ask, said Luke. Lead the way. Luke followed her as she weaved her way through the throng of dancers, gently rebuffing calls for her to dance some more. Ah, oh, that's better, he said, concentrating on walking a straight line. Haven't had a workout like that in a while. Becky giggled and reached out to grasp his hand. 
Her hand was warm and soft, and now, even tipsy and exhausted, Luke couldn't fail to see that it wasn't just fresh air she was interested in. We can sit over there, said Becky. He allowed her to pull him over to a wooden bench in the green space behind the council building. Luke let go of her hand as they sat down unsteadily, their shoulders touching. Ever the gentleman, he shuffled away to make some room. She surprised him again by shuffling close enough for their arms to touch. You're a great dancer for a big guy, she said with a grin. Thanks, he said sheepishly. You too. Well, not for a big guy. You're just good. She laughed and grabbed his hand. You're so cute, she said to a blushing Luke. Can I see your hook? Luke shrugged. He was sobering quickly and struggling to find a way out of this sticky situation he was in without hurting her feelings. Sure, he said, and held it out. Careful, the point is sharpened. She reached out and took it in her hand, gently running her fingers over it and touching the point softly. It's rough, she said, as she ran her fingers back over the curve of the hook. Yeah, it's a pretty crude piece of work. We didn't really have a lot of tools. Doesn't work as good as a hand, that's for sure. She looked up into his eyes. I think it's very sexy. Luke only just managed to prevent his mouth from dropping open as he pulled his hook away and rested it on the palm of his good hand. Thanks. Um, Becky, look, sorry, but... Oh, my God, I was coming on too strong. Sorry, it's the beer. It went straight to my head. No, it's okay, really. I'm very flattered, but... You have a girl, she said, looking at the ground. Luke felt a knife twist in his chest. Yeah, he said, tears stinging his eyes. You're really nice, though. She laughed and shook her head ruefully. You too, she said, thankfully still looking at the grass under her feet. Are you going to stay? No, I'm just here for the night, but I'm sure I'll be back sometime. Can I drop by and say hello? Well, sure, she said, although her tone said she didn't quite believe him. So where are you from? he asked. The awkwardness passed as they talked. It turns out Becky had been in the Drake Mountain facility, too, one of the first kids taken in along with her brother. He had been killed during the firefight between Randall's men and the Homeland Security people. Neither of them remembered the other, which was unsurprising given that close to six years had passed and Luke had only been there briefly. Becky was originally from Boston and had fled with her brother and two of his friends. They had also heard of the Haven in the White Mountains and had been picked up by a patrol of Randall's men just south of Lincoln. Luke told her his story, too, about the escape from the facility and finding the farm, but didn't elaborate any further than telling her they'd had to leave and find somewhere new. The farm sounds wonderful. You were lucky to find it. This place is great now, but it was pretty rough at the beginning. Yeah, it's fantastic. Luke had sobered up considerably now. He put his hand on her arm. Well, thanks for the dancing and the great conversation. But I have to get going early tomorrow. I might head to bed. She looked at him and smiled. Sure, me too, she said, rising to her feet. I know he looks laid back, but my boss is a stickler for things like starting work on time. No, Colonel Randall? They both laughed as Luke stood, too. He was barely on his feet before Becky stood on tiptoes and planted a kiss on his cheek. Thanks for being a gentleman. Your lady is a lucky girl, she said and turned away. Luke watched her go, a strange, empty feeling inside. Maybe I will be back sometime. Luke went back out front and spoke to the colonel for around twenty minutes. He was glad he did because the colonel, possibly a little loose-tongued because of the beer, gave him some valuable intel. 
Randall and his group had divided the area surrounding Concord, up to a hundred mile radius, into four quadrants. They were systematically going into each quadrant, town by town and house by house, bringing back anything edible or of use to their growing community. The colonel currently had his teams foraging in the western quadrant, so for now at least there wasn't much chance of Randall's group meeting Isaacs to the south. We've already foraged the quadrants to the east and north dry, and we only just started into the west, he explained. Because they grew a lot of their own food now, it could be years before they began moving through the southern quadrant. It was obvious the two groups would encounter one another at some stage, so Luke decided to disclose the location of Isaac's group and the fact they'd only just avoided a battle that could have wiped them out. I'm not sure what happened to the rest of the Marauder army, but I assume they went back to Ashland. Isaac would know. Randall looked slightly concerned now that he knew where Isaac and their people were. Manchester? I'm surprised our scouts didn't spot a movement of men that big heading south. I may have to review our processes. Thanks for sharing, Luke. In fact, I'll give them time to settle in and then head down there myself in a week or so to talk to Isaac. Luke felt better now. He trusted the colonel completely and was confident it would be a happy meeting, which may not have been the case if there had been a surprise encounter between the two groups. He said his good nights, and Bowman led him inside and through to the sleeping quarters in the back of the big old building. The cot wasn't as comfortable as the sofa he had spent the previous few nights on, but with a full belly and the last pleasant buzz of alcohol still in his system, he fell fast asleep within seconds of his head touching the pillow. That was the first night that Brooke didn't haunt his dreams, and when the other occupants of the room began to wake up and move around, he awoke surprisingly fresh and alert. You have hot showers? he asked, when one of the soldiers came into the room wrapped in a towel, his damp hair steaming in the cool air. Yes, sir, right through that door. Within two minutes, Luke was standing under a steaming spray of water, oblivious of the naked bodies around him. He hadn't had a hot shower since Drake Mountain. They'd managed a few hot baths back at the farm, but those were a rare treat. And just like the first one back at Drake Mountain after weeks of hard traveling, it seemed about the best damn thing in the world. Bowman collected him for breakfast as he was zipping up his leather jacket. Luke saw the other man eye his fluffy, clean hair and patted it down self-consciously. That was one downside to washing his hair. He had no doubt it would soon dirty up and fade to a less glaring shade of red. Colonel Randall thought you might like breakfast, said Bowman. He's waiting in his quarters. Okay, thanks. I'm starved. He followed Bowman through the door and up to Randall's level. You guys are living the dream here, Bowman. Thanks, yeah, it's all right. You sure you don't want to stay? Nah, I need to... I need to get away from everyone and everything for a while, you know? Sure, said Bowman as they reached Randall's quarters. Becky's desk was unattended. Luke somehow felt disappointed and relieved. The soldier held out his hand. Well, I'm going on patrol now. Take care, Luke. You too. They shook, and Luke rapped on the door. Come. Morning, sir. Good morning, Luke. Made use of the showers, I see, said Randall, gesturing vaguely at his hair. Uh, yes, sir. Now in full Ronald McDonald mode, he said and saluted. Randall laughed gruffly and waved to the plates on his desk. Sit and eat before you head on your way. Luke's mouth started to water at the sight of the thick, roughly cut toast, butter, and honey, not to mention more instant coffee. A breakfast he wouldn't have sniffed at in the before days, but one that right then looked like manna from heaven. Luke's eyes nearly rolled into the back of his head as he took the first bite of generously buttered toast topped with honey. It really had been at least six years since he'd tasted toast and honey. We keep bees, said Randall, anticipating the question. Best you've ever tasted, right? You're not fucking... Sorry, you're not kidding, he said, licking his fingers unselfconsciously. Best ever. He washed four slices of honey toast down with two mugs of black coffee, then sat back and held his belly. I want to thank you for having me. I can't really repay your generosity, 
but maybe if I head back this way, I can stop and work for a while? We'd be glad to have you, son, but you're under no obligation. It was just nice to hear that you and your group thrived after Drake Mountain. Luke felt warmth for the colonel. While his defenses had been on high alert yesterday when he'd been picked up by the patrol, having seen how things operated here in Concord, he knew they would be great allies for Isaac's group. Thanks again for letting me know about Manchester. I know you were being cautious and with good reason, but I'll offer anything I can to help them make go of it. I'm sure we can be of value to each other going forward. Now, I'm not sure why you don't carry a gun, but in case you were thinking of asking... I can't give you one. Luke held up his good hand. No, I understand. It's okay. I kind of left in a hurry and didn't really think about supplies. But I plan to avoid trouble, so hopefully I won't need one. Okay, then. An hour later, armed with his axe and a map provided by the colonel and his sack replaced by a backpack, Luke found his way back onto Main Street and turned onto Route 202. 9. The skip in his step when he left Concord faded after five miles of walking. He stopped for water and to consult his map in a bus shelter that had managed to survive the elements pretty well. He planned to follow the 393, which turned back into the 202, and follow it all the way through to Rochester near the border of Maine. He wouldn't get all the way to Rochester by nightfall, so would find somewhere to lay up along the way, in the morning, he would set out and try to reach a little town called Alfred by sunset. He estimated it was about three or four in the afternoon when he approached to turn off the 202 to a little town called Bow Lake Village. Luke paused and took a drink of water. Bow Lake Village sounded almost too inviting to pass up. Screw it. It's not like I'm on a schedule. He took the turn and began walking north. He would spend the night in Bow Lake Village and then simply take the road out of town back down to join the 202 again. A nice little side trip. The narrow road north to the village, Ridge Road, was dotted with homes on each side. He imagined it was once considered tree-lined, but was now so overgrown that in some places the road had almost disappeared. The further north he walked, the more spaced out the homes became, allowing the overgrowth to close in on the road and put it entirely in shadow. It felt a little creepy, like the road in Sleepy Hollow, and he began to wonder if he should have avoided the stopover after all. Twenty-five minutes later, in the last light of day, he reached Bow Lake Village. It was quiet, and in the fast-fading dusk, no less creepy than the road in had been. So... What does one do in Bow Lake Village? Luke asked aloud. Why, go and look at the lake, of course. He made his way past the quaint, whitewashed buildings in the small town center and headed down to the lake. Luke imagined at this time of year it would be quite beautiful in full daylight. He walked out onto a rickety wooden pier. There was mist upon the lake, and the opposite shoreline was painted with autumn gold and rust-colored leaves. Beautiful. Not bad, Bow Lake. He took off his backpack and sat down on the end of the pier, fishing out the last beef and tomato sandwich packed for him by Randall's people, and began chewing happily. Brooke would have loved this spot. It was the first time he had been able to think about her without being overwhelmed by grief. After washing down his sandwich with a few mouthfuls of water from the Army Issue Canteen, another gift from Concord, he headed back up the hill, feeling almost content. Time to find some lodgings for the night. It was almost full dark now, and while he had forgotten the eeriness of the little village when he was eating his sandwich by the lake, it returned quickly. The dark, empty windows and the wind whistling through the pine needles put him on edge. He decided he would stop and stay at the first house he came to. He turned left from the main road and then turned down 3rd Street, it ran parallel to Main Street. On the right-hand side of 3rd Street was a row of houses. He checked out the first one. It was a white timber double-story with flaky paint. A wrought-iron gate hung askew on the low fence that ran along the front of the lot. Moth-eaten curtains hung in the windows. 
He thought anyone could be watching him from the darkened windows and he'd be oblivious. He shivered and passed it by. The next house looked just as haunted, but the third was okay. He pushed open the stubborn gate and winced at the terrible screech the rusted hinges made. Well, if there is anyone here and they didn't know I was in town, they do now. He had barely placed a foot on the path when he heard the soft crying of a child behind him. Startled, he swung around and scanned the buildings across the road. They were the rears of the storefronts he had just passed on the main road. He couldn't see anyone, but the child's crying was unmistakable. Hello? He called. There was no response, but the soft crying continued. Concern chased away any sense of disquiet he had, and Luke headed back through the gate and onto the road, pausing in the middle to cock his head. The crying was louder now, and he knew it was coming from a small alleyway that led between the two buildings directly in front of him. He took a deep breath and pulled himself up to his full height and strode across the road, hoping he appeared more confident than he felt as he headed for the shadowy alleyway. By the thin light of the quarter moon, he could see a few feet ahead. The alley looked pretty much like any alley you would see behind a main street. There was scattered trash, an old chair, and a big dumpster. That's where the crying was coming from. Behind the dumpster. Hello? Luke called again. The crying paused briefly, then continued. Luke looked up and down the street before taking a few tentative steps into the alley. Hey, kid, are you okay? Why don't you come out where I can see you? The soft crying continued. Luke shook his head. Nothing for it. He began to walk towards the dumpster. It wasn't until he heard a grunt of exertion behind him that he realized he wasn't alone with the crying kid. His head exploded in bright agony. Luke spun around, but his world was tilting, his legs suddenly made of jelly. On his way down the express elevator to unconsciousness, he caught a brief glimpse of unkempt hair, filthy faces, and wild eyes. Part 2. Dog Meat 10. Luke's eyes snapped open. He didn't move. The back of his head was a hot mess of agony. He was on his back, the sun high in the sky above, his axe resting uncomfortably under his right shoulder. His field of vision was framed by the buildings either side of the alley he had walked into the night before. Ambushed. The bastards had ambushed him with the oldest trick in the book and he had fallen for it, hook, line, and sinker. Time to take stock. He moved his feet, then his hand. He didn't appear to have any injuries besides a cracked skull. He scanned the alley with his eyes, not trusting yet that he could move his head without its contents spilling out onto the ground. He was alone. Time to move, old boy. He braced himself with his elbows and pushed up. Luke wasn't sure what horrified him more, the white agony that shot through his head or the sound of his hair glued to the cracked pavement by crusted blood, pulling free. He sat until the roar of pain rushing through his head subsided to a dull throb, then slowly raised himself to his feet. The world tilted, and for a second he thought he would fall back on his ass. He didn't. He raised his hand to the back of his head and inspected the damage. Thankfully, it wasn't as bad as it felt. His gently probing fingers found a hell of a bump crowned with a split in the skin under his stiff hair. The wound was about an inch and a half long, but it had crusted over, the coagulants in his blood doing their job. Turning gingerly, he took stock of the crime scene. His backpack was gone. Clearly it was the intended target of the wild-eyed bastards. There was no sign of the ambushers. Sore but thankful that he was still breathing, he couldn't even raise a puff of anger. There was no point trying to find the backpack. There were a thousand places the little bastards could be hiding, and he didn't want to risk foraging for replacement supplies and risk another ambush. 
The only thing to do was to get back on the road again. As he left the alleyway, he found the map from his backpack wedged under the old paling fence, one corner flapping in the breeze as if to catch his attention. He dusted it off, refolded it, and slipped it inside his jacket. Erring on the side of caution, he pulled out his axe and held it as a deterrent as he made his way back out of Bow Lake Village. This time he traveled via the 202A, a wider road and a lot more pleasant to walk along than the other one that had taken him into the village. It would take him southeast to join up with its big sister, the 202. The day was warm. Besides flies annoying the hell out of him, he didn't have any more trouble as he continued his journey and stowed his axe after half a mile. After an hour of walking, he reached the 202 and, ignoring the angry noises coming from his stomach, pulled out the map. In just over a mile, he would pass the North River Pond, a big freshwater lake. That would be his first stop. At the very least, he would drink a belly full of water and wash the crusted blood from his still sore head. The North River Pond was also picturesque. The part of the shoreline he accessed was overgrown with long, lush grass. He took off his jacket and headed into the water, gingerly washing his hair and the wound before moving to a new spot and drinking his fill of the cool, fresh water. As he was getting out, he found an old plastic soda bottle floating by the shoreline. He washed it out as best he could before refilling it with water from the lake. That would hopefully keep him hydrated for a day. He put his jacket back on and, feeling refreshed, investigated two houses on the lake for food. Their pantries were bare. The colonel's teams had obviously been this way. He resigned himself to the fact he probably wouldn't find food anywhere on the 202 and would have to make his way off it to get lucky. Dusk came two hours after his stop at the lake, and he decided when passing through a small town he would camp there for the night. Town was too generous a word, really. It was more a cluster of homes that seemed to have sprung up like mushrooms alongside a gas station general store. Luke didn't bother checking the store. Its windows were smashed in and its door lay in pieces on the pavement. Through the windows, it was easy to see the shelves were barren. He didn't hold out much hope for the houses that ran along the side street either, but decided he would check up to three of them for food. If he had no luck, he would bed down for the night in the third one. The first two were empty, and he almost didn't bother with the next. Boy, was he glad he made the effort. The front door was already open, jimmied by past raiders, and he didn't waste any time heading straight to the kitchen. There, in the failing light, sitting on the small formica-topped kitchen table like it had been left by a thoughtful friend, was a pistol and two clips of ammo. Luke froze. What the... he whispered and cocked his head to listen to the empty house, unable to believe that someone had left such a valuable prize behind accidentally. He didn't hear a sound in the abandoned house, and quietly crossed to the table and picked up the gun. It was a Glock 17. He weighed it in his hand and knew from its heft that it already had a full clip. Managing a firearm one-handed was a bitch, but he got to it without complaining. He placed the gun on the table and with his left forearm wedged it against the table and pulled the slide with his good hand. There was a round in the chamber. Good. First job was to make sure that the owner of the gun wasn't in the house. It only took a few minutes. With newly discovered gun in hand, he searched the house quickly and silently. It was empty save for the mummified remains of the previous owners in the main bedroom. The husks of the dead didn't bother him anymore. It didn't take long to figure out live bodies were the much bigger danger in post-America. The other bedroom was empty, and there was no obvious sign anyone had been there recently. Finders keepers, he said cheerfully as he re-entered the kitchen, not lowering the weapon until he was sure that room was empty also. He put the Glock back on the table and went to the pantry, fully expecting to see empty shelves. And they were, apart from one lone can of salt-reduced whole tomatoes. He was not a fan of tomatoes, nor were the previous raiders, apparently. Tonight, though, as hungry as he was, it was like the clouds had parted, shining a beam of light on a heavenly delicacy. Plus, it had a ring pool. Bonus!
Luke swallowed the tomatoes right out of the can, drinking them down like a thirsty man guzzling water, only stopping to chew the larger chunks when they threatened to choke him. He washed it down with a swallow of the bottled pond water. As dusk turned to night and with a semi-full belly, Luke headed through the house to the corpse-free bedroom and climbed wearily onto the single bed, boots and all, careful not to bump his tender head on the ornate wooden bedhead. He slept soundly. 11. Luke left the next morning at dawn. He didn't eat for most of that day, and by mid-afternoon, hungry again, he managed to shoot a skinny-ass rabbit he spotted in some long grass by the road. He took it into the front yard of a house, skinned it, and cooked it over an open fire. He'd started the fire with the lens of a magnifying glass. He had carried that damn thing in his pocket since they had left the farm and was gratified to finally get to use it. Initially, he had been worried about the smoke and attracting unwanted attention. His hunger overrode that caution, and in the end, it wasn't the attention of the two-legged variety he needed to worry about. He spotted them as he ate. They were slinking around about a quarter of a mile behind him, not game to come any closer, even with the delicious smell of cooked rabbit in the air. He paid them no mind, other than to glance at them occasionally as he ate. They loitered where they were, apparently too chicken to come any closer. After he'd eaten his fill, Luke pulled off the last strips of meat and stored them in an old plastic grocery bag he'd picked up off the road that morning. Thank God for non-degradable plastics, huh, Bugs? He left the ravaged rabbit carcass on the grass for the dogs, then moved on. He glanced over his shoulder at them occasionally. The dogs moved cautiously until it was clear the carcass was closer to them than he. Then they pounced on the kill. He watched them brawl over it for a while, then rounded the bend, out of sight. Hopefully that would keep them busy for a while. At dusk he found another empty house to spend the night in. There was no exciting find in this one, but there was a bed. He had a few pieces of rabbit and went to sleep thinking of Brooke. The thought of her brought pain, but also warmth. He ate the rest of the rabbit the next morning, knowing it wouldn't be good for much longer, and then hit the road again. He didn't see the pack anywhere. A few hours later, he skirted Rochester on the 202 and crossed the border into Maine. That's when he discovered the dogs were still following him. They were still a good way back, but it was definitely the same pack. Again, he put them out of his mind. He would worry about them when or if they got closer. Even in Maine, any homes or stores along Route 202, this section called the Carl Brog Highway, were already stripped bare, but he managed to refill his water bottle from rainwater in an old trough. Towards dusk, he tried a few more houses for food, but was without luck. He picked one to spend the night in and didn't spot the dogs as he closed the door. But he wasn't so quick to assume he'd lost them as the day before. The next morning, a hungry Luke had only water for breakfast and set out again. Almost immediately, the dogs fell in behind him again, about a quarter mile back. He was more fascinated than alarmed to realize they were stalking him. Unlike the packs he'd seen before, particularly the one that had attacked their group as they traveled to Drake Mountain, these ones didn't look crazed with hunger. They looked methodical and focused on their quarry, and he'd come to the unmistakable conclusion that he was their quarry. Feeling a little uneasy, but not frightened, he picked up his pace. An hour later, Luke came to an intersection. The left turn was a road that looked a lot more recently constructed than the 202, and the sign on the corner read, Turn left for Williton Green Subdivision. Lots available. Come join the happiest little community in Maine. The road sloped down the gently sloping hill into green fields and then wound its way through a copse of trees in the distance. Beyond that, he could see the late afternoon sun shining on the tiled roofs of a modern housing development. He turned and looked back the way he'd come. They slowed as soon as he turned, 
but the dogs were closer now, and he knew before long he would have to deal with them. He started down the hill and towards the happiest little community in Maine. The pack loped after him. Twelve. The young boy whistled sharply twice without taking the binoculars from his eyes as he watched the stranger turn towards Williton Green. He heard shouts behind him and knew the alarm was being passed along. Within a minute, a woman with dark hair pulled back in a ponytail climbed up into the lookout with him. What have we got, Sam? Some big guy. He's got a pack of dogs following him. He should be coming out of the tree soon. How many dogs? Six. If they don't get him in the trees, we should be able to see them soon. Six? That's enough for the brothers and to keep two for ourselves if we get them all. Lord knows we need them. Is he armed? He has an axe on his back. Guns? Don't think so. But he has a hook hand. A what? You know, he said, holding up his hand with his index finger curled. A hook, like the pirate in the picture book. She wasn't interested. Good boy. Give me the binox and go get Tommy and Jacob. Tell them to bring the shotgun and their bows and tell the other mothers there might be trouble coming and to lock the doors until I give the all clear. Yes, Mama. The woman watched her seven-year-old boy go and then leaned her elbows on the top of the wall and raised the binoculars to her eyes. She focused them on the road where it emerged from the trees. The lookout they had built against their side of the wall was well hidden in the shadows under the leaves of the oak tree that grew on the other side. Ostensibly, it was to give them early warning of the brothers coming to visit, but on occasions like this, it was a real handy early warning system for other visitors, too, especially since the brothers wouldn't allow them to have a gate. The big guy emerged from the trees at a fair speed, and she took a good look at him. Tall and well-built, his face was handsome but dirty with travel grime. He looked like he'd been on the road a long time. Interestingly, he looked unconcerned by his pursuers. No doubt he knew they were there, but his long strides ate up the distance between the trees and Williton Green at a steady rather than panicked pace. Must be slow in the head, she said as she lowered the glasses. He was close enough to watch without assistance now. He was heading straight for the unprotected entrance of their village. Tommy, her 15-year-old brother, and his friend Jacob came running and she turned on her perch and held out her hand. Don't climb up. Pass me the shotgun and get to the gate, quick. Stay out of sight with your bows drawn. There's a stranger coming and when he steps one foot through the entrance, I want you to turn him into a pincushion. Tommy passed up the weapon. Once you shoot him, let him lie where he drops and restring your bows real quick. There's dogs chasing him, and with a bit of luck we'll bag a few. Go. Yes, ma'am, said Jacob, and they turned to run. She had confidence the boys would do their job. The shotgun was just in case of an emergency. It was their only gun, the only one the brothers had let them keep. They didn't know about the bows or they'd have been confiscated too. She turned back to watch the stranger coming and saw the dogs come out of the trees behind him, close now. She leaned over the wall in anticipation. Then he stopped and looked up at the sign and scratched his chin with his hook as he looked through the opening to the town. Come on, she urged in a whisper. He didn't. In fact, he turned around to look at the dogs. That's when he reached under his jacket at the back and pulled a pistol out of his belt. Shit. She was about to turn and run to the boys when the stranger glanced back at the entrance. She held her breath. As if coming to a decision, he put the gun back in his belt and turned abruptly and began marching towards the dogs. Diana turned and threw the shotgun to the grass, jumping down from the platform and picking it up smoothly as she ran for the entrance. The boys looked around in surprise as she sped towards them. Quick, he's going to take them on. He's got a gun in his belt. Get the dogs first and shoot him if he reaches for it. She flew through the gate as if the devil was on her heels and they followed. 
The fight was already on as they ran through the gate. Two dogs were bleeding and twitching on the ground, and as they ran up, the stranger was hit hard, crashing to the asphalt as they sped towards him. In a flash, the other three dogs were on him, and he disappeared beneath the quivering, heaving mass. Shoot him while they're busy! Quick! The two boys skidded to a halt and knocked their arrows again. I'll take the big one, said Tommy as he closed one eye and pulled the string back. You take any of the others. The leader of the pack looked up, his muzzle red with blood, a split second before Tommy's arrow took him in the side. He yelped, then he fell to the ground. The second shot was not as clean, hitting another dog in the haunches near its spine. Its yelp was more like a scream, and it tried to flee, its back legs dragging behind it. Another arrow hit it in the eye, putting it out of its misery. Finished him for you, yelled Jacob. Tommy grunted. He had already knocked another arrow and loosed it before Jacob could beat him to the third dog. This one was too intent on worrying at the leg of the big guy to notice the danger it was in. The arrow took him in the neck and he collapsed, jaw locked on the leg of its erstwhile meal. The last dog seemed to sense danger and took off with its tail between its legs, only to fall a second later as Jacob's arrow took its left rear leg out from under it. Diana was on it in an instant, saving precious buckshot by clubbing the wounded dog hard over the head. She pulled a knife out of her jeans pocket and ended it. Tommy and Jacob high-fived each other. Two each, said Jacob. No way, dude. Di killed yours. I win two to one. No, I took it down. Enough, yelled Diana, racking her shotgun and walking over to the unconscious man. She looked down and pointed the shotgun at his face. He was out cold, but apart from the bleeding lump on his head and a superficial wound on his neck, courtesy of the lead dog, his leather pants and jacket appeared to have protected him from the worst of the attack. Tommy walked over with the arrow he'd pulled from the lead dog. We got all of them, sis. Well, with a little help from him, Tommy said, kicking the man in the hip. He knocked the gore-stained arrow and pointed it at the stranger's chest. Want me to finish him? Diana knew that would be easiest. It seemed lately there were no good men left in the world. Murderers and rapists, all of them. Best to end this one clean. Still, there was something about the way he carried himself. Something about the way he showed no fear in going back to face the dogs without his gun. And had he sensed their trap? No, she said putting her hand on her brother's forearm and gently lowering his aim to the ground. We'll take him back. What? Why would we do that? Tommy asked, his eyes wide. She didn't really have a good reason. Just a feeling. She turned back towards the entrance. As she suspected, she had an audience. She put her hands to her mouth. Bring the cart. We're having meat tonight. A cheer went up from the watchers. She turned and dropped to her knees, pulling the gun out of the stranger's belt. 13. Brooke was cooking at the stove when he walked into the farmhouse kitchen. Whatever it was, it smelled good, real good. He told her as much. What are we having, babe? She didn't turn. She didn't answer. Brooke? She must be annoyed with me, he thought. He walked over to her. But something wasn't right. No matter how many steps he took, he couldn't seem to get any closer. It was like he was on a moving walkway going the wrong way. He tried to angle so he could see her face, but no matter how he strained, he could only see the back of her head. Maybe she couldn't hear him. It was no wonder the loud laughing and talking was damn annoying, and why was it so freaking hot? Brooke! Luke's own shout woke him up, and the loud laughter and conversation ceased abruptly. He looked around. It was dark. He was surrounded by a bunch of unfamiliar faces lit by the glow of a big fire a few feet from where he sat. He was in some sort of a chair. It was low to the ground like a deck chair or something similar. A boy of about fifteen and a woman who looked a little older than Luke himself stood up and approached. The boy's lips glistened with the grease of a recently consumed meal. The woman was picking at her teeth. 
feeling dazed from his second concussion in a week. He felt like he was still dreaming. He tried to sit up. He couldn't. He was restrained, and the side of his head pulsed angrily in time with the beating of his heart. No use struggling, mister. You're tied up nice and tight, said the woman. She had straggly, dark hair pulled back off her face in a loose ponytail. Her face was pleasant without being beautiful. The set of her mouth was hard and determined. He eased his aching head back down, and his most recent memories came flooding back. The dogs. You saved me? he asked. But all that came out was an unintelligible croak. The boy laughed. He's a retard, Di. She cuffed him over the ear. Get the man some water, you idiot. The boy scowled, but did as he was told, disappearing behind Luke and returning a second later with a ladle of water. Luke gulped it down. Thanks. You hungry? Diana asked. Luke looked past the woman and saw meat on a spit over the fire behind her. The aroma caressed his nose and his mouth, filled with saliva. He nodded, not trusting himself to speak without dribbling. Kathy, can you slice off some meat for our guest? He saw a girl who looked to be a couple of years younger than Diana. She smiled shyly at him. Sure can. While she worked at the spit, he took the opportunity to look around. The fire had been built in the middle of a suburban street. Neat homes, some with candlelight in the windows, lined both sides of the road. Apart from the unkempt lawns and the worn clothes the people around him wore, it could have been a Fourth of July street party. The girl walked over holding a beaten-up aluminum plate stacked with steaming slices of meat. Want me to feed it to him, Di? No, Kathy, hand it over. I'll take care of it. The girl looked disappointed, but smiled at him again. Don't bite my fucking fingers, warned Diana, as she picked up a slice and held it over his mouth. Luke was hungry enough to swallow it whole, but took it between his teeth and forced himself to chew it thoroughly so he could savor the hot, salty morsel. While she hand-fed him, Luke regarded the group of people around him. Most had gone back to their own eating, although he was still getting a lot of attention. One thing stood out. There were no full-grown men, even though he saw at least four women in their twenties. The boy who had called him a retard seemed to be about the oldest of the males. His belly was satisfyingly full by the time she finished. Somehow even his aching head felt better. More? He shook his head. He could have easily eaten more, but knew he would probably only sick it up later if he overate after close to three days of near fasting. Just some more water, if you have enough. The boy brought him another ladle of water and then went back to the fire. I'm Diana, the woman said, after taking the empty plate back to the fire. I'm Luke, he said. Thanks for the meat. You're welcome, she said with a brief smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. Thanks for bringing it our way. Luke suddenly realized what he had just eaten. Diana laughed at the look on his face. They had a good chew on you before we killed him, she said, looking down at his lower legs. He followed her gaze. His leathers were torn up pretty good, and there was a clean bandage around his lower left leg. He hadn't felt it till she pointed it out but now that he was aware of it, his legs started stinging. Funny how the body worked. Guess I have to thank you on two counts. It's fine. We cleaned and disinfected the bites, but if they had rabies, that probably won't help. We'll have to shoot you. Luke laughed. She didn't, because she wasn't joking. Where are you from? She asked. Rhode Island, originally. Luke then gave her an abbreviated version of his story and told her where he was heading. Portland, she asked, her eyes narrowing. The talk around the fire hushed and all eyes were on them again. Yeah, why? Exactly, why? Why Portland? Luke suddenly felt he was on dangerous ground but had no idea why. He shrugged. In this case, he decided honesty was the best policy. 
Well, I went there as a kid. It was the best holiday I ever had. I guess I just wanted to see the ocean again. She seemed to relax. I see. Is there a problem with Portland? Don't know, she said, and her face told him the subject was closed. He didn't push it. So I couldn't help but notice there are no men. Nope. Why? All dead. I'm sorry. What happened? You ask an awful lot of questions, mister. Sorry, I'm just curious. Tell me to shut up if I bug you too much. She regarded him a moment, as if trying to read his thoughts. So you don't know what's in Portland? He looked at her blankly. Old shops, the seaside. Not what? I mean, like, who? He shook his head. Diana bit her lip as if weighing up something. She looked at the one called Kathy, who gave a quick nod. Have you heard of the Brotherhood? No, should I have? Not sure, but you sure as hell wouldn't be thinking of going to Portland if you had. Who are they? She spat on the ground. They're the reason there are no men older than fifteen here. When the boys turn sixteen, they come and take them to God. What? They take them to God. It's a fancy way of saying they draft them into their army. Luke thought about this. I take it you don't get a choice? Nope. There's a graveyard right behind that house over there marked with the crosses of those who said no. You fought them? She nodded. When? The first time? She looked at him fiercely. Two years ago. Looked all friendly and God-fearing, wearing their crosses and carrying staffs like fucking monks. What happened? he asked, noting that everyone had started listening, some moving closer to hear better. We let them in. We had gates then. They didn't look no trouble and we had lots of guns. We were being neighborly. Stephen always said, her voice hitched, we can't lose our humanity. And now, well, he was the first one they killed. Kathy went to her and put her hand on Diana's shoulder. They came in and ate with us. Kathy said. Then Brother Mike, the leader, told us that he wanted the men to come and serve God. Stephen said, Thanks for the offer, but we serve God in our own way. And we did, still do. The community center is our church. Luke felt like he had some unfinished business with the man upstairs. That's great. I'd like to pray there sometime if you'll let me. He wasn't lying. Diana's raw emotion had triggered his own thoughts about Brooke. Praying was the one thing he hadn't done since losing her. It felt about time. Anyway, Kathy continued, Brother Mike said it's not an offer, and that's when things went south, real fast. Diana took over again, her eyes far away. Long story short, things got a little heated and we kicked them out. I remember Brother Mike saying, You don't want to do this, my son, and Stephen spitting on the ground at his feet as we shut the gate on them. Stephen said, I'm not your son. Stay away. They came back the next day, drove their stupid truck with its golden crosses all over it straight through the gate. They poured out of that truck, at least twenty of them, and some had guns. We managed to kill a few, but they had too many men. Kathy took up the story again. They shot all the men and two of the women before the rest of us surrendered. We had to, or they would have killed us all. Of course, you did what you had to. Kathy looked down at Diana, who was quietly weeping again. Diana nodded. One by one, they executed our people who had been injured but not killed. And then Brother Mike dragged Stephen out into the middle of the main street so everyone could see. Let this be a lesson to you, he said. God punishes those who shirk their responsibilities, and we are the hand of God in this world. 
They shot him in the head. Silence fell over the group, the horror of what had happened two years before still fresh on their faces. So they haven't been back? Of course they've been back, spat Diana. They're like a cancer. You can't get rid of them. They come back every full moon, and we give them a contribution. A contribution? It's what they call it. Food and stuff we've grown or stuff we've scavenged that we think they might want. What happens if you don't? She looked at him like he had turned idiot. What do you think happens? We haven't let ourselves find out. This time they'll be taking Tommy and Jacob with them. They're of age. She nodded in the direction of a teenage girl with sad eyes. And probably Sarah, too. Diana's eyes told him all he needed to know about why they'd be taking the girl. He looked up at the perfect half moon. That meant they had roughly a week before the brothers were due. You could fight them, you know. I could help them. No. We fight, we die. We could fight, die, said Tommy, coming forward. His friend Jacob backed him up with a solid, Yeah! Don't be fools! She snapped, then put her hand on Tommy's shoulder. You'll be the first ones they kill, Tommy. I can't lose you, too. At least this way you'll be alive, and you and Jacob can look after each other and look out for Sarah. Tommy let it go. It's time to bed down, said Diana. Stoke the fire for our guest. You're going to leave me here? Luke asked. Yep, she said smiling but not unkindly as she draped a threadbare blanket over him. I was actually going to slash your throat if you caused a ruckus, but I think you're all right. If you behave tonight, we'll talk more in the morning. I might even untie you. Gee, thanks, he said. You're welcome, she said. He couldn't tell if she was ignoring his sarcasm or didn't notice it. Jacob and Tommy put some more wood on the fire as everyone started to head into the houses. When they had it roaring nicely, Tommy came across and stood over him. No funny business, mister, or a throat slashing is the least you'll have to worry about. Luke looked up at him, suppressing a smile. The kid was a bear cub trying to protect his family. Sure thing, Tommy. I'm not here to cause any trouble. Satisfied, the boy nodded and turned and headed back across the road to the house Diana had gone into. His friends followed him. Luke tested his restraints. There was no give. Nothing for it but to try and sleep. He was warm and comfortable, but his head ached. His leg was throbbing a little now, too. He began to think about his next move. He suspected he was going to be able to leave Williton Green with no problem, Diana and her group seemed decent enough, and he didn't intend on giving them any trouble. Problem was, if they were right about Portland, he would have to change his plans. No sense walking out of the frying pan into the fire. That wasn't the worst of it, though. Luke had always hated bullies, and this brotherhood sounded like the worst type. The type who killed in the name of God. He was surprised that this was the first time he'd heard of such a group since the flu had wiped out the country. In nearly every movie or book he'd consumed about the end of the world as a teenager, religious fanatics made at least one appearance. It wasn't a stretch to believe that the post-apocalyptic world would be fertile ground for people looking to find meaning in what had happened, and in their new lives by turning to religion. There was nothing wrong with that. In fact, it was human nature. But there were always those who could twist it to their own wicked interpretation— one needed to look no further than Islamic jihadists. Luke fell asleep about an hour after his hosts had retired for the evening. 14. Luke woke up to find a young boy of about eight looking down and examining him curiously. The throbbing in his leg was worse than it had been the night before. On a positive note, though, his head seemed better. Samuel, leave the man alone or you'll freak him out. 
Diana was at the fire, stirring a large pot hanging over it on a rudely made timber frame. The kid retreated. The resemblance to Diana was obvious. They both had the same dark eyes and olive skin. Your son? Luke asked, brushing the hair from his brow, only then realizing he was untied. She nodded. He looks like you. Carefully, he swung his legs over and sat up on the deck chair. It creaked under his weight. No one else had yet emerged from the other houses. Thanks for letting me loose. You're welcome. Want some oatmeal? Oatmeal? Where the hell did you get oatmeal? We grow the oats, of course. Seriously? Sure. Want to see? Yes, I do. Luke stood up and gingerly put weight on his bandaged leg. It was painful, but in a stinging kind of way rather than achy. You all right? Diana asked, walking over to him. Yes, yeah, just sore. What about your head? He wrapped himself on the skull. Hard as ever. Which way? Samuel, she said to her son. Stay here and stir the oats. We'll be back soon. Just going to show the man the farm. It's Luke. She smiled. I'm just going to show Luke the farm. The farm was actually a repurposed park in the center of the subdivision. Despite this, Luke couldn't help but be impressed. It was barely half an acre, but had been sectioned into four segments and to his untrained eye was flourishing. That's the oats crop, Diana said, pointing to the largest of the section. It just looked like tall, dry weeds to Luke, and he said as much. I guess it does, she laughed. As they walked closer, Diana explained that Stephen had grown up on his father's farm. One of the first things he'd insisted on was growing crops. After the Chinese had retreated, he had spent at least a month on a trip to Montville, the town where he grew up, scavenging as many seeds and grain and tools as he could. His efforts had borne fruit, and vegetable, and grains. They grew potatoes, pumpkins, and carrots, and had a decent plot of corn as well as the oat crop. Luke ran his hand over the feathery tops of the oat grass. So how do you harvest it? Must be hard work. Oh, no, the harvesting is the easy bit, she said. Separating the chaff from the grain is the worst bit. Luke looked at her blankly. Sorry, I'm a city boy through and through. Here, she said, pulling a long stem towards her. She pointed to the seed heads lining the long stems. See these pointy bits? They're the husks, and inside them are the actual oat grains. We gotta separate them from the grains by hand before we can mill them. We're due to harvest this crop in a couple of days, actually. Luke looked over the field. Holy cow. Even in this little patch, you must have millions of them. Yep. So when you're eating your oatmeal in a minute, just remember how much blood, sweat, and tears went into it. Yum. Sounds appetizing. She laughed, deciding right then she liked him. Come on. Enough of the tour. Now you get to sample the goods. So what do you do for meat? He asked her on the way back. You know, when strangers aren't leading dogs to you. Apart from the chickens and the occasional rabbit, she said, her cheeks reddening, we've just gone without. We have two goats. We'd never eat those. The kids raised them from babies, so they're just for milk. He was glad to see he wasn't the only one who felt a bit funny about eating dog. Perhaps it was a necessity, but it didn't mean they had to like it. Where are the rest of the dogs we killed? Butchered and salted. We have a house set aside for that. We'll give the brothers four and keep the last one. They headed back to the fire, and she served him a steaming plate of oatmeal. So how much of your crops do you have to give them? Half. And how many people do you have altogether? Thirty-five. Luke did some figuring in his head. That doesn't leave you with much. No wonder they were so happy about the dogs. We get by, she said, and shrugged. Later that day, Luke sat on a bench by the fire as she unwrapped the bandaging on his leg. 
The bite marks were starting to scab over, and thankfully there was none of the redness or swelling that might indicate infection. So, he said as she was rebandaging, my plan of visiting Portland is dead in the water. Do you mind if I stick around for a while? She pondered this for a moment, several emotions at war on her face, and when she opened her mouth to answer, he knew the answer would be no. I can help around the place, he said, preempting her, hunting and such. I'm not even above de-husking the oats if you want. I promise I'll bring more food in than I eat. I really like you, Luke, but I can't say yes. I would have to call a meeting so everyone could vote. Even if they said yes, though, it would be pointless. If you're here when the Brotherhood come in a week or so, they'll take you or kill you if you resist. You're really going to let them take the kids? Luke immediately regretted the question. Diana paused, replacing the bandage, and her eyes filled with tears. You think I want to? She asked through gritted teeth. He's my kid brother. But if you're asking if I'd prefer to see him go with them than dead on the ground, the answer is yes. Sorry said Luke, feeling like a heel. He decided to persevere, though. Listen, I can hide out when they come. Besides, when they take the three, you'll be down numbers and I can help bear some of the load. She bit her lip and concentrated on finishing her job before looking up at him. I'll put it to a vote, she said, and stood up, wiping her hands on her jeans. But the answer will be final, Okay, he agreed. So where is this little church? Fifteen. Diana left him alone in the hall of the small community center. Their place of worship was, as he expected, quite spartan. An optimistic number of chairs were set in rows facing the front, where a roughly hewn but impressive cross made of two weathered railway sleepers hung on the wall above a low dais and lectern. As he walked to the front, he looked at the faded posters that lined the wall. They advertised book drives and childminding and the like, a monument to the original purpose of the building. It was comforting but sad at the same time. He sat on a chair and closed his eyes. God, he began. I want to believe you're there. I need to. So here goes. Please look after my beautiful Brooke and our baby. His voice cracked, and he took a deep breath before continuing. They were taken from me. But I want to believe you had a reason for allowing that to happen. It doesn't make me feel any better about it, but... I guess I just need to get this out. I fucking hate you for taking them from me. I mean, what were you thinking, dude? The only thing that keeps me going is that I can still see good in this messed up world. Sorry for swearing, but man. He took another deep breath and wiped away his tears with the back of his hand. Anyway, I want you to tell Brooke I love her and our baby with all my heart. Tell her I'm sorry I couldn't save her. But I promise I'll try and make up for it. And that's it, I guess. Except I'll see her before long. He stood up. Thanks. And amen. Diana stood up after the evening meal. We're taking a vote. Luke wants to stay on for a time. There were a few claps and a whistle. I'm voting no. The Brotherhood are due soon, and if he's found here, he'll be taken or killed, and they'll probably kill a few more of us for good measure. If he manages to stay undiscovered when they come, it will be another mouth for us to feed, and no offense, Luke, she said, looking up at him. A pretty big one at that. This drew some laughter. Do you want to say anything before the vote, Luke? Sure. Well, I just want to say thanks for taking me in, 
and I'll accept whatever you decide. If you let me stay, I promise I'll work hard and do my best to produce more than I use or eat, he said, putting a hand on his belly and looking sidelong at Diana. The result was twenty-three to nine in favor of no. Sorry, said Diana, coming across to him afterwards. It's okay. I understand it's a pretty big deal to take a perfect stranger in. You're welcome to stay for two more nights. That'll give you plenty of time to get your strength back, and your legs should be as right as rain by then. Thanks. Luke made an effort to socialize with the rest of the group afterwards. He had no hard feelings towards them. He may have even voted the same way himself if he'd been in their position. He liked that every night through the spring and summer they had a communal fire and all ate together. They were a small enough group to do that, and it really added to a sense of community. What a shame they'd been interfered with by this brotherhood. He graduated to an old sleeping bag in front of the fire that night. He half expected a visit in the night from Diana's friend, Kathy. She had spent a good part of the night flirting with him, but he hoped his gentle rebuffs had gotten the message through. An awkward scene was the last thing he wanted. 16. The next day they began scything and harvesting the oats. Luke was happy to help. He noticed an unspoken ramping up in the speed of their work and knew it had to do with the impending visit of the brothers in five days. Thanks so much, Diana said that night as they sat around the fire, nursing blisters and sore muscles. It normally takes a day and a half to scythe the whole field, but we did it in one. Not a problem. It took me a while to work out how to hold the damn thing with this, he said, holding up his hook. But once I did, it was a breeze. No, it wasn't, she laughed. No, you're right, he grinned, and rubbed the shoulder where he had wedged the handle while he'd swung the bladed tool with his good hand. My armpit hurts like a bitch, not to mention my back. You sure that's not from the pitching? During their break for lunch, he'd spotted Tommy and Jacob playing with a beaten-up old Louisville slugger and an even more beaten, out-of-shape ball. He asked if he could join in. They'd let him, grudgingly, and he took turns pitching to them. While they'd been cagey at first, still not trusting him entirely, before long they were happily taking turns, listening to his random stories about the history of the game. Positive. That part was fun, he said, holding up his hook even if I didn't get a turn at bat because of this. The next day they began de-husking and separating the grains from the chaff. Diana was right. Harvesting had been the easy part, and in a way, Luke was glad he didn't have two hands. He made up for it by helping with the heavy lifting, stacking, and anything else that needed doing, so that the nimble hands of the rest could concentrate on the task at hand. They would be at it for days, but still... It was honest work, and the sense of community still shone through, no matter how tedious the work was. By the end of that day, they had two sacks full and still had three quarters of the bushels they had cut down to go. As they ate stew around the fire that night, Luke offered to stay one more day. I know I was supposed to go tomorrow morning, but if I stick around tomorrow and go the next day, you'll be past the worst of it, and you'll have two more sacks. Four is all you need for them, right? Then you can start on the vegetables. Maybe we should have a revote, Di? Asked Tommy. Yeah, said Jacob, along with a few others. Tommy had been the most enthusiastic of the no voters, perhaps seeing Luke as a threat to his own position. The two oldest boys in the group were clearly more enamored of him now than they had been before they'd gotten to know him. Diana ignored her brother. Okay, one more day but then you definitely have to scoot the morning after tomorrow. Okay, deal. They filled three more sacks the next day, and Luke got a start on digging up potatoes, managing to fill a barrel by the time they finished for the day. Why don't you hide how much you have? Luke asked on his final night. Maybe put four sacks on display so they only take two? We've tried that. They found us out and ended up taking our whole harvest of oats. That was bad. Real bad. We lost two kids that winter. Luke was silent. 
his distaste for the Brotherhood growing incrementally with every example of their cruelty. He didn't talk about fighting them again. Diana had clearly decided through experience that resistance was not worth it. He might not agree, but it was their community, not his. Diana came over to him as the last of her people retired for the evening. I want to thank you for your help. We would have done it without you, but it would have taken a lot longer. No problemo. Thank you for rescuing me and letting me stay here for a while. The normally non-demonstrative Diana then reached up and pulled him into a bear hug. The show of affection took him by surprise. While totally platonic, her show of affection was out of character. It's a bit cooler tonight. Why don't you sleep on the couch in our living room? Sure, that would be great. Thanks. As it was, they stayed up later than the others, sitting by the fire and talking about their lives before the attack. Diana had lived in Augusta with her parents, an only child. They'd succumbed to the flu quickly, just like his parents, and she'd basically curled into a ball on her bed and not moved for two days. As far as she knew, it was the end of the world, and that's where she'd die. That was when three of her friends had turned up and persuaded her to go with them. They spent a month on the run, hiding out from the Chinese as they made their way southwest, until almost starving and in a bad way physically, they met Stephen and his group. He'd been out hunting and offered to take them to his camp for a hot meal. That's how I ended up in Williton Green. What about your friends? Well, I guess we weren't that close. Stephen told us we could stay. They didn't want to. I did. They left. There was obviously some pain related to that parting. Luke didn't press any further, and Diana stood. I'm beyond tired. I'll see you in the morning she said, and rose wearily to her feet. Good night, Luke. Night, Diana. The next morning, Diana cooked another batch of oatmeal. Luke had two full bowls and went back to the fire for another. See, I told you we couldn't afford to keep you around. You'd eat us out of house and home. Well, if you didn't make it so delicious, I wouldn't need a third helping, Luke laughed. After he finished, Luke stood, his belly over full. Well, I better make tracks. Diana stood. Tommy, Jacob, go get Luke's gear. They came back with his axe and a small satchel. Luke slung his axe over his shoulder and then pointed to the satchel. What's that? Just some food and water. Enough for a day or two if you stretch it out, said Diana. Thanks, he said. I won't say no. He pulled her into a hug and then hugged the others who came up to say goodbye. Tommy and Jacob will see you to the gate. Okay. Thanks again for having me, he said, and gave her a salute. Luke fell in behind the two teenagers. Oh, wait, I almost forgot. He turned back. Diana reached behind and under the light jacket she was wearing and produced his Glock. She held it out by the barrel as she fished the spare clips from her jeans pocket. Luke held up his hand and hook. No, you keep the gun. A gift for saving my life. No, really. You should take it. It's dangerous out there. Doesn't matter. It's dangerous here, too. Think of it as an extra layer of protection. Especially if you're losing the boys. She looked like she was going to argue further, but in the end, nodded and smiled before tucking the gun away again. Thanks. A few minutes later, Luke was walking back through the entrance to Williton Green and headed up the hill where he had nearly lost his life to the pack of dogs. He turned back once before entering the trees and saw Tommy and Jacob still watching. He gave them one last wave before disappearing. 17. He paused when he got back to the junction of the 202. Well, where to now, Lukey boy? He asked himself. You know what? I still want to see the ocean. Screw the Brotherhood. He pulled the creased map from the pocket of his leather jacket and unfolded it on the road top. One day's walk along the 202 would see him arrive in a town called Alfred, where he could stop for the night. From there, he could join the 101, 
That would take him the rest of the way to the coast. A name on the map jumped out at him. Old Orchard Beach. He remembered his family had done a day trip from Portland to Old Orchard Beach. It had been about a 25-minute drive south, but was directly east from his current location. That would do nicely, and hopefully the change of destination would help him avoid the Brotherhood altogether. He set off with a bit more energy in his steps. He would get to see the ocean and relive some fond memories after all. He remembered spending a good hour playing pinball in the arcade on the old wooden pier. He wondered if it was still standing. Luke stopped for the night in Alfred. The town was abandoned, and a cursory observation told him it had been pretty much looted bare. Despite that and the late afternoon sunshine, it looked inviting. It was leafy and looked like it had been a quiet little town where he imagined everyone had known everyone. He didn't waste time looking for food. He'd only eaten one sandwich and a carrot for lunch, so still had enough for two days. He topped up the water bottle Diana had packed for him with rainwater from a puddle and picked a house a few streets off the main road to sleep in. There was no need to break down the door. It was already off its hinges, as were the doors of every house he saw. He headed up the stairs and found an unoccupied bedroom with a dusty bed and pillow upon which to rest his head. The door had a lock, so he made use of it, but was not really concerned about uninvited visitors through the night. Before closing his eyes, he rolled over and pulled out the bedside drawer and reached in. You never know what you might find. He scrabbled around in the dark and his fingers found a book, a set of keys, and some loose coins. He pocketed the coins, not really thinking about why, and was about to pull his hand out when his fingers brushed against a soft, papery box tucked right up the back. Cigarettes. Excitedly, he felt around hoping to find a lighter. He didn't but what he did find was a half-used book of matches. Not as good as a lighter, but it would do. He pocketed them, too, and closed his eyes. Dawn was just touching the eastern horizon when he set out the next morning. Barring unforeseen circumstances, he estimated he should arrive in Old Orchard Beach late that afternoon. The trip was uneventful until around midday, when he came across the strangest sight he'd seen since setting out with Isaac all those years ago. He had just passed through a small town and was traveling down an open length of road with forest on either side when he saw rustling in the bushes about thirty yards ahead. From the amount of noise and movement, he could tell it was something big, something bare big. He had only just paused and put his bag down in case he needed to quickly unloose his axe, when an African lion sauntered onto the road carrying a fresh kill, a fox, dangling from its jaws. Luke froze, his mouth hanging open. A lion, on a road, in Maine. Robert Frost would be rolling over in his grave. With his heart pounding in his chest, he watched it. It looked as though it was going to cross the road without looking his way, but then, almost as if sensing he had company, the lion stopped and swung its big, maned head his way. Golden eyes as big as baseballs met his. Luke held the big animal's gaze and stood as still as he could. It was only a few seconds, but to Luke it felt like ten minutes before the king of the forest dismissed him, and disappeared into the brush on the other side of the road. Well, now I've seen it all, he said. He stayed put to make sure the big fellow wasn't coming back. After a few minutes, his heart rate returned to normal, and he set off again, glancing over his shoulder several times to make sure he wasn't being stalked by a big-ass kitty. It was mid-afternoon as he entered Biddeford. It was big, but a ghost town. He didn't plan to find out if there were any inhabitants after his troubles back in Bow Lake Village and stuck to the road all the way to an intersection called the Five Ways. He turned onto the one here, also known as Elm Street, and briefly thought of the horror movie A Nightmare on Elm Street. That movie had given him nightmares as a kid. His older cousin Tony had insisted they watch it at a sleepover. It just seemed childish and silly now, 
given what they had all lived through since. Crossing over the Seiko River, he spotted the first people he had seen since Williton Green. In the distance and heading his way were a man and a woman leading a horse and cart. The clip-clop of the horse's hooves echoed off the buildings around them. Luke maintained a steady pace. They looked harmless enough. As they drew closer, he saw they were around his age, the man tall and thin with a scraggly beard, the woman much shorter. They wore what looked to be homespun clothes, set off incongruously by matching bright red baseball caps. The couple eyed him suspiciously, and he realized he must look a little sinister with his leathers and axe handle showing over his shoulder. Luke raised his hand and smiled. Hey, he called, only then realizing the woman had a shawl-wrapped baby held against her chest. He felt tears sting his eyes as a brief wave of emotion rolled over him. Hi, said the man, maintaining his pace. Luke slowed a little but didn't move towards them. He noted the cart was empty. Are you coming from Old Orchard Beach? Yes, sir. We sold a batch of pumpkins and bought some supplies. This earned the man an elbow in the ribs from his companion. It's all right, Nat. We can't be scared of everyone. No, ma'am, no danger here. I'm just passing through, Luke said, holding up his hands. Well, one hand and one hook. The woman's eyes widened and he put them down sheepishly. So there are people in the town, then? The other guy slowed his horse and cart to a stop. His partner glared up at him, but didn't protest. Oh, for sure, lots. Awesome, said Luke, thinking the opposite. You can get yourself a meal and an ale. You look like you could use one. Luke laughed. Yep, I reckon I could. So there is a market or something? Yeah, a big one. You have anything to sell? No. Who runs it all? The couple looked at each other, and then the young woman nodded. The town kind of runs itself, but the answer to the Brotherhood. I see. You know them? I've heard tell of them, said Luke, totally unaware he was speaking like a character from a bad Western movie. The man let out the rope he was leading the horse with and came closer. Just watch yourself with them. They're okay if you don't stir the pot, but they patrol the town, kind of like cops. They're pretty tough on troublemakers. Thanks for the heads up, said Luke. Let me guess, they don't provide policing for free? No, sir, there's a cost, but the people in town are happy to pay. They pay for protection and nothing bad happens? That's about the sum of it. A good old-fashioned protection racket. How many people are in town? Um, don't know for sure, but I'd guess a couple of thousand. And they don't take the boys when they turn 16? No, sir, not from Old Orchard anyway. Just those that want to volunteer. It figured, thought Luke. A few thousand people were likely to cause a whole lot more of a ruckus if someone took their sons than a smaller settlement. The baby began to bawl. Oh, I better let you go then. Do you have far to travel? No, sir, said the other man, tugging on the rope and taking his wife's hand. Just a few miles. Take care. You too, said Luke, walking on. He stopped after a few paces and turned, watching the small family go on their way. His face was devoid of emotion as he turned back east. His eyes, another story altogether. He stopped to refill his bottle from a bucket of almost fresh water sitting under the downpipe of a gas station before continuing on his way. When he came across a sign to the Wild Acres RV Resort about a mile out from Old Orchard Beach proper, he turned right and headed towards it. The conversation with the couple about the Brotherhood patrolling the town and the fact that he was dog-tired helped him decide to stay the night in the RV park. Better to be fresh and well-rested in case of trouble. Luke found an empty trailer, ate his last half sandwich, and crashed for the night. He was still hungry, but at least he would deal with whatever he found in Old Orchard Beach after a good night's sleep. Part 3. Have You Seen My Ball? 18. 
Luke awoke and climbed out of the trailer as the first tendrils of dawn were crawling across the dark sky. He took a long, deep breath and savored the salty air. So close now. His stomach growled. He guzzled the rest of his water to shut it up and then went back into the trailer to get his axe. The sack Diana had given him was empty now, so he left it. He was just heading to the door of the trailer when he spotted a glimpse of silver under the bench seat by the door. He may not have noticed it if he hadn't stooped a little to avoid hitting his head on the top of the door. He reached under the seat, grabbing the round object. A watch. No, it was a stopwatch, not the digital kind. This was the old mechanical kind with a big button on the top and a smaller button at the 11 o'clock position. Luke smiled as he stood up and clicked the big button on top. Awesome, he breathed like a kid with a new toy as the second hand began to race around the clock face. Its weight was comforting in his hand, and he let it go the full sixty seconds to make sure the minute timer on the smaller inset face was working. It was. Whistling happily, he stepped out of the trailer and elbowed the door closed before heading back out to Seiko Avenue. He decided to delay entering the town center for a bit longer and took a direct shortcut to the water through some of the smaller streets behind the RV park, even jumping a couple of fences to head straight to the water. It took Luke exactly 11 minutes and 22 seconds from the RV park until he clicked off his stopwatch and looked out over the Atlantic Ocean. He finally reached the beachside down a little side street between a bar and a general store with a distinctly beachy feel, well south of the pier. Glancing in at the dust-covered neon signs hanging in the windows of the store, he was surprised to realize it was the same store that his grandmother had taken him to for an ice cream all those years ago. Wow. It didn't look much different to how he remembered. He peered in the window long enough to satisfy his reminiscences and then headed to the end of the road where the blacktop met the sand. He slipped off his boots. The sand was cool between his toes, but the day was bright and he had to squint as he made his way down to the water. There was no one else on the long stretch of sand and he paid particular attention to the pier in the far distance. That part of town had wood smoke rising into the blue sky, a clear sign of occupation, and he was comforted by the fact that he had a good line of sight along the beach in case of a threat. He reached the water. It wasn't exactly a surfer's paradise, but as the cold water ran over his feet, Luke decided he couldn't come all this way and not take a dip. Five minutes later, Sans clothes and other accessories, including his hook hand, he was wading around in the frigid water and scrubbing himself clean with sand from the sea floor. Brooke would have loved this. There was only so much lolling in the waves one could do on their own, and after ten minutes he emerged and allowed the sun to dry his naked body before slipping his sling and hook back on. The leathers followed, then the axe. He returned to the side street that had led him to the beach and stopped in front of the old store to put his boots back on. Time to visit the town of Old Orchard Beach. Luke followed Grand Avenue. It ran parallel to the beach and took him all the way to the pier. He stopped at the intersection with Old Orchard Street and looked around with wide eyes. To the right was the pier as he remembered, but to the left, whole blocks of buildings had been raised leaving a large square that bordered Old Orchard Street and Imperial Street to the north. The western end was intersected by the old railway line he remembered, although the boom gates were long gone. The Old Orchard Beach tourist town he remembered looked and smelled more like a medieval village now. It was bustling with people and livestock. The only reminders of the past were the occasional rusting hulk of a car and the faded signs for long-gone businesses and brands on the remaining ramshackle buildings around the square. The people were as unkempt as the town itself, but still, given that its first inhabitants would have been no older than sixteen or seventeen at most, it was a testament to the social and resolute nature of human beings. This was the first real inhabited town, besides the colonel's settlement, that he'd come across in the after days. Unlike Williton Green, it wasn't just a collection of people surviving. 
Based on what he could see, there was commerce, industry, and entertainment. Stalls lined the square, and one of the buildings had smoke coming from the chimney accompanied by the clang of a hammer on metal. A blacksmith? People milled around the square, laughing, shouting, selling wares, eating and drinking. He even spotted a juggler entertaining a group of children. He blended in with the crowd, but a few people gave him second looks. He wasn't exactly inconspicuous. Luke walked around the edge of the square, looking at the goods on offer in the rickety stalls. People were passing coins and depositing purchased items into sacks. Food, mainly, but there were also stalls offering clothes, tools, and even weapons. Not firearms, but things like old Confederate swords, knives, and axes. After a few minutes, he spotted a pair of big men walking around the perimeter of the square. They wore the brown monk's habits of the Brotherhood. Both men carried small clubs, and wherever they walked, people tended to part like the Red Sea before Moses. It was clear to Luke's eyes that they were what passed for law in Old Orchard Beach, but there was an element of fear they seemed to inspire that spoke volumes for what the townsfolk thought of them. He watched them, stooping a little so as not to stand out. When one turned in his direction, he turned to the nearest stall, pretending to examine the goods laid out before him. Pretended, that is, until his eyes fell on the gleaming tray of red and green baubles on rude sticks in front of him. Are those candy apples? The girl behind the stall looked to be about twelve. She had soft blonde hair and a spattering of freckles on her nose. She smiled uncomfortably, like she was being addressed by a simpleton. Durr, mister. Her rotten black teeth marred what should have been a beautiful smile. He barely noticed, his disbelieving eyes not leaving the sweet treats he remembered from his childhood. Sorry, I haven't seen one in a long, long time. They're a coin apiece. He reached for one, half expecting it to disappear like a mirage as he grasped the rough stick. An unfamiliar emotion took him as he raised the ruby-red delicacy for closer inspection. Delight. The girl tensed. The big stranger was odd, and she got ready to scream like her mama had told her to if anyone tried to take something without paying. He didn't. He just stood there like a big old dummy staring at the candy apple. You can have it for a coin, mister. A long, lost memory came to him unbidden, a carnival, laughter, his mom and dad, his favorite cousin, Kenny. Mister, pay up or I'll call the brothers. Her insistent voice jolted him back to the present. No, it's okay, he said, looking over his shoulder briefly. He could still see the brothers in the distance. A coin? Any coin? She nodded. Luke reached into his jeans pocket and pulled out the handful of coins he'd been carrying. Why he'd picked them up, he wasn't sure, but now he was glad he had. He pinched a half dollar between his thumb and forefinger and let the other slide back into his pocket. He then held it up triumphantly and flicked it to her. The girl's hand snatched it out of the air and she squealed in delight when she saw it. A half dollar? Thanks, mister. Did the type of coin make a difference? She just asked for a coin. He didn't examine the question any harder than that as he bit into the toffee apple. The sweet crunch of the toffee gave way to the bitter taste of the stale fruit beneath. He didn't care. In a daze of pleasure, he savored every bite and didn't move until he had stripped it to the core. When he finished, he came back to himself and turned quickly. The brothers were nowhere to be seen. He scanned the square, the core of his candy apple suddenly lying forgotten in the mud. That was when a hand fell on his shoulder. 19. Isaac was helping Indigo move a sofa into the corner of their new apartment when the bell began to peal. The bell, she said unnecessarily. Isaac was already on his way to the door. I'll go see he said, pausing at the door. Unless you want to? 
No, you go, she said, joining him at the threshold. I'll look after the kids. Okay. Isaac grabbed his gun from the drawer of the table by the door before giving her a kiss and disappearing. The bell was only supposed to be sounded in the event of an emergency, but it had already been rung twice in the week since they'd moved into the tower. Both times had been false alarms. Well, not false exactly, but minor. One had been a kid breaking his ankle in a fall while horsing around with his friends. The second time it had been sounded when a horse came moseying down the street in front of their new home. That one had drawn a crowd and provided them with some comedic entertainment. He had come from nowhere and continued on his way, breaking into a gallop when Ben and a few of the other guys had tried to catch him. Fun, but no emergency. Based on those, Isaac took his time making his way down the fire stairs. When he emerged into the lobby, he realized his mistake. A crowd of his people were already lining the plate glass windows and looking outside. Ben was at the doors, his hands on his hips, looking at a vehicle that had pulled up on the front of the Brady Sullivan Tower. A kid of about thirteen stood behind him, ringing the bell, craning to look out at the khaki-colored jeep. Isaac put a hand on the kid's shoulder and nodded. The boy put his hand on the bell, muting it. "'What have we got?' he asked Ben. "'Looks like an old army jeep. No one's got out yet, though.' Isaac looked out unable to make out the driver or the passenger through the plastic side windows of the jeep's canopy. Have you got a pistol? Ben nodded and patted the lump under his waistband at the rear. Okay, let's go and say hello to our visitors. Ben led the way out, and they approached the vehicle slowly, their hands by their sides. We'll stop here, Isaac said before stepping onto the sidewalk. He saw the dark figures put their heads together, and then the door closest to them opened. An older man in faded army fatigues climbed out and stretched to his full height, looking at them with a direct gaze. Hello, Isaac. Long time no see. Colonel Randall. Wow, said Ben as Isaac brushed past him. Isaac shook the old man's hand warmly. The driver got out. Isaac didn't recognize him. Well, I didn't think we'd ever see you again, he said to the colonel. I thought the same. It's good to see you, Isaac. You too, Ben. Cheers, colonel. Good to see you, said Ben. So how did you... Isaac wasn't sure how to phrase the question. Find you? Randall finished for him. We didn't. A week and a half ago, we had a visitor ourselves. Luke, said Isaac. He's alive. Obviously, but he's okay? Yes, alive and well. You had doubts? Well, he was in a bad way when he left, said Isaac. Ben lowered his head, his face grim. Randall nodded. He didn't say a lot, and I didn't probe. It looked a bit raw for him. He nodded at Ben. I figure it still is. Isaac nodded. You said, had a visitor? Yes, he stayed for a night and then went on his way. Said he was heading to the coast. I see, said Isaac. He felt down. While he felt guilt over what happened, with Indigo's help he had begun to deal with that. Now it was just as simple as missing his friend. He snapped out of it. Sorry, I'm being rude. Please come on in and have a drink. We have tea. Colonel Randall held up a finger. That reminds me he said, going to the back of the jeep and unclipping the canopy enough to lift the corner and reach in. Luke seemed pretty impressed when we served him a cup of this, so I thought I might bring you a couple of jars. Isaac recognized the red and yellow label of Folger's instant coffee as soon as he saw it. Coffee? It has been a while, thanks, he said, taking the two sixteen-ounce jars. Pleasure. Call it a housewarming gift. We'd like to help you all out as much as we can, he gestured at the tower, while you get started. Ben ran on ahead as Isaac led the colonel inside, his driver staying with the jeep. So I take it you're nearby, sir? Yes, we set up in Concord. Concord? Really? And how many of you are there? Uh, just on five hundred, give or take. Amazing, said Isaac, as he led the colonel inside. Welcome to Manchester. By the time the colonel left two hours later, 
Isaac felt happier than he had any time since they'd left the farm in such a hurry. The two leaders agreed that Isaac would bring a delegation to Concord for a look around and to start negotiations on trade and intel swapping. As a gesture of goodwill, the colonel was going to make it his first order of business to send a crew to help get power up and, if possible, also running water for the tower. Isaac held Indigo's hand as they waved their unexpected visitor goodbye, barely able to hide the smile on his face. Good day, huh? she said. He squeezed her hand. The best for a while. 20. Luke tensed, his pulse quickening as he turned slowly. The figure looming over him wasn't one of the brothers, though. It was a tall, painfully thin kid. A boy, about an inch taller than him, but a good five years younger. Dirty and underfed. Have you seen my ball? The boy said, his eyes fixed somewhere between Luke's navel and his chin. No, kid. What's it look like? He asked, keeping the irritation out of his voice. Have you seen my ball? Luke's face softened as he noticed the kid swaying gently side to side, a sapling in a gentle breeze. His eyes glued to Luke's chest. No, buddy, I haven't seen your ball. What color is it? The kid seemed to consider this a moment, then repeated, Have you seen my ball? He don't have no ball, mister, said a stout woman passing by. You're wasting your time talking to Spalding. He's simple. Luke gave her a look that made her shrug as she went on her way. He put his hand on the kid's arm. Spalding, have you seen my ball? Do you want something to eat, kid? Have you seen my ball? His hands were fidgeting now, and Luke came to a decision. You know what, Spalding? I have seen your ball, said Luke. Come with me. He grabbed the kid by the forearm and led him along the stalls till he came to one that was manned by a guy with one arm of his plaid shirt pinned to his shoulder. The guy looked at Luke's hook and nodded at his fellow amputee. How you doing? Luke asked and scanned the goods on offer. The one-armed man's stall had an eclectic assortment of toys. It was junk for the most part, broken and cracked relics from bygone days, but he spotted what he was looking for right away a box of balls. Luke rummaged through it, pulling out the largest ball he could find. It was a tennis ball with Wilson U.S. Open printed on it. Nothing bigger than this? He asked the stallkeeper. No, sir, that's it. A coin? Sure. Luke gave him a dime. Thanks, said Luke, turning to the kid. Here you go, kid. I found your ball. He tossed the ball and was surprised at the dexterity the kid displayed to catch it one-handed and hug it to his chest. Have you seen my ball? The kid asked and began tossing and catching his ball in precise little throws of around eight inches. Luke was about to ask him again if he wanted something to eat when he turned abruptly and headed off without so much as a look back. He kept asking his question as he went. That was real nice of you, mister, said the man behind the stall. Luke shrugged, watching the hypnotic up-down motion of the ball over the heads of the crowd. He turned back to the stall. Is there anything to see on the pier? It was the other man's turn to shrug. More stalls, some eats. Luke looked around the square and spotted the two brothers he had seen earlier on the other side of the square, then another pair in the shade of the stalls closer to the pier. How many of the brothers patrol the town? Usually three pairs. Two in the square and one out on the pier. Why? Oh, just curious. They seem to keep good order, he said. The other man spat in the dirt. They're assholes. Luke smiled. I figured as much, he said, before heading into the crowd. He decided he'd have a look at the pier before leaving Old Orchard Beach. There was no reason to stay. He'd seen the ocean and scratched that particular itch. And now that the all-encompassing grief he'd been feeling had faded to a dull ache, 
he found that he was missing his people. It was time to go home. He made his way through the crowded square. Now that he'd made the decision to go home, he felt lighter, as if a burden had been lifted. It would be good to see Isaac, Indigo, Ben, and the rest again. He thought he might even visit Concord on the way back and say hi to the colonel and his assistant, Becky. Luke smiled at the locals as he squeezed past them, his good mood at the decision rubbing off on his general disposition. He passed the stall at the end of the square where the second pair of brothers loitered without looking at them and headed out towards the pier. The pier didn't look much different to how he remembered it. A wooden ramp led up to a kind of rickety-looking hodgepodge of buildings on spidery stilts. For old time's sake, he took a walk through it. It didn't feel quite so big as it had when he was a kid, and the smell of popcorn and cotton candy was absent, replaced by a kind of damp staleness. He'd made it about halfway along when he saw the pier patrol coming his way. He'd seen enough and thought it better not to tempt fate. He turned around and headed back. While they obviously had some questionable methods, maybe this brotherhood wasn't as bad for everyone as Diana thought. He thought he might drop back in at Willetton Green as he passed through to tell them what he'd seen in Old Orchard Beach. He thought it might ease her mind about what would happen to Tommy and the rest when they left. Luke headed down the ramp and back into the town square and instantly noticed the commotion on the north side of the square. A crowd had gathered, yelling and whistling. Naturally curious, he headed across the square and then sidled through the crowd until he could look over the shoulders of those in the front row. What he saw angered him. Both pairs of the brothers who had been patrolling the square had surrounded the kid, Spalding. They had taken his ball and were throwing it to each other as the poor kid, tears running down his face, tried to grab it. His knees were bloody and snot ran down over his mouth and chin. Obviously, they'd been at it a while. Have you seen my ball? The kid wailed. Here it is, dummy. Come and get it, said the tallest of the brothers, holding it out. The kid made a play for the ball, and the brother threw it over his head to another, a cruel game of piggy in the middle. No, here it is, dummy. Come on, I'll let you have it. As the kid spun around, the tall brother kicked him in the backside. Spalding tumbled to the road. Luke felt his anger grow hotter. Not my fight, he told himself. Some in the crowd laughed along with the brothers. However, most were silent and disapproving. The kid got to his feet. Have you seen my ball? He asked plaintively, as he rushed at the brother now holding the ball, a stocky youth of about twenty with blonde, spiky hair, Spalding charged at him, and Blondie threw it to the fellow beside him. The kid tried to change direction, but he tripped, and his momentum carried him directly into Blondie. They both crashed heavily to the pavement in a tangle of legs and arms. The three brothers doubled up, laughing raucously at their buddy's misfortune, along with a goodly portion of the crowd. Spalding scrambled to his feet fast, his eyes flitting this way and that, looking for his ball. The third brother, a good-looking black guy with a scar on his cheek waved the ball tantalizingly at Spalding, who immediately started towards him. That was when Blondie, his nose bleeding, reared up behind him and grabbed the kid by the hair, ripping him backwards and slamming him down into the pavement. The crowd groaned and the brothers laughed, all except Blondie, who had murder in his eyes. He leaned over Spalding, with his hand still twisted in the kid's hair. You fucking hit me, you retard, he spat as he pulled the billy club out of his belt. Spalding struggled, attempting to free his hair and stand at the same time. Blondie swung his club. It never found its intended target. To those mesmerized by the cruel show in front of them, the big red-haired man seemed to have come from nowhere. Not there one moment, there and swinging his big old axe the next. The flat of the axe head knocked the billy club out of Blondie's grasp. He dropped to his knees, rocking and howling as he nursed his shattered hand. Luke stood over him long enough to ensure he wouldn't be a problem before facing the other three. That's enough, he said. Give the kid his ball. The shock of the attack wore off quickly, and all three took out their billy clubs. Mister, 
You just bought yourself a whole lot of trouble, said the big one as they moved to surround him. You should drop that axe. Luke planted his feet apart, holding the axe loosely. I said, give the kid his ball. Almost on cue, Spalding climbed to his feet, rubbing the back of his head. Have you seen my ball? He asked no one in particular. The brother with the ball held it out to the kid. The other hand held the billy club. He was tapping it rhythmically against his thigh. Here you go, kid. Come get your ball, he said. Luke knew what would happen next. They would grab the kid and threaten to hurt him until Luke dropped his weapon. He couldn't let that happen. Even as Spalding started towards the black brother, Luke raised the axe and in one powerful motion threw it hard at the man. He released it in such a way that it didn't spin end over end, just flew head first straight at the man holding the ball. The top of the weapon struck him in the forehead and he fell backwards, out cold before he hit the pavement. Then three things happened. The ball rolled free of his hands and bounced away as Spalding chased it. The larger of the remaining brothers rushed at Luke, and the last man, apparently not liking these new odds, pulled a whistle from under the robe at his neck and began blowing it frantically. Luke blocked the first swing of the big guy's billy club with his hook arm and swung a punch at the hard belly of the brother. It was like punching a sack of flour, and the big guy didn't even wince. His charge carried them both to the ground. His assailant rolled on top of him and punched Luke in the side of the head. It was a glancing blow, but Luke still saw stars. He managed to shove his forearm under the bastard's throat and grab for the club with his good hand. In something of a stalemate, their hands wrestled for control of the polished wooden club. That's when the last brother saw his opportunity to end it. He dropped the whistle from his lips. I'm going to crack your skull, he yelled as he charged. Luke looked up. But before he even had a chance to feel dismay, he saw the brother's face change from determination to surprise as he fell face first onto the pavement. Luke spied the stick that had tripped the brother as it disappeared between the legs of the front row and then appeared again over the top, a blurred arc. It crashed down on the fallen brother's head and knocked him out cold. Luke heard a distant whistling. That would be backup from the brothers patrolling the pier. Luke renewed his efforts, pushing his forearm harder into the throat of his attacker while keeping his full weight on the arm that held the club they were fighting for. The brother resisted for a few more seconds, then his numb fingers lost their grip, and Luke pulled the club free and smacked him hard on the temple. Lights out. Luke got to his feet, exhausted, and crossed the carnage of the battlefield to pick up his axe. The whistling was closer now, and he stood, axe in hand, ready to face the fresh pair of combatants when they arrived. The kid was nowhere to be seen. That was good. He wouldn't come out on top this time, and it was better if the kid wasn't around to face the wrath of the Brotherhood afterward. Then a strange thing happened. As the patrol from the pier wound their way through the throng, the crowd closed around him. Luke felt himself pulled and guided gently by unseen hands. Time for you to go, me boy, a gruff voice said behind him. He turned and found the one-armed man from the toy stall grinning at him. He held the stout walking stick that had taken care of the brother. He tucked it under his arm and handed Luke the worn fur overcoat that was draped over his shoulder. Put that coat on and get out as quick as you can. We'll cover for you. Luke propped his axe against his thigh and pulled the long black coat on before tucking the axe under the voluminous garment. He heard a yell from the direction of the scene of the recently fought battle. Go! Luke made off to the sounds of cursing and harsh questions from the newly arrived brothers, his escape covered by the crowd, several of whom patted him appreciatively on the back as he went. 21. Luke headed out of Old Orchard Beach quickly. He decided he wouldn't stop until he hit Alfred again. There, he would spend the night in the house where he found the matches. He didn't know if the Brotherhood would begin a manhunt for him, but if they did, he doubted it would reach as far as Alfred. He arrived in Alfred an hour after dark. There was a chill in the night air, so he was glad of the overcoat and didn't waste any time finding his former abode. His head hurt. His feet hurt. 
he just wanted to sleep. Sleep he did. So soundly, in fact, that if anyone had stumbled upon him in the night, they could have taken care of him without a peep. In the morning, he went into the backyard and whizzed, enjoying the early morning sun on his neck before heading back in to grab his axe and newly acquired overcoat. He clipped his axe in place and tied the big overcoat around his waist. It flopped almost to the ground, and he thought if it got too annoying, he might have to discard it. And that would be a damn shame, he said, as he opened the front door of his overnight stay. He was about to step down onto the path when he heard something he'd only heard yesterday for the first time in a long time, the clip-clop of horses' hooves. Luke stopped in his tracks and changed course, heading behind an overgrown hedge that would hide him from the main street. As the hooves drew closer, he also heard men's voices. He got down low and snuck to the end of the hedge. One hundred yards away from the intersection with the 202, at ground level and in the shadows, he was virtually invisible. He pulled out his stopwatch and clicked it on to pass time while he waited. Three minutes and twenty-three seconds later, they came into view. The Brotherhood. Six of them, all wearing the brown monk's habits except for one who wore black. They were leading two Clydesdale horses pulling a utility trailer each. Horses pulling car trailers looked strange, but probably no more incongruous than a bunch of guys in monk's habits walking down Main Street, USA. Initially, he thought they might be after him, but they were too far from home, and why the hell would they bring Clydesdales to apprehend a fugitive? No, these guys were on a mission, and it didn't take a genius to work out this was the group headed to Williton Green to collect their monthly contribution. All of them looked strong and lean and carried wooden staffs rather than billy clubs. He didn't spot any other weapons. Within a few seconds they had passed, and Alfred returned to the quiet little ghost town it had been a few minutes before. Luke stood up, reset the stopwatch, and walked out onto the 202. He watched the small procession disappear into the distance, then clicked the stopwatch on. Five more minutes ought to give him enough room to pursue them without being spotted. He revised his plans to visit Willetton Green. He was pretty sure these guys would have his description, and he was just as sure he wouldn't be able to hold his tongue if he headed to the town and these assholes were taking their spoils, not to mention the kids. Diana had made that clear, and she seemed to know what she was doing. No, he would pass Brotherhood, skip Willetton Green, and head for home. Not my business. 22. So we'll be taking two boys back with us, senior brother? The six men sat around a fire they had built by the side of the road. Yes, brother Mark, said the man in the black monk's habit. The color marked him as a senior and the leader of this particular expedition. They would reach Willetton Green mid-afternoon tomorrow to collect their contribution for the month, plus the new recruits. Jared, his bald head glinting in the firelight, reached into his habit and pulled out a scroll of paper that he unfurled. Their names are Thomas and Jacob. Oh, and we'll be collecting a female, too. Two of the brothers whooped and high-fived each other. The white rope around their waists marked them as novices, and they were the youngest of the group. Told you, Damien, the scrawnier of the two said. Senior brother Jared sprung to his feet, his hickory staff a blur as it cut through the air and collected first one, then the other on the head. Lucky for the two boys, he pulled his strikes. Even if they were glancing blows, they still hurt, and both boys collapsed to the dirt, moaning and holding their skulls. You will show respect for the eaves. They are not for your pleasure. They are God's sacred vessels. He spun his staff with a flourish and rested it beside him as he sat back down. Taylor saw the more experienced members of the crew look nervously at each other as he served them up bowls of stew. The heavily muscled Jared was a serious bastard and meted just as swiftly and surely, as the two boys had just found out to their detriment. No one was better with the staff than this senior brother, 
and since the edict banning them from carrying guns on collections, there was no one Taylor would rather travel with. He was mean, but highly skilled, and fought with a righteous fury when provoked. Not that anyone would dare provoke them. Over the years, the Brotherhood had grown and systematically swallowed up or defeated every outpost in the southwest of Maine. Collections only took place in territories they had conquered, so there was little chance of resistance. No, apart from the occasional isolated incident like the disturbance in Old Orchard Green yesterday, no one dared test the authority of the Brotherhood. That encounter had been the talk of the dinner hall the night before. A big one-handed man had bested four of the brothers and vanished into thin air. So the story went, anyway. Taylor suspected the four had probably gotten sloppy and told a tall tale to cover their asses. If so, it didn't work. Each of the four were replaced, punished with ten lashes of the whip before being sent back to Portland for readjustment. Still, incidents like that showed that it paid not to be complacent, especially when taking new recruits from their loved ones. Luckily, senior brother Jared was the least complacent of any brother that Taylor knew. After evening prayers, they laid down on their sleeping rolls, the two novices nursing sore heads. Taylor took the first watch. Brother Taylor had no inkling that the newly infamous one-handed man passed them by near the end of his watch. None of them did. Luke was careful and moved quickly and silently. He stopped two hours later, sleeping outdoors for the first time in months, again thankful he hadn't dumped the overcoat. He awoke with the dawn and ate two less-than-perfect peaches that he'd found growing beside the road the previous evening. Judging by the height of the sun, he passed Williton Green at about one o'clock. He stopped under the sign on the 202 and had a sip of water. He could see the town in the distance and wondered if someone was watching the road from the lookout. He waved just in case, then put his water away and walked on. 23. An hour and a half later, Samuel sounded the signal as soon as he saw the group on the far hill. As it was, he'd missed Luke's passing. He'd been busy taking a whiz off the back of the platform. He counted the brothers and estimated how long it would take them to reach the gate before scampering down from the lookout and running towards the center of town. Word was passed quickly. Diana ran out of her house and met Samuel as he came running full tilt. The Brotherhood are here, he called. Diana's stomach churned. Sadness, fear, and resignation battled for supremacy as Samuel piled into her and buried his face in her belly. The goods they had grown and gathered for their contributions sat in large piles in the roadway. I don't want Tommy to go, Ma, Samuel said, looking up at her. I know, Sammy. Neither do I. But he has to. I've told you why. Tommy and Jacob came out of Diana's home a half a minute after she had emerged. They looked scared and nervous. She couldn't blame them one bit. Go and get Sarah, please, Sammy. Sarah was not as stoic as the boys when she followed Samuel out to the road. She was clearly upset, sobbing quietly as people reached out to touch her tenderly, whispering their goodbyes. Diana's heart melted. She couldn't imagine the journey the young girl was about to embark upon. Didn't want to imagine. The boys would have it bad enough, recruited into an evil creed where they would be indoctrinated and made to do bad things in the name of God. But the girls... No one knew what happened to the girls. She pulled the terrified teenager into her arms. Be strong, Sarah. Stand with me. They were all gathered within a few minutes and turned to watch the gate. They heard the clop-clop of the horse's hooves well before the first brothers came into view. Diana took a deep breath and walked to meet them. The man leading them was hard-faced and muscled beneath the black habit he wore, but not much older than her. She stopped and waited. His brown eyes locked onto hers as they approached, and she held his gaze bravely. When the distance between them was about ten feet, 
he held up his hand and the small procession stopped. Diana of Williton Green? he asked. Yes, senior brother. He smiled beatifically. Peace be upon you, he intoned. We, the Brotherhood, are here to collect your contribution. Is it ready, as agreed? Yes, senior brother. We are also to collect two new recruits and an eve. Are they ready? Yes, senior brother, she said, and gestured to the three recruits. Good. Stand aside as we bring the horses forward. He waved his staff. The two novices shuffled forward, pulling the horses after them. Diana moved to the edge of the road and stood next to Tommy, Jacob, and the weeping Sarah. Diana's hand slipped into her brother's, knowing that shortly he would be whisked away, perhaps never to be seen again. All of the brothers except Jared chipped in to load the carts, and within ten minutes they were done, the salted meat the last to go on. We're all done, senior brother, said a tall and handsome brother. Thank you, Brother Taylor. You may do your checks. Yes, senior brother. Taylor gestured for the other brothers to follow him, and they went through the houses, one by one. Brother Jared ignored them and petted the two horses as if he didn't have a care in the world. Diana had the feeling he was, in fact, taking in a whole lot more than he let on. Diana turned to look at Tommy. He was pale and sweating profusely. She squeezed his hand supportively. The poor kid looked like he was going to faint from nerves. His friend Jacob appeared to be faring better. The brothers finished their search after about ten minutes and returned to where senior brother Jared waited. Yes, brother Taylor? All is well, senior brother. They've given us half their grain and vegetables and more than half their salted meat. Excellent. Diana, the Lord smiles upon you. Brother Gerard, Brother Mark, gather the new recruits. Diana stepped aside as the two brothers approached. The older one, Gerard, smiled reassuringly. His arms were open in welcome as he walked over to the three recruits. May peace be... Gerard was still smiling when the bullet struck him in the forehead and blew out the back of his head. Still smiling, even as he fell back onto the asphalt. Diana clapped her hands over her ringing ears as screams of shock erupted from her people. Time slowed. She turned in horror as the smoking glock in Tommy's hand turned towards Brother Mark, who, frozen in shock, was staring down at his dead comrade, trying to make sense of what had happened. No! Diana screamed. Tommy's second shot went wide, his aim thrown off by the wooden staff that whistled through the air and struck him on the wrist. Diana turned and saw the now weaponless senior brother hurtling towards her brother, snatching the staff of a shocked novice as he came. Tommy swore but didn't drop the gun. He raised the gun again and squeezed off a second shot. The dumbfounded brother Mark crumpled to the ground next to his dead friend, a red flower blooming on his chest. Acting instinctively, Diana stepped in front of the senior brother and crouched. It was a perfect block. The brother fell heavily over her, struggling to escape her desperate grapple. He did so in a few seconds, tipping her off him with superior strength and two well-placed punches to the ribs. He began to rise, only stopping when he felt the cold muzzle of the gun against his head. Tommy, don't! Why shouldn't I, huh? said Tommy, looking at Diana, tears streaming down his face. I won't let them fucking take me. No, you're right. We won't let them. You showed them good. Now stand back and let us up. For a second, she thought Tommy would still shoot the senior brother. But then he took two steps back, his gun still trained on Jared. The surviving brothers stood with staffs in hand. Except for Taylor, they looked confused and frightened. Senior brother Jared grimaced as if in pain. He rose slowly, using his staff as leverage, and slumped against the stout hickory before offering his hand to the woman. Diana ignored the proffered hand and stood up, brushing the dust off her arms. 
She looked at Tommy and her shoulders slumped. You idiot, she hissed. What were you thinking? The boy shrugged, not taking his eyes off the man next to her. Diana turned to senior brother Jared. I'm sorry. This wasn't meant to happen. I think you should go. He looked at her, his face pitying as he leaned drunkenly. I understand, he said. The flame of youth and all. You didn't plan this. I can see that. No, she said, relieved that he was being so reasonable. I forgot about the gun. I was... Jared struck before she finished her sentence. With a speed that defied the eye, he uncoiled and swung the staff, cracking it over Tommy's gun hand. The second blow caved in his skull before the gun had even hit the ground. Tommy's eyes were vacant, and the top of his head was now concave like a boiled egg hit with the flat of a teaspoon. His legs kept him upright for a few moments, then folded under him. He fell to the ground, unmoving. No one moved for a few seconds. Then the screaming started up again. Diana's mouth fell open and moaned in horror as she fell to her knees beside her dead brother, gathering him into her arms. No, no, no! Kill them all. Senior brother Jared snarled at what was left of his team, throwing the borrowed staff back to its owner. Leave none alive, not even a baby. He walked to the staff he had thrown and picked it up. As he started to turn, ready to smash the grieving woman's head in, something struck him hard in the shoulder. The pain was blinding and knocked him to his knees. A fist-sized rock clattered to rest a few feet away. It was followed immediately by an angry roar. God spare me. What now? Jared groaned and climbed back to his feet, his shoulders screaming hot agony. He turned in time to see a big, red-haired man bury an axe in the skull of one of the novices. In shock, the other novice, Damien and Brother Taylor, fell back and faced this new threat. The intruder, unable to pull his axe free, let the novice's body drop and raised his arms ready to fight, his glinting hook hand a dangerous question mark in the late afternoon light. Behind him, the crowd began to scream, not in fear, but rage. Kill the bastards, Luke! Kill them, Luke! Those screams, even more than their depleted numbers, a capable foe and a gun still in play, told Jared the situation was beyond him. With staffs as their only weapons, they never had the numbers if it came to a fight, but until then, they hadn't needed numbers. They had intimidation and fear on their side. Now the crowd's fear had turned to anger, and as much as he would like to test himself against the big man, he was not willing to be torn to pieces by a crowd of women and children afterwards. Right on cue, the one-handed man ducked under Damien's staff and with his wicked hook opened his throat like a sack of rice, neatly grabbing the hickory staff as the dying man fell. Jared stared furiously for a few seconds. It could only be the same man who caused the ruckus at Old Orchard Beach the day before. He committed the bastard's face to memory before turning and stepping past the oblivious woman, still cradling her dead brat of a brother. Diana had closed her eyes as Jared loomed over her. She held the limp body of Tommy and sobbed into his neck as she waited for her own life to end. It didn't. Why the hell didn't he just get it over with? Slowly she realized that the screams of her people had morphed from despair to something else entirely. She opened her eyes when she heard someone call Luke. Senior brother Jared was nowhere to be seen. The hard clacking of wood on wood turned her attention back to the road. Her people had gathered like kids in a schoolyard watching two of their peers duking it out. She eased herself out from under Tommy and took off her jacket. She brushed his staring eyes closed and gently laid the jacket over his head. Diana picked up the gun he had dropped and got to her feet, her mouth a hard line. She squeezed through her people until she stood at the rim of the roughly circular area they had cleared to watch the two men fight. Her people roared appreciation every time Luke struck a blow and groaned when he took one. The two men were evenly matched, 
Luke's size and brute strength matched by Brother Taylor's skill and ability to wield his staff two-handed. The furious swings and clashing of the staffs didn't look like it was ending any time soon. Having seen the damage the hook had done to his erstwhile traveling companion, the remaining brother danced and dodged to stay out of reach. Both men were breathing heavily with exertion, Luke sporting a purple welt on his cheek. With a long, one-handed swing, he hit Taylor with a heavy knock to the jaw. The brother stumbled back, dazed, glancing around and frantically looking for his leader as the crowd roared for blood. Someone started the chant, Kill, kill, kill. Soon the whole crowd took it up. Kill, kill, kill. Luke closed in. Bang! The crowd squealed and both men ducked, forgetting about each other for the moment. Diana strode into the space between them and faced Brother Taylor, pointing the glock at his forehead. Your leader pissed off and left you all alone. It's over, so just fucking drop it. The brother looked at her, mistrust evident on his face. If I wanted to shoot you, you'd already be face down on the road. Now drop it. Without taking his eyes off the woman, he let the staff clatter to the road. Luke relaxed and leaned on his staff. Diana had this well in hand. What are you going to do? I'll ask the questions. What's your name? Brother Taylor. Do you believe in God, Brother Taylor? Yes, ma'am, of course. Good. So do I. That's the other reason you're not dead. Now, take your sorry ass and get the hell out of our town. Taylor nodded, the relief on his face obvious. He pointed at the staff. May I take my... I said go! Yelled Diana, taking another step toward him. He put his hands up. Okay, okay. He turned in the direction of the gate and began walking. You fight well for a cripple, he said to Luke as he passed. Not sure if that was an insult or not, Luke took it that way. You fight well for a coward, he returned. Taylor, called Diana before he'd walked twenty feet. The brother paused and turned. Tell your people not to come back to Williton Green, or there will be more than four lying on the ground next time. He shook his head, a look of pity on his face. You signed your death warrant today, but I'll be sure to pass on your message. Without another word, he turned and went on his way. They watched him head towards the gate. Jacob, she said over her shoulder. The kid came forward, clearly in shock at the death of his best friend. She handed him the pistol. Follow him and make sure he leaves. She turned then and walked over to Luke. You came back, Diana said, expressionlessly. Luke looked past her at the crumpled body of Tommy, then back to her. Her eyes filled with tears. He came closer and put a hand on her arm. I wasn't going to. I actually passed by a few hours ago, but it got the better of me. I doubled back. I thought it wouldn't hurt if I just watched from the trees until they left. That's when I heard the gunshot. She nodded. Tommy, stupid idiot. Her voice hitched. Nearly got all of us killed. She pointed vaguely in the direction of the gate. He's right. They'll be back to massacre us. They would have done it today if you hadn't showed. She turned and walked back to her brother's body. Luke followed her. It's not going to happen, he said. We'll talk about it after we bury the dead. She spat on the ground. Tommy only. No way am I burying these scumbags. Jacob, Kathy, gather up some people and drag these sons of bitches outside the gate. Drop them in the grass. Let them rot where they lay so the others can see them when they come back. Where do you want me to put Tommy? Luke asked, moving in beside her. Mama! Diana wiped tears from her eyes as her son Samuel ran up to her, crying. Kathy had been doing her best to hold him back with the other younger kids. The church, 
We'll bury him tomorrow, next to Steve. She fell to her knees as Samuel rushed into her arms, both of them crying over the loss of Tommy. 24. Brother Taylor was confused, hurt, and betrayed. The man he had looked up to for years had left him to die, and Taylor didn't know how to deal with it. He would never have left Jared like that. He would have fought to the last breath for him. Taylor didn't look back at Willett and Green after he had passed through the gate. No, best to look forward. He wanted to talk to Jared, to give him a chance to explain what appeared to be an act of pure cowardice. First, though, he had to get home safely, then worry about the rest later. He was unarmed, alone, and bruised, but very determined. He paused after ten minutes of walking and went into the trees by the side of the road. It only took a minute to find what he was looking for. He stripped the sturdy fallen branch of twigs and swung it through the air experimentally. Satisfied and not feeling quite so vulnerable, he set out again. The rudimentary staff wouldn't do in a fight, but it might just help him fend off a wild animal if he had to. Luke helped as best he could that evening. It was a rough night, very emotional, and he found it hard to sleep when he finally put his head down. When he woke the following day, he didn't feel refreshed at all, but got stuck in to work with the rest of them. By his estimation, they only had two days, three at the most, before the Brotherhood returned with a bigger, better equipped force. They buried Tommy in the morning and had a small ceremony, which was basically Diana saying the Lord's Prayer over his freshly dug grave. It was raw and painful, and Luke, who had thought himself all cried out over Brooke and the baby, found himself weeping along with the rest of them. They had a feast in honor of Tommy afterwards. It eased things a little, with people telling anecdotes about him and having some laughs. Kathy produced half a bottle of whiskey from nowhere, and the adults shared it. Hoping Diana's pain was now dulled a little, Luke finally worked up the courage to go and speak to her about their plans. Apparently it wasn't a conversation she was ready to have, and she bustled away when he approached. I think we'll unload the carts tomorrow, she said. I need to lay down. Luke watched her head inside. He understood her wanting to be alone. Grief did that to you but he also had the feeling she was trying to avoid talking about their next steps. Luke took a walk. They had unhitched the horses the night before and led them out to graze in a part of the subdivision where more lots had been pegged out, back before the end of the world, before the happiest little community in Maine could be finished. He spent a bit of time patting and talking to them, enjoying some alone time himself. Taylor whistled an old song as he walked, He'd forgotten its title, but knew an English guy called Ed Sheeran had sung it. He'd really liked that guy's songs and wondered briefly what happened to him when the Pyongyang flu had swept across America. Maybe he'd been back in England when it all went down. And who knew what happened over there? Maybe he was alive and still making music somewhere. The thought that the rest of the world had carried on while they suffered wasn't comforting at all. It was depressing. He didn't believe it, though. If the rest of the world had been unchanged, surely somebody would have come to their aid by now. At least to the East Coast, they would... Brother Taylor. Taylor froze. He didn't see Senior Brother Jared until he moved, a darker shadow among the shadows in the trees to his right. The older man approached, a smile on his face, his arms open. I'm so glad you're alive. When he left Willett and Green, Taylor had been keen to talk to his mentor, to ask him why. When he saw him, though, anger flooded over him. He had been left to die. There was no explanation Jared could give that would satisfy. He stiffened as the senior brother's arms encircled him. No thanks to you. The other man released him immediately, the flash of anger in his eyes unmistakable. What did you say, Brother Taylor? Normally the tone and dangerous look in Jared's eyes would have intimidated him, 
that on this occasion Taylor would not be cowed. The feelings of betrayal and anger were too much. You left me to die, you fucker. You, you coward. You should watch your tongue, Brother Taylor. I am your senior. I will forgive you this time. Taylor guffawed. You'll forgive me. He pushed past Jared and called over his shoulder as he started walking away. Don't think the council won't hear about this, coward. Unseen by Brother Taylor, the spark of anger in Jared's eyes ignited into an inferno. He reached into the deep pocket of his robe. Cold steel glinted in his hand as he silently padded after Brother Taylor. 25. I think we should abandon Willet and Green, Luke said to Diana as they ate vegetable stew by the heat of the fire that night. Jacob and a younger boy called Danny ceased the conversation they were having to listen. No. It was said with a finality that didn't brook arguing. He plowed on anyway. Diana, they'll be back. You know they will. And this time they won't just be carrying staffs. I know, she said, picking up a stick and throwing it on the fire. You were right with what you said before, though. We should have fought them long ago. What kind of life have we got if we don't? We're as good as slaves in our own homes. Live free or die, huh? Yep. This time we're going to fight. I'm sick of cowering every time those bastards roll up and take half of what we grew with our own hands. I understand, but there aren't that many of you, and you only have a handful of weapons. I know a place we can all go. I guarantee they'll take all of you in. You want us to live with your people? He nodded. If it's so good there, why aren't you with them instead of here? He didn't speak for a moment. It's complicated, he said, finally. She regarded him silently, and then her face softened. Well, you left for a reason. What makes you think they'd take us in or that they'd even be there when we got there? Maybe the Brotherhood has found them, too. Nah, he said, kicking a hot coal that fell out of the fire. They haven't spread that far, and trust me, if they had, it wouldn't have ended well for them. Doesn't matter. Not leaving. Diana, he said. I really don't think it's a good idea, and with every hour we waste, our chances of getting away clean get less. Not we. Us. This is not your fight. You're right, he said, unable to help feeling a little hurt at her words. Although I think I made it mine when I killed two of their guys today. You need to see reason. I will be going, but you should all come with me. You'll be welcomed. They're good people. You're right, she snapped. You should go, first thing. We're staying right here, though, and we're fighting. Yeah, yelled Jacob. Let's mess them up the way they messed up Tommy. And you'll all die, Luke wanted to scream. He didn't. He didn't allow his frustration to poison the debate. He decided not to argue. Maybe she would see sense in the morning. He stood up and tipped the remains of his soup into the fire. Thanks for the eats. I'm going to bed. 26. The sound of a child laughing woke Luke the next morning. He sat up on the sofa in Diana's living room and rubbed his face. It was coming from the backyard. He got up and walked through to the kitchen and looked through the window. In the early sunlight, Diana was pushing Sam on a rickety old swing set. She looked lost in thought. The kid was oblivious and having a great time. Harder, Mom! Higher! Luke marveled at the resilience of children. Here was a kid, forced to be older than his years, who had literally seen the worst the world could throw at him in the last 24 hours, and he was still smiling at something as simple as being pushed on a swing. Hey, Luke, he called. Luke waved and returned the small smile Diana gave him, then went outside to join them. Morning, he said. 
Diana's eyes were puffy, her complexion pale. Clearly, she hadn't had the best night's sleep. He's having fun, said Luke, standing next to her and looking back at the house. Yeah. Pity he'll be dead in a couple of days. His terrible words hung in the air for a few seconds. Luke almost as shocked he'd spoken them aloud as Diana was to hear them. What? asked Sammy over the creak, creak, creak of the swing. Diana rounded on him, tears welling in her eyes, and slapped him hard across the face. How fucking dare you! Each word was punctuated by another slap. Luke winced with every blow, but didn't try to stop her. He deserved it. It had been a bastard of a thing to say. He hadn't thought the words through before he uttered them. They just seemed to come from nowhere. Now that they were out, though, if horrible words made her see sense, maybe it was worth the pain. Now it was her words that hung in the air as she glared at him furiously. Mom? That one word broke her. She ran inside sobbing as they both stared after her. Why didn't Mom hit you? Sam asked as Luke pushed him gently in the back to get him started again. I said something that upset her, buddy. Don't worry. It'll be okay. His words belied the sick feeling in his gut. He felt like he had just ruined any chance he had of talking Diana out of her suicidal decision to stay and fight. Brother Taylor didn't know he was in trouble until the violent blow to his neck. It was heavy and sent a searing pain that speared down his spine and into his head. He lost consciousness even as he felt himself begin to fall. He opened his eyes some time later and found himself struggling to breathe. He closed his eyes. Something was wrong. Badly wrong. Jared. He tried to speak but couldn't draw enough breath to say even that one word. He closed his eyes. What the hell did he hit me with? Taylor was face down in the dirt his cheek resting painfully against a half-buried stone. He didn't try to move, just took stock for now. The pain in the back of his neck pulsed with each beat of his heart. It was sharp and searing at the same time, like someone was sawing through his neck with a hacksaw. His lungs burned through lack of oxygen. Sorry, Brother Taylor. You weren't supposed to wake from that. Jared's voice was close, and Taylor started to panic. He tried to move his head, only to be rewarded with another jagged shock of agony from his neck and head. You shouldn't try to move, Taylor. Jared's sandaled feet came into his view. You can't, even if you want to. Your spinal cord is severed between the C3 and C4 vertebrae. The senior brother knelt beside him, bending over to look him in the eye. My father was a surgeon. Did I ever tell you that? Taylor tried to move again. Nothing, except the losing struggle to breathe. With each shallow, labored breath, small clouds of dirt puffed from the ground in front of his mouth. Jared winced and sat back on his heels. I can see that hurts he said in a regretful voice. I wish you hadn't been so judgmental, Brother Taylor. You really fucked up. Taylor, even in his shocked state, was surprised at the obscenity from the most pious of the brothers he knew. We could have been headed back by now. But no, you had to be all upset. Nevertheless, I know it's not all you're doing. Those fuckers back at Willet and Green will pay, I promise you. I have something very special planned for them. Now, though, it's time to say goodbye. He placed a cool, calloused hand on his former mentee's forehead. I will pray for you. Fuck you. Taylor tried to scream, but all that came out was a weak exhalation. Jared began to pray. Exhausted, his lungs burning, Taylor wondered how he could never have suspected Jared was a psychopath. It was so clear now. 
In your hands, O Lord, I humbly entrust our brother Taylor. In this life you embraced him with your tender love. Deliver him now from every evil and bid him eternal rest. Taylor spied the knife in Jared's clasped, blood-stained hands. The murder weapon. His murderer's weapon. The old order has passed away. Welcome Taylor into paradise, where there will be no sorrow, no weeping or pain. Rot in hell, you bastard. The murderous hands parted, and his tormentor bent over him. A fat tear formed in Taylor's eye as the blade pricked him sharply in the neck. Blood spurted from his neck in great pumping spurts of crimson. Rot in hell. But fullness of peace and joy with your son and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Rot in Taylor's vision faded to black. Amen. Senior Brother Jared, son of a surgeon in his previous life, stood up and looked down at the dead body of Brother Taylor. He could have been looking at a dead animal by the side of the road for all the emotion he showed. Then his face twisted and he lashed out with his foot, kicking the body of Brother Taylor repeatedly in a vicious frenzy. Look what you made me do! He grated when he was done. He stood until his breathing was back under control, then slipped his knife away. He straightened his habit and picked up his staff before looking down at the still warm corpse. No Christian burial for you, he sniffed, and then walked back onto the road to continue his journey home. 27. An hour after Luke had gone outside and spoken his harsh words, the whole town gathered around the fire to hear Diana speak about what would happen next. There was no sign of the tears she had shed earlier. In fact, she looked resolute. Resolute, but tired. Had his harsh words changed her mind? He doubted it. When everyone who was coming was present, Diana nodded to Jacob. His harsh whistle silenced the group, and Diana stepped up onto a sturdy wooden chair. You know why we're here. Yesterday, the Brotherhood killed Tommy and would have killed the rest of us if Luke hadn't arrived. Whistles, pats on the back. Wasted. The lives saved yesterday would mean nothing if they stayed. They'll be back, though. So we have to get ready to fight for our lives. Disappointment and dread washed over Luke as he shook his head. His last hope dashed. He stared at the ground in defeat as some in the crowd whooped and hollered. Or we run for our lives and fight another day. The crowd, not expecting this option, began to buzz and Luke looked up in surprise. Diana was looking at him. Then she nodded, her face expressionless. Luke has something to say. He hadn't expected this at all. But after he recovered from the initial surprise, he stood up ready to make the most of the opportunity. Hey, everyone. I want to start by saying I understand why some of you want to stay and fight. The Brotherhood has been bad for you. No, not bad. Terrible. They've taken your people and, worse, killed those who fought them, like Tommy and Steve before him. Diana lowered her head and hugged her son Samuel tighter. I know that I asked why you didn't fight them long ago. That was before I knew what they were capable of and how many of them there are. Now I like a fight as much as anyone, especially against bullies. But one thing I've learned is you have to pick your fights. And the fact is you don't have the numbers or the weapons to fight the Brotherhood. If you stay, you'll all die. Luke knew from the looks that they were giving each other that his words were having an impact. Would it be enough? He stepped forward to where a mother stood with her daughter of about eight. He pointed at the daughter's forehead. You'll die. 
the girl began to cry, and he pointed at the mother. You'll die. Don't say that, yelled the little girl. He pointed at Kathy. You'll die. Then he pointed at Jacob. You'll die. Diana stepped forward and pushed his hand down. Enough. You've made your point, Luke. Luke, feeling like a low-down dog for the second time that morning, stood his ground. Okay, he said, holding up his hands. I want you to know, it doesn't have to be that way. My people are in Manchester. It's only a few days' walk and they'll take you in, all of you. You'll have a much bigger and safer community to settle into, and I guarantee the Brotherhood will never bother you again. I'm leaving this morning, and I'd like you all to come with me. That's all, I guess. Thanks for listening. Luke stepped back as Diana turned to them. Well, you heard it. I'm not going to make the decision for you. We'll have a vote. Kids included. The kids are voting? Asked Kathy. Yes, it's their lives too. All those who think we should abandon Williton Green and go with Luke to live with his people, raise your hands. For a horrible moment, Luke didn't think anyone was going to raise their hands. He saw Jacob resolutely fold his arms across his chest along with most of the other boys. The others looked as if they were waiting for someone else to go first. Finally, Kathy stepped forward. I, for one, don't want to die or see any of you die. She waved her hand at the buildings around them. This place isn't what makes us who we are. It's just a bunch of buildings. And if we leave it behind, we're still us. We are Willet and Green. I vote for going with Luke. There was another pause. Then the mother whose child he had pointed at raised her arm. The little girl followed suit. Suddenly, it was as if the floodgates had opened and hands started to go up everywhere. It was a near thing, but in the end, it looked like he would lose by just a couple of votes. Then a most surprising thing happened. To the gasps of surprise, Diana raised her hand, and so did Samuel. Others followed suit, a clear majority. Diana avoided his gaze, but finished the vote for fairness sake. All those for staying and fighting, raise your hands. By Luke's estimation, only a third voted to stay in the end. Jacob looked betrayed. Why did you change your vote, Diana? He asked. Because Luke's right. They'll kill us all. Yesterday I was angry, beyond angry. I wanted to fight so bad. But it's not about me. It's about all of us. The vote is done. We're going, and we're going to do it quick. Now gather close, and I'll tell you how it's going to work. Part 4 Exodus 28. As it turned out, they weren't ready to leave until well past midday. There had been some toing and froing over whether they should take the carts. In the end, Diana had overruled them. The carts are already loaded, and with the horses pulling them, we'll be able to move just as quick with or without them. So I say we take them. At least then we're not going to your people empty-handed. That's final. Okay, okay, honestly, they wouldn't mind, but you're the boss. He had a thought. Hey, maybe we can sit the smaller kids on them? It might even mean we go faster. There you go, said Diana, smiling and shaking her head at the time they had wasted arguing over it. Now, if you just listened in the first place... He laughed. There was a buzz of excitement in the town, and it had infected them both. He didn't want to think about his homecoming, not yet. There were a lot of miles to tread, not to mention the Brotherhood probably being hot on their tails. How long before they came back? Given that the two brothers were on foot and they would need time to gather a force and travel back, he was pretty sure they would arrive sometime tomorrow afternoon. It could be quicker, though, 
and he wanted to put as many miles between them and Williton Green as possible before nightfall. By the time the horses were hooked up to the carts, nearly everybody had gathered and lined up on the road by the fire. They had been told to bring only what they could carry comfortably, and for the most part had done that. Do you think they'll come after us when they see we've gone? He asked Diana, as she headed to her house to grab her own backpack. Yes, she said, without a shred of hesitation. There will be a lot of them, and they'll have that damned truck of theirs, and guns. I thought they'd sworn off guns, but I remember you saying they used them when they killed Stephen. Well, they seem to pick and choose when that rule applies. Usually they use them when they've been defied. They'll bring them this time. You can take that to the bank. More concerning to Luke than the guns at this point was the fact they would have the truck. Even with 24 hours start, the Brotherhood would catch them before they got anywhere near safety. You look worried, said Diana, as they stepped inside her house for the last time. I am. Listen, I know there is no vehicle, but is there a bicycle in town, one that works? Sure, a couple. Tommy has... She paused and took a deep breath. Had one. It's out back. Why? Insurance, he said. I'll explain as we're leaving. Diana watched him head purposefully for the back door and shrugged. Samuel, it's time to go, she called. When she headed back outside with Samuel in tow and a small backpack over her shoulder, Diana found Luke at the front of the column talking to Jacob and pointing to a dog-eared map. The teenager was sitting on Tommy's BMX bike with his bow slung over his shoulder. What's going on? she asked. I'm going to ride on ahead and get help in case we need it, said Jacob, clearly proud of the responsibility Luke had bestowed upon him. No, it's too dangerous. What? Please, Diana, Luke said... Before she could answer, Luke took her by the elbow and led her away from the group. Sorry I didn't clear it with you before, but we need this. At best, we're going to have 24 hours start on the Brotherhood. With their truck, they'll catch us before we get anywhere near Manchester. I want to send Jacob on ahead so he can get us back up. Isaac will come. I know he will. Diana looked unsure. Look, said Luke, it's a long shot, but we have to try it. Otherwise, we may as well just stay here. Fine, she said, still not happy but understanding the need. She went over to Jacob. Have you got water? Yes, ma'am, he said, and patted the Hessian bag on his handlebar. And bread. I'll be fine. Can I go? Diana put her arm around him and kissed his cheek. The kid blushed. Go on. Ride as fast as you can, but be careful and rest when you need to, okay? It's your thing, Di, he said, looking the happiest she'd seen him since Tommy had died. Okay, kid, go. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and don't lose the map. Jacob gave a wave and took off like a rocket. A road bike would have been better, said Luke as they watched him ride off. But it'll do the trick. Diana looked worried as he disappeared through the gate at the end of the road. Luke put his arm around her shoulders. Does he know where to go? Yep, I showed him the exact roads we'll be taking. He'll be fine. He wished he was as certain of that as he tried to sound. Ten minutes after Jacob had cycled away, Diana did a rough head count as Luke lifted the three kids under the age of five onto the laden carts. They squealed in delight as their mothers clucked and worried beside the carts. Okay, that's everyone, said Kathy, coming up beside her. Diana turned to the column of thirty-four souls that were her people. Let's roll, she called and grabbed the reins of the horse she would be leading and gave it a gentle tug. Samuel sat on a bareback, carrying the shotgun. The Glock was in Diana's belt, and she had spare shells for the shotgun in her jacket pockets. Two guns. One handgun and one shotgun. He wondered how many they would face if, when, the Brotherhood caught them. Luke grabbed the other horse's rope and clicked his tongue. The people of Williton Green set off for their new life with the sun high overhead. 29. The two guards on duty on the steps of the Brotherhood's headquarters gripped their staffs and came forward as a limping figure approached along what used to be known as Congress Street. In its previous life, the impressive building had been City Hall. 
Now it was the center of the Brotherhood's world. Senior Brother Jared! There could be no doubt it was the senior brother. His hawkish features were unmistakable, even with his face covered in blood. Jared held out a weak hand, then promptly fell to the ground. The guards rushed forward to help the injured man to his feet. Bless you, brothers, he said weakly, as they each put a shoulder under his arms and walked him up the steps and into the main hall. Jared let his head slump, pleased his ruse had worked. A self-inflicted cut on the scalp and some method acting was all it took, and Jared, the wounded warrior monk, had returned. The two guards called for help, and soon there was a gaggle of clucking brothers around him. Let him breathe, called a senior brother, pushing through and followed by a fresh-faced novice. The others scattered, lest they be knocked aside by the sheer girth of senior brother Rex. He knelt next to Jared with an agility that belied his size and lifted Jared's chin with his rough fingers. Jared, what happened? Jared kept up his act. He knew it needed to be good to fool Rex. Undisciplined with his eating, he might be, but the big man was dangerously smart. Breathlessly, Jared told of the unprovoked attack by the people of Williton Green and the red-haired outlaw. All dead? Jared nodded, allowing tears to spring to his eyes. I barely escaped with my life, but not before staving a head or two. Brother Taylor fought bravely to the end, imploring me to save myself and bring God's justice down upon the people of that town. It was his stand that allowed me to escape. He made the sign of the cross on his chest, and the men around him did the same. This was the same red-headed heathen that caused so much trouble in Old Orchard Beach? Asked Senior Brother Rex. The very same, said Jared, holding up his hand with his index finger curled. Hook hand and all. Rex nodded. Take Brother Jared to his quarters. Wash and tend to his wounds. I must speak to the council. Ring the bell, Dennis. The wide-eyed young novice who had followed Brother Rex into the hall ran off and tugged a rope by the door. The bell pealed three times. Then the novice turned around and hurried after his master. Jared sat on the hard bench with the other senior brothers. He'd let Rex take the lead on telling his story, preferring to sit quietly, ever the stoic. He couldn't have pulled off the story as theatrically as the bigger man anyway. The faces of the three bishops on the council were equal parts rapt and outraged as senior brother Rex told them of the disastrous mission to Williton Green as passed on to him by Jared. I'm sure you'll agree this outrage must be met on the strongest terms, my good sirs, he ended. The three bishops, all dressed in white habits to set them apart from their brethren, put their heads together and conferred. Jared watched them, thoughtful. These three men governed the church as a triumvirate. Their terms were three years, with one bishop retiring and replaced each year, so there were always two experienced men on the council. Cranston's tenure would expire on Christmas Day later that very year. The council members were elected from their own number by the twenty senior brothers, and Jared planned to put his own name forward in the next ballot. Bishop Jared had a nice ring to it, and he planned to make the most of the opportunity if it came to him. Unfortunately, his chief rival would be the popular senior brother Rex. After less than a minute, the middle bishop, Cranston, stood up. Being the longest-serving member, Cranston was the spokesperson for the three. Jared hadn't voted for him three years before when he was new to the black robe himself, but the man seemed competent enough. Senior Brother Rex, we on the council agree. Swift justice will be meted out to these murderous ingrates. You will lead the attack party. Jared's jaw tightened. He had been expecting to lead the attack party. A successful mission would only be another feather in Rex's cap. He nearly interrupted but decided it was smarter to let Cranston finish. Take the truck and twenty of our best men first thing in the morning. 
leave none alive but the red-headed barbarian. He is to be brought back here and crucified in the town square of Old Orchard Beach. A lesson to those who helped him escape. There were small gasps from the men around him. A crucifixion? There hadn't been one in years. Jared had planned to deal with Captain Hook himself, but it would be just as satisfying watching the bastard nailed to a cross. Besides, he had other fish to fry, fish much bigger and closer to home. Yes, Bishop Cranston, said Rex smoothly. It shall be done. Guns? The bishop pursed his lips. Of course, he said, and quickly conferred with the other bishops. You may take four automatics. The other bishops stood, indicating the meeting was at an end, and the senior brothers around Jared also began to stand. Pardon, if I may, he called, pushing up next to Rex. The bishops paused and looked around. Yes, senior brother, asked Cranston. I'd like to go along, if you will it. I have some unfinished business with these people. Cranston's eyes locked onto his, then glanced at the bandage on his head. Are you not feeling the ill effects of your last encounter? It is but a scalp wound, sir. I will be fine after a night's rest. Senior Brother Rex? I have no objection, sir. Very well, then. But Rex is in command, do you understand? Yes, sir said Jared, seething that Cranston had spoken to him in such a way in front of the other senior brothers. We'll see about that. 30. Luke had advised Jacob to ride until just before sunset and then find a house to sleep in. He didn't say anything to Luke, but the thought of sleeping in an old abandoned house freaked him out. Besides, it was a reasonably balmy night, so he decided to stop and bed down in the trees beside a heavily wooded part of the 202 instead. His thighs felt heavy as he climbed off the bike and wheeled it into the trees. He pulled out his map and had some bread and the last of his water as he examined it. Just over the next drives, he would cross the border into New Hampshire and then hit the outer suburbs of East Rochester not long after. He would leave at first light and skirt the city as per Luke's instructions, then turn on to the 125. Just past the town called Epping, he would take a turn onto the 101, which would lead him all the way into Manchester. He estimated it would take him about two hours to ride from Rochester to Epping, then another hour and a bit to get to the outskirts of Manchester. That would put him there before midday. He folded the map and put it away as dusk fell. He was asleep within minutes. The rest of the group only made it half the distance Jacob did before Luke and Diana called them to a halt. There were whispers and sighs of relief right along the column. They veered off the 202 a little way and found a large two-story house to spend the night in. Luke had his doubts they would all fit comfortably, but most were so exhausted it wouldn't matter as long as they had enough floor space to lay down. Over a fire pit in the backyard, Diana and Kathy cooked a big pot of oats with blueberries that the kids had picked along the way mixed in. It was served with day-old bread, not exactly restaurant fare, but no one left a crumb on their plates. Diana called curfew about an hour after sunset. No one grumbled. Not even the older kids. Most bedded down for the night in the big living room and front hallway. Do you want the last bed, Luke? Diana asked. Three of the four beds in the house had been loaded with the smallest children and their mothers, and there was one left, a single in the only downstairs bedroom. No, you and Sam will take it, he said. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. I'll sleep by the front door. A few minutes later, after checking the locks on all the doors, Luke went to the front door and lowered himself onto the floor. He took off his leather jacket and used it as a pillow. He was willing to sacrifice warmth for a tiny bit of comfort. 
They ate the last of the bread, cooked oats, and some more berries for breakfast. Luke was anxious to get back on the road and hurried everybody out of the house while some were still eating. He knew every minute counted now. The chances were high that the Brotherhood would catch them. The only question was, would it be before or after Isaac and the rest found them? He didn't allow himself to consider that Jacob might fail in his mission. That didn't bear thinking about. They rejoined the Carl Brog Highway, the 202, and began the next leg of their journey. The 202 would take them to Rochester, New Hampshire, well before midday if they made good time. Luke's anxious mood matched the day. A floating blanket of mist covered the tops of the fall-colored trees that lined the highway, lending the morning a foreboding feel. Let's pick it up, he called, and tugged the reins of the horse he was leading a little harder. 31. It's just over that hill, said Senior Brother Jared, leaning forward. He sat next to the passenger side window in the cab of the Mack truck. Next to him was Senior Brother Rex, and in the driver's seat, a younger member of their order, Brother Michael. Very good. Hit the music, Brother Michael. Let them know we're coming for them. Yes, sir, said Michael, a solid young man of 22. He reached up and flicked a small switch on the ceiling of the cab. The first bars of Flight of the Valkyrie always made the hairs on Jared's neck stand up. This occasion was no different. The music blared from the purpose-built bullhorn speakers welded to the top of the prime mover. There, Jared called as the sign to Willett and Green came into view. Michael slowed, then turned the semi-trailer onto the small road. Now, on the straight, he pressed the gas hard and the Mac picked up speed. They barreled down the hill and through the small copse of trees that grew thick on either side of the road and burst out on the other side in a whirlwind of leaves. The rig was quite a sight. The cab was all white, with gold crosses embossed on the doors and a golden crucifix twelve inches high on the hood where the famous Mac bulldog should have been. The curtain sides of the trailer were also white, with Christ's chariot painted in big red letters down the side. Jared's fingers gripped the dashboard as the walls of the town came into view. Time to make these bastards pay. Stop the truck, ordered Rex over the loud Wagner composition. Brother Michael, who was already slowing the vehicle, brought it to a complete stop fifty feet from the open gates and switched the engine off. There was no movement beyond the gates, but for now their attention was taken by the four bodies strewn on either side of the opening anyway. Rex's mouth tightened as he silently weighed up what he was seeing. We'll get out here. We need to be careful of a trap, said Jared. If you'd taken more care on your earlier visit, perhaps we wouldn't need to, said Rex. This time it was Jared's mouth that tightened. He swallowed his anger and climbed out of the cab. Rex followed him and when he was on the ground turned back to Brother Michael. Stay behind the wheel and turn that infernal music off. They're clearly not here. The music ceased and Rex stalked to the back of the truck. Jared followed. We can't be sure, he said. No, we can't interrupted Rex as he turned the lever of the roller door and pulled it up with a clatter. The twenty men sitting on the long benches inside blinked in the sudden light. So we'll send in the gunman to confirm, while the rest of us start digging graves. The brothers piled out and Rex instructed the four armed with assault rifles to carefully scour the town. Almost certainly the people of Willett and Green had fled. It was the only sensible thing to do. Best to be sure, though. An hour later, four freshly dug graves were filled in, each plot of turned soil marked with a plain white cross of wood. Would you like to do the honors? Rex asked Jared, his tone hard to read. Jared nodded and stepped forward. He said a short prayer over each of the four graves as the brothers echoed him. He turned to Rex when he was done. The other man nodded, his face expressionless. Let's have a quick look at this town before we track these heathens. 
The town was empty, the horses and carts brought by Jared and his men gone. Their tracker, Brother Simon, dug around the ashes with his right hand, then stood up. Cold. I'd say they have close to 24 hours start on us. He walked along the dust-covered roadway to the gates and spent five minutes examining the footprints and marks. At least thirty, along with two horses, and these marks here are the tire marks of the trailers. Brother Simon followed the trail out through the gates, and Jared turned to tail him, but was pulled to a stop when Rex grabbed his wrist in a claw-like grip. A word, Brother Jared? Jared secretly seethed at Rex's dropping of senior, but looked at him coolly. Yes. I wonder why there were only four bodies. Jared stomached at a somersault. I was wondering that myself, he said with a confused look. Where on earth could Brother Taylor's body be? I don't know, senior brother, he said, holding Rex's hawk-like gaze. All I know is I saw the big man open his throat with that damned hook of his. From the amount of blood, there's no way he could have survived. Jared shook his head and looked heavenward, apparently overcome with emotion. One hand held his staff, while the other slipped unnoticed into his pocket and gripped his knife. Senior Brother Rex watched him for a few seconds more, his face inscrutable, then turned and began walking. Yes, it certainly is a mystery. Perhaps we'll solve it together, hey? Jared followed him, sorely tempted to show the fat bastard exactly what had happened to Brother Taylor. Brother Simon was walking up the hill and through the cops by the time they reached the truck. The men were already back in the trailer, and the two senior brothers climbed into the cab beside Brother Michael. Michael started the truck and turned it in a wide circle before following Brother Simon all the way back to the 202. Simon paused for a moment, looking at the ground and dust beside the road, before pointing west as they pulled up beside him. They've gone this way, he said. Brother Michael, I'll take over the driving. You take Brother Simon's place in the rear. I need him up here. Two minutes later, they were headed along the 202 at 20 miles an hour, Brother Simon running his finger along the map he'd brought along. Almost certainly they're headed to Rochester. I'll keep an eye out for signs of them along the way. Twenty minutes later, Brother Simon leaned forward abruptly. Pull over here, please, he said, pointing at a corner where a lane fed off the 202. The lane was lined with a few homes, each on about a half acre of land. He jumped out as soon as the truck had pulled over and began examining the dirt and gravel at the edges of the road. They were here, he called over his shoulder, before pointing at the ground on one side of the road. See, they turned this way and went down the lane. He ran to the other side. Then they came back the same way and turned west again. Why did they go down the lane? asked Jared from the cab. Simon didn't answer, just headed confidently down the shady lane towards the houses on the right. Let's follow him, said Rex, jumping out. Jared got out and walked with him. They followed Simon to the second house along. Simon did a cursory look around the house and then went into the backyard. Fire pit! He made a beeline to the pit where the oats had been cooked that morning and used his fingers to rummage in the ashes. Some warmth. They left this morning, sometime after dawn, I'd say. Excellent, said Rex. Let's get this finished. I'd like to sleep in my own bed tonight. Many miles away, Jacob was pedaling through a town called Epping on the Caliph Highway. It was a long, straight road, and he was going at a good clip. The sun had climbed high in the sky and had nearly burned off the remains of the morning mist, he thought it was somewhere around ten in the morning. he left the ghost town of Epping behind and within a few minutes reached the turn onto the 101. It was marked by an old McDonald's restaurant. Home stretch, baby, he said, taking a drink from the water bottle he'd refilled from a pond that morning. He took a few extra mouthfuls of the cloudy liquid as a reward. 
What was left would get him all the way through to Manchester. He got moving again. Jacob cruised on the 101. It was a great road, and he only had to veer around the occasional abandoned vehicle. He avoided looking into them. While he hadn't seen any dead people along the way, he knew it would creep him out if he did. The sixteen-year-old only had the vaguest memories of the before times. He still remembered his mom and dad, though. He thought about them now. He was so lost in thought he wasn't aware of the sound of a motor approaching behind him until it was too late. It wouldn't really have mattered if he had noticed. He was crossing a long overpass and there was nowhere to hide even if he'd had warning. He pulled to a stop and turned to face whoever was coming. Maybe this close to Manchester it was Isaac's people? He left his bow slung over his shoulder but stayed on his bike. He could see it now. It was a big green truck. There was no doubt they'd seen him. There was a driver and a passenger, their faces white blobs behind the dirty windshield. The truck slowed as it approached. Jacob crossed his arms in a show of confidence that belied his rampaging heartbeat. The truck pulled up fifteen feet away and just sat there with the motor running for a minute. He could see they were talking. Finally, the passenger side door swung open. A man stepped out. He smiled. He had bad teeth. He also had a gun in his hand. Son, what in hell are you doing out here all on your own? 32. They'd managed to make pretty good time, but Luke was becoming more anxious with each mile. They'd passed Rochester an hour and a half before, and it was already well past midday, as near as he could tell from the map, they were still only halfway to Epping where they would turn onto the 101. We should let them rest soon, said Diana. Samuel had been complaining of sore feet for the last ten minutes. Luke was about to say no when a half mile ahead he spotted a big tree down on the road, a really big tree. From a distance, the trunk looked at least five feet thick, and it was tall enough that it covered most of both lanes, leaving only a small gap between the bushy top and a large boulder on the verge of the road. How big was the truck the brothers brought when they smashed down your gates? Oh, it's big. A semi-trailer. Isn't that what they called them? Yep. So do you think they'd be able to get it through that gap? Maybe, but it would be a tight squeeze. Luke picked up his pace, a thin smile on his face. I think it would fit, too. Just... Maybe we can fix that and slow them down a little, though. How? Diana asked. I have an idea. We'll rest when we get past the tree. As the people of Willett and Green sat and rested on the south side of the tree, Luke found what he was looking for in an overgrown driveway a hundred yards or so further on. It was an old red two-door Toyota pickup, only its faded tailboard visible under the ivy that had grown over it in the years since it had last been used. I need help, Diana, he called. Bring helpers with you. He pulled Ivy away to clear a path down either side of the pickup. It was covered in bird shit and the detritus of the afterdays, but it was the most beautiful thing he'd seen that day. He tried the door. It was locked. He smashed the driver's window with his elbow and reached in. The door fought him with rusty might, but finally gave way with a screech. Diana arrived with four helpers. It was Kathy and three of the other mothers. Your chariot awaits, madam, he said to Diana and gestured at the driver's seat with a flourish. Idiot, she laughed, coming down the side. Her nose wrinkled when she peered inside. What's the plan? We're going to push this old beast back to the tree and block that gap, he said. You sit behind the wheel and steer and the rest of us will push. Luke went to the front and waved for them to join him. You sure we can do this? Kathy asked, putting her hands on the hood next to his. Positive, he said, giving her a grin before giving Diana the thumbs up. Just pull the automatic down to neutral, then take off the handbrake. Thank you, Captain Obvious, she said. Surprisingly, the old beast moved easily, and of course, once they were out of the driveway, the flat road helped. About halfway, they stopped. I'll take over, he said. 
I want you to push me as hard as you can all the way to the tree. At the last second, I'll turn and go nose first into that rock. I'll yell out when to stop pushing. He unslung his axe and gestured for Samuel to come and get it. Are you sure? Diana asked. Sure, I'll be okay. It won't be fast enough to hurt. Hold that for me, Sammy. I'll need it in a second. Samuel carried the axe back over to the rest of the Williton Green people, who watched with interest. Luke waved, and the women heaved. The truck started slowly, and a few of the boys came to help. They soon built enough momentum, and it was going pretty fast by the time it got to the gap. Stop pushing, called Luke at the last possible moment, and swung the wheel as hard as he could. The Toyota crunched into the rock, its tail swinging fractionally so it was hard against the top branches of the tree. Luke got out and surveyed his handiwork. Not perfect, but it would do with a few finishing touches. Luke punctured both tires on his side with a knife before climbing over the top and doing the same on the passenger side. Pass me my axe, please, Sam. Luke opened the passenger door and pulled the handbrake on as hard as he could, then started hacking at it with the axe, not satisfied until it was completely smashed. The steering wheel followed. Do you think it will slow them down? Diana asked as they started walking again. Well, he said, we spent twenty minutes blocking it. If it takes them a half hour to clear it, I reckon that's worth it. In the end, Luke's makeshift roadblock held up Christ's chariot by forty minutes. Senior brother Rex took the opportunity to let the men in the trailer out for some fresh air. God knows he used to hate sitting in that sweat box. Brother Simon did his thing, climbing over the barrier and disappearing while Rex and Brother Michael looked at the unlikely but effective barrier. Jared, for his part, stayed out of the way. He couldn't help but feeling Rex suspected that he was to blame for Brother Taylor's demise and disappearance. If that was the case, when they returned to their headquarters, things could get very difficult for Jared. "'Could we not just crash through these branches?' asked Rex. A look of incredulity passed fleetingly across Brother Michael's face, replaced quickly by a thoughtful consideration. "'I don't believe so, Brother Rex. The top of the tree is quite woody and high. We would risk damaging the truck's wheels or axles, maybe even the drivetrain.' Rex sniffed. "'I suppose. What do you suggest, then?' Ob "'Um, well, we'll have to move this vehicle, sir,' said Michael, patting the hood of the Toyota. Rex's eyes narrowed. "'All right, get to it. We certainly have enough men. Push it out of the way.' "'It will need to be dragged out of the way, sir, with the truck.' Senior brother Rex looked heavenward. "'How long?' Not sure, sir. Half an hour, maybe? Well, get to it. Michael knew the best idea was to unhook the Mac from the trailer and use chains to drag the pickup out. He also knew Rex wouldn't allow him the extra time that would take. It was still a better idea to pull rather than try and bulldoze the pickup and risk damaging their transportation. He'd just have to do it while the trailer was still attached. It took a five-point turn to swing the big rig around, and even though Michael tried to avoid looking at senior brother Rex, he could almost feel the waves of irritation at the delay emanating from the big man. Finally, he backed it up to within a few feet of the Toyota, and with a whoosh of the air brigs jumped out and left the engine running. He helped a few of the men fix chains to the pickup, then to the footrail of the trailer. Back in the cab, Brother Michael put the truck into first, leaning out the window to look back as he slowly pressed the gas. There was a brief screech of metal on rock, then it was free. He dragged the wreck effortlessly along the blacktop and stopped thirty yards down the road. "'Well done, Brother Michael!' yelled Rex as the other brothers clapped and whistled. Happiness washed over the young man. Any praise from senior brother Rex was rare praise indeed." The other men unhooked the chains, and Michael started forward, wrestling the steering wheel of the big rig as he moved it back and forth until he finally had it facing the right direction. Michael hid his disappointment when Rex directed him back into the trailer with the others. He had hoped to drive again, but apparently Simon was still needed up front. 
Jared closed the roller door on those in back and headed back to the cab, where Rex was already seated firmly in the driver's seat, Brother Simon next to him, his fingers busy running over the map. Well? Rex asked impatiently. I am sure there are only two destinations they can have in mind. They won't just be running blindly, because they'd have to know we'd catch them eventually. I'd say they're most likely heading here. He pointed to the city of Concord. Or here. His finger landed on Manchester. Perhaps the hook-handed man hails from one of these cities? Senior brother Jared snorted. Or anywhere in between? Rex turned his steely gaze on Jared. Do you have a better suggestion, Jared? Jared bristled but held his tongue and shrugged. I think you're right, said Rex, turning the ignition. If they were just looking for somewhere to hide, Rochester would have been as good a place as any. The truck jerked forward. I want to catch them before they have a chance to reach wherever they're going. We don't have the manpower to search a city for them. Branches whipped and scraped along the cab as they squeezed through the gap. How far behind are we? I'd say they passed less than two hours ago, sir, said Brother Simon. Excellent. Rex planted his foot. 33. Luke and the Willetton Green people had passed Epping and were now approaching a tiny McDonald's store. The Big M didn't interest Luke, but the fact that it marked the turn onto the 101 did. They were about to begin the last leg of their journey. Luke, we have to stop. We can't, Luke said and barreled on single-mindedly. Luke, yelled Diana, and stopped in her tracks, pulling down hard on the rope to stop her horse. The tired animal whinnied in protest. The pissed-off mom tone in her voice brought him to heel, and he slowed the horse he was leading to a standstill and turned to her. She looked exhausted. So did everyone else, including the horses. His horse had foam on his flanks, and so did Diana's. Okay, you're right. Sorry, I just... I know. But there is only so long we can go at this pace. We need to let them rest. Luke didn't fight. He had been certain that they would be caught somewhere before Epping, so it was a bonus they had made it this far. As much as he had tried to cover their tracks by picking up the horse droppings as they went, if they had half a brain between them and a keen eye, the Brotherhood would be following their trail. He had no doubt they would be caught somewhere on the 101, and the only question was, had Jacob made it? Was he bringing help? If not, none of it mattered. They wouldn't make it to Manchester. Yes, let's rest. Hopefully we're close enough. They brought the rest of the marchers to a halt in front of the turn-in to the old McDonald's. Diana and Kathy organized the group and rationed out the last of the water and bread they'd brought along. Luke tried to play it cool. He made a half-hearted joke that he'd kill for a Big Mac, but he was anxious, and it showed. He busied himself tending to the horses and entertaining the kids in the carts. Finally, Diana called an end to the rest break. Okay, she called. We need to get moving again. We're nearly there. There were groans all around, but Luke was impressed how quickly the people of Willet and Green got themselves up and ready. Alas, it wasn't to be. Just as they were about to move off, Luke heard something. He strained to hear, but the noise of the people milling around him meant he couldn't quite catch it. Shh! Diana's head snapped around. She saw the concern in his eyes. Quiet! she screamed. Silence fell over them. Luke's eyes widened, and he looked back the way they'd come. It wasn't the distant rumbling of a truck. It wasn't the marching of feet. It was music, like a leaf wafting on the breeze. The faint music waxed and waned, but Luke recognized it immediately. It was sweet and terrible to his ears. Flight of the Valkyrie. Behind him he heard whispers and whimpers of fear. What the holy hell? It's them, said Diana. They play it when they're coming to battle. Just like Apocalypse Now, he said. What? Never mind. They're trying to scare us, but all they did was give us warning they're coming, he said. 
He pointed down the driveway that led past the McDonald's to the abandoned car dealership that sat behind it. The big white building had large plate glass windows with a sun-faded Toyota symbol on it. Toyota again? Diana, you need to get everyone down into that building. Hide in there and make sure no one makes a noise. I'll stake out the McDonald's. Kathy, you lead my horse, and Sam, you give Mom the shotgun and take her horse. Hurry! If Diana was put out by his abrupt orders, she didn't show it. Kathy grabbed the rope and, with the help of the other mothers in the group, hurried the entire population of Willett and Green down the small road towards the dealership building. While it may indeed have given them warning, the threatening music and its ever-increasing volume also did its other job. Luke's heart beat like a jackhammer, and he fought to stay calm. Diana, he called. She stopped and looked back. I should take my gun, he said, removing his axe from its sling as he ran down the narrow road to meet her. He held out the axe. She nodded grimly, tucked the shotgun under her arm, and pulled the pistol out of her belt. As she traded it for the axe, he saw fear, defiance, and something else in her eyes. Something he didn't like. Resignation. He held the gun up. Guns are for insurance only. Hopefully they go right past without a clue that we're here. Just try to keep everyone calm and quiet. He started to turn when she grabbed his wrist and looked at him earnestly. Thanks for everything, he nodded. Thank me after they're gone. He turned and ran for the restaurant in a crouch. He had barely found himself a position in the front of the restaurant under the main window when the flight of the Valkyrie ended, and he heard the rumble of a truck engine. It was drowned out when the music started up again. Jeez, change the song, why don't you? He whispered. 34. Rex turned the music on about 20 minutes after they cleared the roadblock. The road was in surprisingly good condition. There were no more fallen trees, and the only real sign they were traveling in a post-apocalyptic world beside the lack of other vehicles was the encroaching forest on either side of the road. "'Keep your eyes peeled,' said Rex. He didn't need to tell Simon. Like he had been since he'd graduated to a seat in the cab, the younger of the three sat forward in his seat, peering this way and that with the utmost concentration. Jared, bored stupid, pondered the silliness of that phrase, "'Keep your eyes peeled.' Frankly, he didn't expect one would see a lot with peeled eyes." Not long after, the Caliph Highway transformed as homes, then buildings, became more frequent. Epping was a name that started appearing on signs. Jared glanced down at the map on Brother Simon's lap. Okay, we've reached Epping. The next turn is the 101. They surely can't have got too much further, said Simon. Senior Brother Rex slowed the vehicle a little. Very good. Two minutes later, Simon pointed into the distance. Look, there's the turn, right after that McDonald's. To his surprise, Senior Brother Rex brought the big vehicle to a halt. Jared and Simon looked at him expectantly. He didn't say anything, just left the motor running and climbed out. Where's he going? asked Simon. Isn't it obvious? He's letting the gunman out. Luke ducked a little lower when the truck finally came into view. It was traveling slow, barely a few miles an hour, right down the center of the two lanes. He could see three men in the cab, but couldn't make out their features. The music echoed around the parking lot as he watched them almost inch their way towards the McDonald's. It was excruciating. He put the pistol on the dusty floor and wiped his sweaty hand down his thigh before picking it up again. If all went well, they would cruise right past, and he wouldn't need to use it. The Willett and Green people were safely hidden, and he didn't intend on drawing any attention to himself. That was when he spotted the four men carrying rifles, walking behind the semi-trailer. Crap. They were dressed in the same monk habits as the brothers he'd seen before, just with rifles instead of staffs. Luke willed himself to stay calm. This development didn't change anything. He'd known all along they would come with guns. Diana had been certain of it. But seeing four men carrying was a lot different to imagining it. Still, 
As long as they kept going, everything would work out. Luke didn't realize he was holding his breath until his lungs began to burn. He slowly exhaled as the big rig passed the driveway and kept rolling along, the men behind it scanning the area around them. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. The truck stopped. 35. Luke, his hand trembling, watched as the doors of the truck opened. A stout man in a black habit jumped lightly from the driver's side. Luke recognized the first one out of the passenger side immediately. Jared, Tommy's killer. A younger man with sandy hair got out behind him. He almost pushed Jared out of the way in his enthusiasm to get to the driveway. For a second, Luke wondered what he was doing as he walked in a wide circle, pointing at the road and mumbling to himself. He stopped at the mouth of the driveway and pointed down the driveway at a pile of horse droppings. Luke muttered an expletive. In the rush, he hadn't noticed. He didn't waste any time watching what happened next. They were made. What was important now was that he got back to the others. He tucked the gun into his belt and crawled his way from the window to the back of the restaurant. He risked a glance back through to the front window and made sure he wasn't in their line of sight before jumping the counter and running through the kitchen. At the back door, he paused before sprinting in a crouch towards the left corner of the Toyota building. He was careful to keep the restaurant between him and the Brotherhood as he jumped the small rail fence and dashed between used cars towards the smaller of the glass doors. He couldn't see any movement behind the windows. Thankfully, the door was open. He stepped through. There was a movement to his right, and he jerked around to find himself staring down the twin barrels of a shotgun. Diana was pointing it at him over the top of a partition. It's me, he said needlessly. She was already lowering the gun. Where is everyone? In the service center out back. I take it they didn't go past. No, they're coming. I didn't stick around to see how many, but there are at least four carrying automatic weapons. Her eyes grew distant. So, this is it then? He nodded. Afraid so. Well... Let's give him something to remember us by. Yep. He pointed to the other side of the building. They'll probably come in those doors. You stay there and pop up just like you did with me. I'll get behind that red scion there. Wait till a few are through the door. Then we'll see what we see. Diana ducked back down, and he rushed to the dusty blue Toyota scion in the middle of the floor. He hunkered down at its rear. No matter which way they came in, he would have a good line of sight. He didn't have long to wait. It's fresh, called Brother Simon, squatting next to the horse shit. Let's get the others out, Jared, said Rex, a tremor of excitement in his voice. He waved the four gunmen to him. You want to leave the truck out here? Yes, no more questions. Do it now, Rex said, walking down the driveway to watch the building in the distance. Jared burned with anger, but he managed to manufacture a curt nod before walking purposefully to the rear of the truck and pulled the door open. We have them cornered, Jared said, as the men blinking in the daylight began to pile out. Go to Brother Rex. As they were jumping out, Jared disappeared around the corner of the trailer, headed for the cab. Senior Brother Rex was watching intently as the gunmen split into two pairs and moved towards the building. They stayed low and looked all business. He turned as the sixteen arrived, their hickory staffs in hand. Where is Brother Jared? he asked. Just closing the tailgate, sir. Here he comes now, said a man at the back. Jared ran up to them, his staff in hand. Sorry, had to get my staff. His cheeks were flushed. Rex paid it no mind. They were all excited to finally bring this chase to its bloody end. He addressed the men. Follow them in. Be ready for anything. Leave none alive except the big redhead. Yes, sir, they called in unison and sprinted after the gunman. Come, Jared, said Senior Brother Rex, setting off at a more leisurely pace. There's something I wish to discuss with you. Jared fell in beside him. His free hand slipped into the big, roughly sewn pocket of his habit. 
They looked ahead as their men cautiously approached the building that housed the car's showroom. What is it, Rex? If the use of his name without the honorific disturbed him, Senior Brother Rex did not show it. Well, I'll come right out and say it. Brother Simon informed me that two brothers left Willet and Green that day. Really? Well, he has been known to be wrong. That would explain Brother Taylor's missing body, though, wouldn't it? Jared stopped. Are you accusing me of something? Rex paused and turned to face him. Yes, I am. I don't know exactly what it is I'm accusing you of yet, but I'm sure with Brother Simon's help I can get to the bottom of it. He was interrupted by the abrupt popping of gunfire from the car dealership. He glanced in that direction and then turned back to find himself looking down the barrel of a snub-nosed revolver. Jared had broken into the glove compartment of the truck and taken it. The weapon was secreted in there in case of emergencies, and to Jared, the threat of Rex spilling his guts to the council was an emergency. No need for all that work, said Jared. I confess, Rex, I killed Brother Taylor. Rex didn't look shocked. In fact, a self-satisfied smile curled his lips. He nodded. The bastard is happy he's right. Why the fuck isn't he scared? You don't need to say anything, Rex, he said, hating the whine in his voice. He shook the gun at the bigger man. The knowledge won't do you any good because now I'm going to kill you, too. Rex's face was that of a teacher dealing with an errant child. He was confident and in control. Jared was a cocky but ultimately powerless annoyance, and Rex knew he had him. Really? And how will you explain that away? I won't need to, you smug asshole. Rex's smile dropped away and he began to raise his staff. The shot took him in the forehead. The loud report lost amidst the gun battle behind them. Rex collapsed to the ground, his staff falling from lifeless fingers. Amen, said Jared. He put the revolver back in his pocket before stepping over his victim's body and running for the car yard. 36. Diana fired the first shot. It was ear-ringing loud. She hit the first guy through the door in the throat and he fell in a cloud of crimson. There were screams of, get back! It took all of 20 seconds for the response. The plate glass windows exploded in a storm of hot metal. Luke fell to the cold, sealed cement floor and held the pistol tight. Bullets hammered into the car in front of him and the walls behind him. Shattered auto glass fell over him like a soft hail. Twenty feet away, he could see Diana's feet under the partition. For a second, he thought she might be dead. Then she squirmed, and the toe of her sneaker made a squeak that he somehow heard over the din. The barrage continued for around forty seconds, then stopped. Luke thought about moving them, had visions of running out Rambo-style with his pistol. Then sense prevailed. Better to wait for them. If the four men behind the truck were the only ones armed with guns, the odds were now significantly better than they had been. Three to two instead of four to two. He turned his gaze from Diana and swung his long body around to look at the glassless doors and windows to his left. He couldn't see any movement but knew it wouldn't be long. Keeping his belly against the floor, he crawled out from behind the car using his elbows for propulsion and began to slither to the front. He had made about five feet of the fifteen when a face appeared at the jagged edge of the window, then ducked out of sight quickly. Oh, shit. He'd been made. Luke rolled to his right as the gunman reappeared, his bullets cratering the concrete where Luke had lain a second before. Luke felt a hot slice of pain across his thigh and began firing. The one-handed shooting wasn't pretty. In fact, it was ugly. But he got lucky. The gunman had slipped back out of sight, but Luke's third shot hit the drywall beside the window. It pierced the wall, striking the brother in the back. Luke heard his groan and the clatter of the falling gun. Two to two. Boom! There was no scream to accompany Diana's second shot, but lots more returned fire. While the remaining gunmen were concentrating their fire on her window, 
Luke took the opportunity to crawl the rest of the way to the front wall and slowly stood until his face was level with the hole his bullet had made. He judged a quick look through the hole was worth the risk to see how things stood outside. The quick glance didn't tell him much at all. He couldn't see anyone and assumed the enemy had taken cover behind the used cars in the lot. He caught movement to his right and jerked around. It was Diana. She crawled to him, staying below the sill of the window, then stood up when she reached him. He motioned her to duck down with him. He didn't want a stray bullet to end their last stand. Did you see anything? She asked. Luke opened his mouth to answer but didn't get the chance. You may as well come out. Luke didn't recognize the voice, but from the look on her face, he knew Diana did. She shook her head furiously as if he might actually consider the request. You can't fight your way out, Jared continued. There are too many of us. If you come out now, I'll spare the children. We'll take them back with us, and they'll live long, happy lives. Fuck you, Jared, screamed Diana. Luke cringed and waited for another hail of bullets. Instead, he heard low, calm voices. That was somehow worse. His worried gaze met Diana's. Mama? Diana clapped her hand over her mouth, her eyes filling with tears. You have ten seconds to come out with your hands up. After ten, we start killing the children. Starting with, what's your name, son? Good boy. Starting with Samuel. Diana closed her eyes and hugged the shotgun to her as she slid the rest of the way down the wall, finally defeated. Luke shook his head. They were done. As sure as he was that Jared was lying, he couldn't take the chance that the bastard wouldn't show some mercy. He sure as hell couldn't let the kid die any more than his mother could. Come on, he said gently as he rose to his feet. She wiped the tears from her eyes with the heel of her hand and nodded, accepting his hand. Luke pulled her to her feet and asked if she was ready. She nodded again. We're coming out, Luke called. They stepped into the open window with their hands up, weapons in the air. He half expected they would be shot as soon as they appeared, but it seemed this Jared had a flair for the dramatic. Ah, that's the way, he said. Now slowly put the weapons down and come on out. They put the weapons on the floor and stepped over the low window sill onto the pavement. See, son, I told you everything would be okay, Jared said, putting his hand on Samuel's shoulder. Diana tensed but didn't move. One of the last two gunmen stood on the other side of Samuel. The muzzle of his gun pointed at the boy's ear. The rest of Diana's group were in a huddle, on their knees with their hands on their heads. The other gunman stood over them. One look in Brother Jared's eyes told him how this would go down. The rest of the brothers stood silently, sentinels watching what Luke knew now would be a bloody massacre. Tears of helpless rage blurred his vision. Not for him, but for these poor kids and their mothers. Ah, look! The big man is crying, said Jared, an ugly look on his face. It was then, over the bastard's shoulder, Luke noticed the black-robed body in the distance. What happened? Did you have a falling out with your friend? Jared's face displayed annoyance. His men turned to look at the body of senior brother Rex. One of your bullets killed brother Rex, God bless his soul and you'll pay dearly for it. Hmm, that's quite a distance. I didn't think I was that good a shot, especially one-handed. He held up his hook for illustration. With a pistol. Enough, Jared yelled, not quite managing to keep the strident tone from his voice. The men of the Brotherhood began to look at each other, and Jared knew he needed to get the situation under control quickly. Luke wasn't done, though. Just the way you can't avoid prodding a sore tooth with your tongue, he couldn't let this go. 
No, I think you and the big guy had a falling out. Shut up, screamed Jared. Is this true, senior brother Jared? asked one of the younger men. Luke recognized him as the one who had discovered their hiding place. Of course not, you idiot. Can't you see what he's trying to do? He turned to the man with his gun trained on Samuel. Shoot the boy. No, please don't, called Diana, shrugging off Luke's arm and running over to her son. Too late, Jared said, looking at Luke triumphantly. Shoot the boy, then his mother. The man put the muzzle of his gun against the boy's temple. Jared stepped back. Diana, sobbing, hugged Samuel to her. Luke, unable to stand by and just watch them be slaughtered, charged at them. He had barely taken two steps when the gunman's left shoulder exploded. The distant crack of a gunshot followed a split second later. The force of the sniper's shot spun the gunman around even as he pulled the trigger. Jared ducked and fell to the ground. The three brothers behind him weren't so quick, and the automatic gunfire from their own man cut them down as he fell. Luke stayed down after the gun went silent, but looked around to try and locate the last brother with an automatic weapon. He found him quickly. The panicked man was behind the Willet and Green people and looked around frantically before firing in a fanning pattern in the direction of the on-ramp to the 101. The sniper's neck shot struck the man in the chest and picked him up off his feet, flinging him like a rag doll into the used Chevy behind him. His ruined back left a snail trail of blood on the silver paintwork as he slipped onto the concrete. Everyone stay down, yelled Luke. It seemed to be friendly fire, but they were still in danger of stray bullets. More shots, more of the brothers went down. Finally, the last few, guided by the one called Simon, dropped their staffs and fell to their knees with their hands up. People were screaming. Confusion reigned. Luke looked across to where Diana had been hugging Samuel to her. The boy was cowering on the ground, his hands over his ears. But he was okay. Diana was gone. So was Jared. 37. Luke stood up. A bullet whizzed by his ear and took down a brother that he hadn't seen peeking from behind the corner of the building. He barely registered the near miss. Beyond the used cars and moving along the driveway beside the McDonald's was Jared and Diana. He was shuffling backwards. Diana held against his chest with one arm and his free hand holding a revolver hard under her chin. Luke limped after them as armed men in faded U.S. Army fatigues began to appear from the long brush between the Toyota lot and the on-ramp to the 101. Everyone down on the ground, someone ordered. Luke ignored them and kept running. His thigh burned like hell, but he only stopped when, as he drew near, Jared jammed the gun even harder into Diana's chin. Not another step, you fucker. Luke held up his arms. Okay. Okay, I'm not armed. Just let her go. Please. Oh, sure, since you asked so sweetly. He turned the gun on Luke and smiled crazily. Nice knowing you, asshole. Diana smacked his hand away and the shot went wild. Jared still had a grip on her until she kicked backwards hard like a mule between his legs. It wasn't a completely accurate blow, but strong enough that he doubled over. She slipped out of his grip and ran towards Luke. Luke ran to meet her, his arms open. Jared's shot was like a starter's gun going off. Diana stumbled forward, a look of agony painted across her face. Luke caught her, and they fell to the ground. There was a gunshot behind them, and Jared, already running away, jerked as a bullet struck him in the upper arm. It almost knocked him off balance. Almost. He changed direction ninety degrees and plunged into the thick brush that lined the other side of the driveway. Luke held Diana. He shot me she said in a calm voice. You'll be okay, said Luke, his voice thick. How's your leg? He glanced at his blood-stained thigh. Wow, that's a lot of blood. It pooled in the wound and dripped down onto the concrete. He looked down at her pale face. It's okay. I don't know if I believe you. You look awful pale. So do you. Suddenly there were people around them. Stretcher, someone close by called. Make that two. Motes swam in Luke's eyes as someone knelt beside him. A familiar face filled his vision. Hey, buddy, said Isaac as his eyes filled with tears. 
Good to see you. Isaac? Luke said, smiling and squeezing the warm hand that had found his. Why are you crying? It's only a leg wound. He saw his friend's mouth working. The only word he heard was happy. Then someone turned out the lights. 38. Jared stopped running after about two miles. He collapsed to the ground, his chest heaving. His bleeding arm stung cruelly, and he pulled the sleeve of his habit up to reveal the bullet wound. It had gone right through the fleshy part of his forearm, miraculously missing bone, but bleeding quite heavily. He looked back the way he had come. They didn't appear to be following anymore. God be praised. He slipped into an abandoned gas station and headed to the back, scanning the almost bare shelves as he went looking for something he could use as a bandage. After a short search, he found a clear plastic pack of handkerchiefs on the floor. It would have to do. Ten minutes later, he was walking again, a plastic bottle of green-tinged water from the toilet of the gas station in his pocket next to the revolver. He walked and passed the time by formulating his story. He would return a hero and put this whole sordid mess behind him. He did worry that there might be survivors amongst his comrades, but surely none of them would be allowed to return home. The question of who the armed interlopers were could wait until he was safely home. The bumps and noise of an engine woke Luke. He opened his eyes. He was on his back in the open tray of a vehicle. Soft white clouds were scattered here and there on the sky overhead, like fluffy sheep on a brilliant field of blue. He felt a little disoriented. He's awake, said someone. He started to sit up, and a hand against his chest pushed him back down gently. Don't try to sit up just yet, said Isaac, putting a water bottle to his lips. They patched you up and gave you some morphine for the pain. You might feel a little bit out of it. He nodded and swallowed some water. It was cool and fresh. Diana? The doc says she's going to be okay. She's in the other truck. She was shot in the back, above the kidney, but he thinks it missed all her major organs. He's going to take the bullet out when we get back to Concord. She'll be sick and sorry for a while, though. Did you get him? Isaac knew who Luke meant. He shook his head. No, he said over the noise of the engine. They looked for twenty minutes, but then Bowman called it. Randall's orders were clear, extraction only. Luke, hiding his disappointment, nodded. So Jacob found you. Is he okay? He's fine. He didn't find us. One of the colonel's patrols found him and sent for me. Looks like we made it in the nick of time. You did. Luke's eyes were heavy from the morphine, and he closed his eyes again. When he awoke next, he was being carried on a stretcher up the path towards the steps that led into Randall's headquarters. He tilted his head up. Isaac was holding that end of the stretcher, a sheen of sweat on his brow. Dude, I think I can walk. Set me down. No, it's okay. It's just a little way now. Luke took the decision out of his hands and swung his legs over the side of the stretcher, almost falling out as Isaac and his partner tried to ride it. Fine, fine, hang on. Luke maintained a crooked smile as he put his feet down, even as his legs shrieked in protest. Isaac and the soldier lowered the stretcher as he stood upright. He allowed Isaac to put a shoulder under his arm and help him walk up the steps. The soldier folded up the canvas stretcher and followed them. I did that for you, you know, he said to Isaac. Oh, really? Yeah, you looked like you were going to drop your end at any second. Gee, I've missed you, Isaac said, smiling playfully as they lumbered up the steps. Why are we here? They've got better medical facilities than us. Your friend Diana has already gone in. They left men to watch over the rest of the people you brought, and trucks are already on the way to bring them in. We'll go home to Manchester tomorrow. If you want to, that is. Luke looked at his friend. 
I do, man. Randall and Bowman were waiting at the top of the steps. They greeted Luke, Randall patting him on the shoulder. Good to see you're still in one piece, son. Thanks to you guys, said Luke, nodding at Bowman. They stepped across the threshold, and as his eyes adjusted to the light inside the building, he spied two more familiar faces. Before he could even say hello, a teary-eyed indigo rushed forward, almost knocking him down as she gripped him in a bear hug. He hugged her back, and looking over her shoulder, his gaze fell on Ben. His English friend was behind indigo, and he was walking slowly towards them, a small package in his arms. He also had tears streaming down his face. Luke was about to tease him when he realized it wasn't a package. It was a bundle. A squirming bundle in a pink blanket. Indigo slipped out of his arms, now crying in earnest. Luke sobbed as realization crashed down on him. He shook his head. Ben nodded. Another sob racked Luke, and he fell to his knees, looking skyward. No, he whispered. Ben stopped in front of him. Yes, he said softly, and held out the bundle to his friend. Luke lowered his gaze to the opening in the top of the blanket. The most beautiful pair of blue eyes looked up curiously at him. Luke, meet your daughter, Erin, Ben said, his voice cracking with emotion. Weeping softly, Luke put out his arms uncertainly as Ben lowered his baby daughter into them. She was perfect, perfect features, perfect complexion, perfect soft, downy hair. He cuddled her to him as Isaac and Indigo joined Ben in front of him. She's beautiful, just like Brooke, said Luke, laughing and crying as tears of joy spilled over his cheeks. They cried and laughed with him. Somehow, after feeling so wrong for so long, everything felt right again. 39. Jared crossed back into Maine two days after the battle at the junction. He was hungry and tired, but in good shape considering the skin around the wound on his arm was pink and inflamed. He'd be home in another four hours or so. As he walked along the leaf-covered road, the forest thick around and overhead, he allowed himself to think about how he would persuade the council to allow him to take a force a much bigger force to find the handless criminal and bring him back alive to face his crucifixion. He smiled a thin, mirthless smile. If the woman Diana wasn't dead already, he thought he might just cut her to pieces and feed her to the bastard before bringing him back. Jared didn't see the animal resting in the leaves by the side of the road until he was only a few feet away. Its tawny fur was almost perfect camouflage in that light, and against the golden carpet of maple leaves. He stopped. It took a few seconds for his brain to process what he was seeing. Then fear kicked in. Barely daring to breathe, he slowly lowered his hand towards the pocket of his habit. The lion stood. Nice kitty cat he said as his fingers closed over the revolver. The lion took an uncertain step towards him and sniffed the air. Jared took a step back. The lion took another forward. Jared made his final mistake. He turned and ran, trying to pull the revolver out as he went. It was tangled in the material, and he finally pulled it free with a yell of triumph. Then the freight train hit him. Claws, teeth ripping, shredding, death. Epilogue Rochester, New York The tall, blonde man with the crooked nose watched silently through the one-way glass. 
The naked man, strapped to the chair in the adjoining room, gargled in pain as the interrogator pulled another tooth from his jaw with a vicious wrench of his arm. Where are you from? He screamed into the moaning man's face. The man in the chair closed his eyes and shook his head, the blood from his mouth dribbling down his chin and onto his chest. He had been captured the day before. The other three in his company had been killed, one woman and two men. They had been well-armed, wearing U.S. Army fatigues and in possession of a working jeep. A platoon had stumbled upon them while driving back from a freshly captured settlement in Albany, near to the border with Massachusetts and New Hampshire. In the ensuing fight, the interlopers had killed two of his soldiers and wounded three others before they were put down. Worryingly, they had been well within the borders, in fact only fifteen miles out from Rochester. The blond man lost patience. He stalked to the microphone and grabbed it. Enough with the gentle stuff. Get it done. The interrogator looked at the mirror glass. Yes, sir. He dropped the tooth on the floor and stepped up to the chair with his pliers open. The man in the chair's eyes opened again when he felt the cold jaws of the pliers close on one of his testicles. Please, no. The interrogator's arm tensed as he squeezed. The man screamed. Where are you from? I'll tell you. Please, stop. The jaws of the pliers opened slightly, and the man slumped in his chair. Where? Concord, in New Hampshire, he said in a shuddering, exhausted voice. How many of you are there? The man shook his head again, tears and sweat streaming down his face. The pliers squeezed harder this time. He screamed louder. I'll tell you everything! Stop! Last warning. The next time you refuse me, I'll pop it like a grape. Understand? How many? An exhausted nod. Roughly five hundred. Ten minutes later, they had all the information they were going to get. It was enough. The group in Concord were large and well-equipped and had military personnel amongst them. That, and the fact they had sent a team to gather intel on them, meant they were a real and immediate threat. The blond man, whose name was William, and who had once helped trap unsuspecting survivors for the Chinese, spoke into the mic again. Kill him. He lingered to watch the coup de grace, a thoughtful look on his face, then headed for the door. It was time to speak to the president. The End of Luke's Trek, Book 5 of the America Falls series. Written by Scott Medbury. Narrated by Adam Barr. If you're enjoying Scott's audiobook content, please like and subscribe. It's the best way to help out the channel.